Well, here we are. Volume 6, easily the most okayest volume in the entire series. It sports arguably the most intense arc of the entire show, the mythological origin point of the entire series, and it's finally where the show got all of its budget back from a certain unnamed disaster of a mecha anime. Not going to lie, I both did and did not expect to get to this volume so quickly. I have set up a precedent that I wait three years to build up a nice comfortable buffer for fixing to sit within. And then they decided to take two and a half years to develop volume 9, and the voices in my head began to get restless. This means I'll be breaking one of my cardinal rules of giving fixing Ruby about a three year buffer to work with. But luckily I have some self restraint and I won't be doing anything crazy like, say, going episodic or anything crazy like that. Yeah, but what if you did? No, no, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. No, wait, he does have a point. Who's he? Hey guys. Did you know there's donuts in here? Oh, no. Wait, there are donuts in here? Yeah, behind all those empty vodka bottles, bruv. Man, this is way better than the basement. I have an idea for volume what seven. Blake finally the show, grows right? his and they yeah. really what does Chris Again, Maria is infertile. We open Volume 6 following a lily petal floating in the air as it drifts into the chop shop at night. Adam, having previously been knocked out, has been laid in a chair and his head has been wrapped in bandages. As he comes to awareness, we see through the fabric over his bandaged eyes a huddle of the remaining White Fang members positioned around a table. Their conversation is muted, but as Adam comes to consciousness, it becomes clearer. They're discussing what to do following their failure at Haven and their conversation is laced with panic, anxiety, and frustration. Slowly, the conversation becomes more scrambled, with calls to regroup and counterattack, or retreat and bide their time, or willingly surrender to the authorities and hope for a merciful sentence. Hearing this cacophony, Adam staggers from his seat, wavering as he stands. Some of the White Fang notice in turn, their faces lifting at seeing him walking. One eagerly walks up to him, saying, Adam, thank God you're awake! We don't have much time! The, the police are closing in and we don't know what to do! Adam looks at him listlessly, then to the floor, then back up. Before anyone can register what happened, Adam has drawn his blade and cut the man down. We follow the man's falling hand, and off screen we hear shouts of alarm, confusion, combat, and then nothing. The whole time, the man's blood puddle has spread, growing to touch his lifeless fingers. The last shot of the chop shop is Adam's foot pressing a motorcycle pedal before riding out of the garage, police lights flickering on the horizon. And with this, we cut to the intro for Volume 6. A special thanks goes out to all of my wonderful patrons for supporting the channel. If you like this content and want more of it, please consider supporting it. Also consider picking up my new action-adventure novel, The Artificer, which is now available for purchase on Amazon in digital and in print. With that all said, back to your regularly scheduled fixing. We fade back in on darkness, hollow wooden steps echoing in our ears, coming closer and closer and closer. And then they get more cluttered and panicked, and we hear Ruby cry out in alarm. The darkness blinks away and we find Ruby in the Oz house, tripping over her own feet while wearing traditional Mistrali woodblock sandals. She mutters out, How did they invent worse shoes than heels? 
The camera zooms back and we find that she is dressed in a matching traditional Mistrali regional outfit. And a similarly dressed Nora pats her on the back, almost making her tumble over completely. As Nora walks outside, she calls back, Come on, Ruby, they're not so bad. Outside, we find the rest of Team Ruby Junior-Kern, all of whom, save for Crow and Roman, are dressed festively like Ruby and Nora. The collective crew all praise how cute Ruby and Nora look, except Ren, who is as reticent as always. As the compliments die down, the crew briefly discuss the festival they're about to head to, marveling over how pretty the city's decorations look, especially since it's only been a week since they attack at Haven. John is surprised they're even still holding the festival, but Ozpin takes brief control of Roman, to Neo's dismay, and begins to recite a nostalgic spiel on the history of the festival and its importance to Mistralian culture. As the monologue fades into the background, Nora sidles up beside Ren, pouting over his lack of overt response to her outfit and attempting to display it by striking a dainty pose. A beat passes before she asserts aloud, Don't I look like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? And Ren looks at her with his earnest, calm face and replies, You are. Nora blinks and her pose sags in surprise. What? Ren quickly clarifies, smiling gently, You always are. Nora blushes redder than Ruby's cape, and Ren reaches out to take her hand, asking, Are you ready to go? Nora, unable to vocalize, nods vigorously with a strangled squeak. The two catch up with the rest of the group as they approach the main thoroughfare serving as the central fairgrounds. As they near the entrance, the group begins to disperse, but before everyone has parted, Ruby lingers behind to talk with John. She asks, Are you sure you're fine watching out for him? The two look behind them at Crow, who is already half a liter deep in a bottle of spirits. John sighs and replies, It's not a problem. I'd rather not be a third wheel anyway. Ruby smiles bitterly and says, Well, if anything happens, you know who to call. John rests a hand on her shoulder and says his goodbyes, going off to serve as Crow's guardian for the night. Ruby watches the two leave and turns her attention back to Weiss, Blake, Yang, Roman, and Neo. Her face contorts in confusion and she asks, Where are Ren and Nora? To which Neo casually points to where the two have already wandered off down the road. Ruby nods. Right. Well, at least the Rube Squad can hang out together. With guests! Yang looks at Ruby. The Rube Squad? Blake shakes her head and points to Roman. I am not going anywhere with him. Roman blinks at her. What did I do? I mean, not that I care, but... Blake's glare strengthens. You are directly responsible for the death of a dear friend. Roman's eyes narrow. Who? Blake growls. His name was Tuxen, and... Roman sighs. I was not responsible for that. In fact, it would have made my life a hell of a lot easier if he'd stayed alive. Blake stomps her heel. That's not the point! Ruby steps up to them, waving her arms frantically. Guys, guys, stop fighting! Blake turns to glare at Ruby and she shrivels, saying, It's clear that there's still some tension in the group about Roman existing. Blake nods and turns to point into his chest, saying, and I've tolerated him so far, but I will not spend my last free day in Mistral with him. Roman leans back as Neo steps forward, glaring up at Blake, and Yang steps in to keep the two apart. Ruby sighs. Roman, you and Neo... Roman backs away, taking Neo with him. Don't need to tell us twice. If anyone needs us, we'll be having fun our way. He and Neo peel away, and the four watch them go, Neo turning back to give Yang a little wave. As the two begin to blend into the crowd, they begin picking pockets, earning Ruby's distant ire. With a sigh, Ruby turns back to the group, and for the first time since Volume 3, we get a good look at Team Ruby in isolation. Weiss seems tired and quiet, having not spoken a word beyond simple pleasantries since leaving the house. Blake is trying to calm herself in the wake of the argument and turns to Yang, asking what she wants to do. Yang shuffles on her feet and politely says that she doesn't quite know yet, turning to Ruby and asking if she has any ideas. Ruby, sensing the tension hasn't quite left, says, Well, let's check out the food stalls. John told me about this Euro place he really liked. As she steps forward to lead them into the festival, she trips and almost falls over, bumping into Weiss. Yang manages to catch her, and Weiss, knocked from her daze, drolly asks, Do you need to lean on me? Ruby pouts and indignantly pushes herself out of Yang's arms. I can manage myself. Thanks. With that bold declaration, Ruby wobbles forward into the festival, and the three girls behind her give the first signs of genuine amusement since we've seen them. 
We're treated to a montage of the girls trying to enjoy themselves at the festival, eating a variety of foods, trying to play stall games, and looking at stall knickknacks, including an almost humorous moment where Ruby offers a grim mask to Blake, only for the joke to make Blake uncomfortable. In fact, many of these scenes, though pleasant, have an undercurrent that things aren't quite right. As the night wears on, the partner pairs split off naturally, leaving Ruby and Weiss to pick through a stall's clothing rack. Standing side by side, Weiss is absently picking through the clothes while Ruby watches her quietly but curiously. Finally, Ruby asks, You okay, Weiss? You've barely said a word all night. Weiss, thumbing a shawl with a lily pattern, comes out of her haze, turning to look at Ruby and replying, Oh, I... I'm sorry. I have a lot on my mind. Ruby looks at the shawl and asks, Do you like it? I can get it for you. It's going to be cold going up north. Weiss drops her hands and says, it's fine. I was just... thinking. I spent all this time trying to get down here to see my sister, only to learn she left for Atlas before I even got here. It feels like I'm flying in circles, like... ravens. Weiss gives a dry laugh at the end, subtly reaching into her purse to fiddle with something. Ruby rests a hand on Weiss's shoulder, but it's not a circle. We're all here, Team Ruby, together! Weiss sighs and presses her clenched fist to her chest. I... I guess. I just wish we could have stayed longer. Ruby frowns at Weiss, but notices a bit of the wooden Nevermore poking out from Weiss's fingers. Her expression softening, Ruby reaches past Weiss and grabs the shawl off the rack, saying, You know what? I'll get this for you. Weiss watches Ruby walk towards the cashier and says, Ruby, wait, I don't really need that. And Ruby casually says back, It's not a problem. Come on, you and Nora love this stuff. The conversation fades into the background as we pass from that stall to one not too far away, where Blake and Yang are walking together in relative silence, edging on awkward. The two occasionally take quick, cautious glances at one another, before something catches Yang's eye and she silently perks up. Blake catches this and looks in that same direction, noticing a pop gun stand, completely ignoring a traditional confectionery stall right next to it. Blake grabs Yang's hand and says, Oh, a shooting gallery? That looks like fun! Yang's eyes linger on the confectionery stand, but awkwardly says, Uh, yeah, sure, as Blake begins to drag her towards the stall. The two arrive, and Yang reaches for one of the pop guns, only for Blake to swipe it out from under her, proudly declaring, I'll win you a plushie. Blake turns to the teller and asks, How many points for the big one? And the man replies, 30 points. Blake fires off a number of rounds until the gun clicks dry, and by the end, the teller announces, Ooh, 22 points! So close! Wanna try again? Blake is about to reply, but Yang has already stepped up, grabbed a different gun, and nonchalantly unloaded on the target. The teller whistles and announces, 30 points! Amazing! Blake smiles and says, That's great, Yang. What prize do you want? As Blake asks this, Yang is already walking away briskly, saying offhandedly, I'm gonna go look at the lantern displays. Blake's ears droop, and she quickly follows after. We jump over to find Ruby, giggling as a cashier hands her a bag, only to hear Weiss call her name. Giddy, she rushes over to where Weiss is seated between Blake and Yang, serving as an awkward barrier for the two. Weiss asks, Ruby, where were you? And she replies, Well... Only to be interrupted by someone calling Blake's name. The four turn to find Sun, waving around the corner of a building. The four brighten at seeing him and stand to greet him, but their words die in their mouth as he steps out, bringing with him Ilya, who is cuffed to his other hand. Shuffling in behind him are the rest of Team Season and even Team Auburn. Brief pleasantries are exchanged, though the most pressing are people's questions about Ilya. Sun explains that he's legally supposed to look after her before she goes back to Menagerie to serve out her sentence. Callie thought it would be nice for Ilya to get some reward for her help at Haven, so letting her go to the festival like this was the compromise. Ilya looks to the cuffs, then Sun, then Team Ruby, and says dryly, I'd rather be back in jail. Ruby raises a finger and asks, how do you... And Ilya cuts her off, saying, Don't ask. Leaving them for a moment, we cut over to John, who is leaning against one of the scenic fences along the mountainside, pleasantly zoned out in the festival atmosphere. However, the pleasant times are interrupted by the sound of Crow vomiting. The camera pans over to Crow, leaning over the edge, emptying his stomach in as little detail as we can afford. John is clearly irritated by this break in the piece, and sighs as Crow finishes and walks over, rubbing the sick from his lips. John asks, Are you done? Crow replies drunkenly, slapping the same hand on John's shoulder. Yeah. Thanks, kid. You're a, 
You're a real lifesaver. Crow's hand goes from a show of support to actual support as he briefly loses leg coordination and stumbles into John. John rolls his eyes and pats Crow's back. Yeah, yeah, I know. Crow continues. No, re really, you're the best. You, you guys did good work to get here. I'm so proud. You did right by Ruby. You were really there for her. John's face softens at the words and says more earnestly, Uh, thanks. Crow pats harder on John's shoulder, almost painfully it seems. No, no, no thanks, you're... you're... Crow's face goes green, and John very quickly drags him over to the railing and says, Okay, okay, over the railing. The camera pans up to the skies above, where we hear Ruby's voice dramatically retelling the events of Volume 5. Sans the unexpected half-sister, the betrayal by Lionheart, the raid on the airbase, the relic, and Raven. Honestly, all of the interesting things. She makes up for this with creative extrapolations, including a massive atom-masked airship descending on Mistral like a supervillain. Ruby steps up on the table they're all seated around, laughing maniacally in mimicry of Adam. And then Scarlet leans forward and asks, How do you know about the parts you weren't there for? Ruby stumbles on the table, sputtering, The parts I was- I got the important parts! I got the spirit of the story! The two devolve into a small argument, to the amusement of the gathered teams, but Arslan seems resistant to the charm, and seems even bitter. Quietly, Nadir shakes her shoulder. Come on, Arslan, not tonight. It's the festival, take a day off. Yang hears this, and quirks a brow their way. Arslan matches it with a glare, but Nadir goes over Arslan's head, almost literally to tell Yang. She's been hung up on that cinder lady since we learned she was in the city. She hasn't stopped looking for her. He tightens the grip on her arm. Even when we're supposed to be relaxing. Arslan glares at him. Yang pipes up, however, saying, I don't know where she went. I should have been the last person to see her, but she wasn't where she was supposed to be. I wish I could tell you more. Arslan absorbs Yang's words intently and Nadir sighs, saying, I wish you could tell her less, honestly, while pinching his temples. In the middle of Scarlet making a counter-argument, Ruby jolts up in surprise, pulling out her scroll. Wait a minute! It's already midnight! We gotta get home! Reese Chloris says, Ah, oh, come on! Night's still young! And Weiss is infected by Ruby's growing panic. You don't get it! We have a train to catch tomorrow! Blake, Yang, come on, we gotta go! Yang offers Arslan and Nadir an apologetic shrug before being dragged off by their panicking leadership. We cut to the crew meeting with John in front of the Oz house, where he's lifting the borderline comatose crow to the door. He takes one look at the crew as they're shuffling into the house and asks, Hey, have you guys seen Nora and Ren? We cut away to one of the minor bridges spanning Mistral's River, a fair distance away from the hum of the festival. The moon is high in the sky, bathing everything in pale, glittery moonlight. We find Ren and Nora cuddling on a bench on the bridge. Nora, clearly content, has shed her shoes to curl up on the bench beside him. As Ren absently strokes Nora's hair, he leans down and presses a gentle peck to her forehead. Nora smiles and tilts her head up to him invitingly, and Ren leans down to kiss her properly. The camera silhouettes them in the moonlight, and we fade to black, ending the episode. Episode 2 opens on a bench in the heart of Mistral Central Station, where Weiss, Blake, and Yang have just sat down. Yang remarks that it's nice they'll finally be getting out of that house, it's felt like forever. Blake, confused, asks, Haven't you only been there for like, two weeks? Yang closes her eyes, replying that she's pretty sure her room was where Professor Ublek would stay, and it reeks of coffee and motor oil. And she's not sure the two were different things. Weiss comments that Yang will end up missing it, Free room and board is hard to come by. Yang absently, but begrudgingly, concedes the point. Their train tickets ate a solid chunk out of their coffers, and that was just for coach. Behind them, Ruby and John walk up carrying the hungover Crow. As they set him down on the bench, the two bicker lightly about how it was John's job to make sure that Crow didn't overdo it at the festival. John remarks, He can be crazy sneaky when he wants to be. While he says this, Crow is in the background, sneaking a swig from his flask. He quickly stows it, hiding it before either of them can turn around and see him. Ruby looks around and asks where Ren and Nora went. Blake explains they split off together to get everyone something to eat while passing the food court. John asks more warily where Roman and Neo went, and the group become alarmed when they realize the second duo has also vanished. Groaning, John comments that Nora and Ren don't know where they are and someone needs to go looking for them. He locks eyes with Ruby, and wordlessly, the two drop into a game of rock-paper-scissors over who will have to go find them ultimately resulting in John's loss. With a playful raspberry and a friendly wave to John, Ruby is left alone with her team. 
Looking to her team, she says, So, while we're all here and they're not, I've got something to give to you. Weiss asks quizzically, Why would them not being here matter? And Ruby replies, Well, because I've been traveling with them for a couple of months and I'd feel bad getting you guys something and not getting them something because I got you guys something and I didn't have enough to get them anything and I feel really guilty about it. Taking a breath at the end of her ramble, Ruby reveals what she bought at the festival last episode. Friendship bracelets. The three are clearly flattered, but hesitant to take the charms. A beat passes before Weiss reaches forward to take hers, followed closely by Yang. Blake reaches forward but draws back while second-guessing herself. Ruby, noticing this, zips around the other three girls, quickly putting the bracelets around their wrists while smiling warmly. At the end, she's putting her arms around the other girls' backs and declaring, Team Ruby! Back together at last! Weiss and Yang roll their eyes at Ruby's antics while Blake just gives a bittersweet smile to the bracelet, playing with it with her fingers. We cut over to John, looking for his absent teammates. He actually finds them quite quickly, as Nora has stacked her tray of food with so much that she can't even see around it, having to strain her neck to select even more food to add to the pile. John jogs up to Ren, who gives him a resigned shake of the head as Nora tries to decide what to get next. From beyond the pile, a stranger begins to make suggestions, and Nora casually agrees with many of them, stacking the pile even further. John and Ren step forward to stop Nora, with Ren asking, How exactly are you planning to pay for all this? We're basically broke as it is, Nora. John steps around the pile to get a better look at everything they'd have to account for, only to come face to face with the stranger. Confused and surprised, John asks, Cardin? Cardin, similarly surprised, replies, John? And Nora, similarly confused, replies, Pay? Rowan said this was complimentary with the ticket! John balks at her. What? Why would he say that? Behind them, Russell walks up behind Cardin, giving the three a small, friendly wave. Cardin acknowledges his partner briefly before offering to pay for the food, saying that they just got paid and it's nice to see some familiar faces around here. Still confused, John asks Cardin what they're doing in Mistral since he thought that everyone was still back in Vale. Cardin goes on to explain that after the situation at Beacon began to stabilize, he and the rest of his team needed to look to the future. So Cardinal took a job serving as security for the train to Argus, since apparently there's been a shortage of huntsmen in Mistral as of late. John, Ren, and Nora are a little awkward about that comment, but it goes unnoticed as Cardin continues, explaining that they'd only just gotten into the gig about a month or so back. We haven't lost a passenger yet, Cardin says, putting John in a playful headlock. He emphasizes his next words with a noogie. So put your faith in me and Russ here. John struggles free and says, Ah, uh, thanks, but we'll look after ourselves. As John rubs his neck, Ren walks up to Cardin, handing him a slip of paper. Cardin looks at him curiously and asks, What's this? Ren responds dryly, The bill for all the food you just offered to pay for. Cardin stares at Ren, then looks down to the paper, and breathes out, That's a lot of zeros. In a change of pace, we cut back to one of the White Fang bullheads from Volume 5, where we find Mercury shadowboxing while Emerald is repairing something along the ship's wall. The sound design is key here, as with every punch, kick, and step, the sound of Mercury's movements grate more and more on Emerald's nerves. Eventually, she becomes so pissed that she shouts at him. If you're not going to help, can you at least not help in a way that isn't annoying? Merc shoots back. You're not the boss of me. And she replies, I'm in charge of making sure this flea-ridden contraption stays in the air, and that, by default, makes me in charge. If you want to fight down there, keep doing what you're doing. Merc shrugs it off with a, meh, and Emerald explodes. Are you really that confident in yourself, or do you have some kind of death wish? Mercury pauses and thinks over the question. Both, I guess. I just take things as they come. Emerald stares at him. Is there anything you actually take seriously? And he again thinks it over before shrugging and saying, Comics. I like comics. Emerald balks. Seriously? Comics? We're about to get our asses reamed. We're coming back empty-handed, Mercury. She doesn't like failure. What, what are we going to tell her when we get there? Mercury replies nonchalantly. I am going to get down on my knees and beg for my life. A reply that earns a confused, What? from Emerald. Mercury rolls his head back and looks at her as he explains, I value my life more than my pride. If Cinder understood that, she'd still be alive, and maybe we wouldn't be coming back empty-handed. Emerald drops her tools and jumps to a stand, pointing a finger in Mercury's face. Don't talk about her like she's gone! He bats her hand away. Oh please, I didn't see her come up that lift. Might as well face the music that she bit it down there. Move on. Merc turns away, heading towards the cockpit. 
but Emerald follows. We don't know that! She could have just been injured down there! We didn't have a chance to go check! He sighs and turns back to her. And if she's alive, she may as well be dead. The cops will have her dead to rights and Salem's not going to waste time breaking a failure out of prison. Emerald tries to lift her hand to point at him indignantly, but she can't quite muster the strength, her words faltering. She's... she's not a failure. Merc rests his arm on the bulkhead for support, emphasizing his points by counting on his free hand. This is the second city we've walked away from without a relic, and we don't even have a maiden this time. She was in charge. It's on her. As long as we bow our heads and let her take the blame, we'll be fine. Again, he turns to leave and Emerald shrilly asks, We're here because of Cinder! How can you just throw her under the bus like that? The question actually gets a laugh out of Mercury and he looks over his shoulder at her. <laughs> because she do the same to us in a heartbeat. Emerald calls bullshit, but Mercury cuts her off. It's not, and you know it's not. I saw what happened during the fight, Emerald, and you're the only one on this ship that was surprised. Emerald's eyes widen like she's been slapped, and she grows quiet, shaking with rage and sorrow. Finally, she warbles out. She... no. That was for the mission. Mercury snorts. Tell yourself whatever helps you sleep at night. Emerald's head snaps up and she asks through teary eyes. How can you be so blasé? She was like a mother to us! Mercury's playful attitude evaporates almost immediately. He steps forward, pointing at her with his hand. I'm going to stop you right there. Unlike you, I had a father. He raised me. He trained me. Beat me until my legs stopped working. Stole my semblance with his own saying it was a crutch when really he just wanted to make himself stronger. As he rants, he walks forward, forcing Emerald further and further into the depths of the cabin. I've had my fill of parents. So when I tell you she would have sold you down the river to get a shred more prestige, take it to heart. And then, in an instant, his playful mood returns, flipping his hand aside dismissively. Or don't. If you get killed, it's no skin off my back. Emerald stares at him in shock, rage, pain, and a whole slew of other conflicting emotions as he heads up towards the cockpit. Slipping into it, the door between the two compartments closes shut, leaving Emerald alone. Back in the train station, we find Blake talking to Gira, Callie's son, and Ilya, saying their goodbyes. As Blake pulls away from hugging her parents, she asks about the future of the Menagerie Militia, now that the White Fang have been uprooted in Mistral. Callie responds that the majority of their people are returning home, but a number of members have shown a surprising amount of support for the idea of traveling to Vale to be of assistance in the restoration effort. Gira even muses that this might be a new route to explore for improving human and Faunus relations, and he's eager to see the effects. Blake smiles at that, and then looks to Ilya, still handcuffed to Sun. The girl is timid, and Blake asks warmly, Still think you made the right choice? Ilya is pensive before saying, I'm... still thinking on that. Her eyes fall to Gira and Kali. I guess I'll have plenty of time to sort through it all. Blake goes to lay her hand on Ilya's shoulder, but the uneasy look on Ilya's face causes her to pause. I hope you come to a conclusion that makes you happy. The unease washes off Ilya's face, and she offers Blake a small smile. The two share a look before Blake turns to Sun. Thanks for all your help, Sun. I couldn't have done, well, any of this without you. Sun smiles and rests his knuckles on his chin, playfully saying, Please, please, praise me more! Blake, equally playfully, bops him on the head with her hand. Rubbing the spot she hit, Sun looks up to her and says earnestly, Not gonna be the same without you around. She responds, Likewise, and looks down at the platform where Neptune is chatting amicably with Yang. Though now we have both our teams for company, so that's a plus. With this, Callie transfers the cuffs on Sun's wrist to her own, taking Ilya under her watch and saying her last goodbyes to Blake. Blake gives Ilya a final goodbye hug before walking with Sun down the stairs. They arrive at the bottom just as Yang and Neptune finish hugging and saying their own farewells. As they part, Neptune offhandedly asks, Hey, have you seen Jane anywhere? I wanted to say goodbye to her too. You came to Mistral together, right? Yang pops on her heels, scanning back and forth over the distant crowds as she says, Oh yeah, right, that wasn't Jane, that was Neo. I don't know where she got off to now that you mention it. Neptune blinks at her before asking, Wait, isn't that the girl who try- And Yang says matter-of-factly, Yep, but look, it's complicated. Just know I'm fine, she's fine, we're all fine. Neptune stares at her blankly before shaking his head and just muttering, Well, if you say so. As Sun walks up behind him, Sun pats Neptune on the back and says, Ah, uh, come on, man. If you're worried, have some backbone. To which an irritated Neptune turns and grabs Sun's tail, replying, Then why don't you give me some of yours? 
Sun recoils, pulling his tail loose and clutching it protectively to his chest, whining, Hi, you too! Much to the amusement of Blake and Yang. Behind them, Ruby pops out of a line of people and waves at Yang and Blake, calling, Guys, we're going to be boarding soon, get over here! The two turn back to Neptune and Sun and give them warm goodbyes before jogging over to reconvene with their team in the line. As they link up, Ruby is still hopping up and down, scanning the crowds, similar to how Yang had been moments earlier. Yang raises a brow and asks, What's up, Rubes? And Ruby responds, Ugh, I can't find Roman or Neo anywhere. They're going to miss the train. Blake, scanning in the opposite direction, narrows her eyes and flattens her ears as she says, Oh, you have got to be kidding me. The party turn in response and see Roman and Neo at the far end of the platform, already boarding onto the train, taking their sweet old time getting on board. The four stare at them and Weiss asks, Isn't that boarding for first class? From a distance, Roman catches their gaze and smiles at them wickedly, taunting them with a bow before boarding the train behind Neo. Yang balks at them. How did they even get that much Lien? Before they can discuss things further, a whistle sounds and boarding begins. We follow the team in quick cuts as they go through a security checkpoint, during which all their weapons are confiscated, excluding Crow thanks to being a fully licensed huntsman. This becomes a problem when Ruby is forced to hand over Crescent Rose, leading to a comical scene where security is pulling on her weapon while Yang tries to pull her apart from it. Eventually, Ruby's arms give out and she's separated from her baby, all the while Weiss apologizing for her childish behavior to the staff. Blake comforts Ruby as they board the train, saying her baby will be kept safely in the caboose until they arrive at Argus. Ruby sniffles, It's not fair, as she's pushed on board by Yang. There's a brief montage as the doors to the train close and it pulls out of the station, beginning its journey north. However, the last shot lingers as it leaves, pulling back to reveal Adam on its bike, watching it from a safe distance before kicking the bike into gear and cutting to black as its tires begin to spin. Episode 3 opens on darkness and the sound of rushing wind. With a flash of white, we find Cinder falling, Raven towering above her as she does. Another flash, and Cinder sees the top of Beacon's tower, and the wyvern turning to stone. Her vision flickers between both moments, her scowl sinking deeper, becoming more and more enraged as she slams into the waters at the bottom of the Haven Relic's chamber. Her head breaks the surface, her arms flailing in a weak attempt to tread water, only for an unseen current to drag her into a nearby crevasse. She is sucked through a series of caverns that slowly morph into stone aqueducts and later into metal piping. The current so strong that she's constantly being thrown into walls and stone. She is bruised and battered before she is flung into a river at the base of the mountain, limp and barely afloat. Coughing up a mixture of liquids from her waterlogged lungs and gripping her still bleeding wound, she crawls ashore on a stream bed, collapsing in a moment of relief and exhaustion. Only for that momentary relief to be broken when her grim arm wriggles to life. She screams in agony as her chest wound begins to bubble and fill with black liquid. As the hole fills and solidifies, the seam where the grim arm meets her skin sprouts pearly white teeth and bites into the flesh above, taking another inch of Cinder's human body for itself. Overwhelmed with pain, Cinder blacks out. As the light fades, we hear distant voices, but it's hard to make out what they're saying. Soon enough, they're all swallowed up by the sound of a raging fire. We quickly focus in on a teenage Cinder holding two blades. She is bloody, crying, enraged, ragged, stressed, tired, and staring at a burning inn in the Mistrali countryside. From behind, we hear a sickening voice, almost lyrical. I came all the way out here to kill a man, only to find a brat has already done the deed for me. Stepping around Cinder without a care in the world is Tyrion, looking down on her with fascination and a hint of contempt. I'm angry. And impressed. He presses in on her, staring deep into her eyes as he asks, Was that your house? Was that your family? Closer and closer, Cinder begins to reel back in alarm. Did you kill them? Did you enjoy it? Backed into a corner, the panicking Cinder lashes out at Tyrion. The man deftly steps aside and delivers a solid, painful blow to the back of her head, her aura already seemingly depleted. Cinder stumbles forward and a second strike knocks her out cold. Tyrion stares down at her before scooping her up in his arms. As he carries her away, the screen fades to black, his laughter carrying us into the next scene. 
His staccato laughter blurs into the thrum of a train engine. We fade in on a montage covering the great distance the Argus Limited has traveled, following it from rice paddy, to Mongolian steppes, to forests, to winter forest, all while the sun rises and falls over the course of two days. As the train rounds a corner, we find Adam's foot atop a mountainous ledge, next to his parked motorcycle. He expertly slides down the ledge while the train is passing below, managing to jump onto the caboose at the last second. With a few quick slashes, he cuts his way into the carriage and drops down, startling a lone steward. The man barely has time to react with shock before Adam's blade flicks through the air. We hear the sound of his blade cutting flesh as we cut to just outside the car, where we can see dark, bird-like shapes in the distance, flying beside the mountain, closing in on the train. Cutting inside the train, we find Team Ruby lounging in the relatively cramped traveler's cabin, clearly bored of the doldrum of the train travel. Ruby is playing a game on her scroll, while the other three are all reading magazines and books. A particularly enthusiastic play on her game causes Ruby to shift, her cape falling down and irritating Weiss, forcing the girl to push it aside. After losing another round of the game she's playing, Ruby gives up. Groaning in defeat that she's bored, she suggests that the four of them go play cards. The reception to the idea is lukewarm, but in lieu of anything else to do, the other three agree. Yang says that she'll have to get the cards from her bag, but before she can hop down off her bunk, Blake has already stood and volunteered to get them. As Blake skitters over to Yang's pack, Yang tells her that it's not a problem, but Blake is insistent, pulling the bag out from one of the shelves. No, no, really, I'll get it for you, she says, rummaging around in Yang's pack. As Blake pulls the pack out, Yang slips down from her bunk and says very firmly that Blake didn't need to do that. They were going to have to go to the lounge to play anyway, she could have just gotten it on the way. Blake answers, I know, I just thought you didn't need to push yourself is all. Yang looks at her, nonplussed. She grabs the bag from Blake, throwing it onto her own bunk effortlessly before handing the cards up to Ruby. Tersely, Yang says, You know what? Sorry, Ruby, but I think I'm going to take a walk. With that, Yang pushes her way past Blake into the hall of the train, Blake watching forlornly as she does. She seems like she's about to follow, but folds in on herself, shuffling back to her bunk and laying down on her side. Ruby and Weiss have been watching this exchange silently, and Ruby in particular seems deflated by it. Weiss, looking up at her, sighs, grabbing the cards in Ruby's hands and walking out the room. Come on, you dolt. We can find someone to play with in the lounge. Ruby looks to Blake, about to ask if she wants to join, but Blake has already turned away. Ruby drops from her bunk to follow, sparing a final concerned glance to Blake before leaving the cabin behind Weiss. We cut to Yang exiting onto the gangway connection between cars, soaking in the cold mountain air to clear her head. She sighs and stretches, her eyes closed, only for a black shape to pass in front of the camera. Hearing the noise it made, Yang opens her eyes and leans forward, only to have a manticore rush by the train, startling her and causing her to stumble back just as the train enters a tunnel. The service lights of the train are slow to turn on, bathing the tunnel in a dim red light, and Yang begins to hyperventilate. Suddenly, the corridors connected by the gangway begins to stretch and warble into that of Beacon Cafeteria, and Yang stretches backwards, falling to her feet beside the gangway service ladder. In the eerie light, Yang can make out a shape crossing in front of her. Adam, bathed in red and passing by without even sparing her a glance. In her panic, Yang reaches for the ladder and grips it, forcibly regulating her breathing until the world begins to stabilize. The vision clears as the train breaks out of the other side of the tunnel. No more cafeteria, no more Adam. Yang collapses against the ladder in relief, her breathing shallow. We cut to the train's game lounge, where we find Roman cheering over winning apparently another hand against Ruby, Weiss, and John in some kind of game. The three are looking at him with irritation, while Neo affectionately leans over his shoulder and lights a cigar. Cockily, he asks if the girls want to play another round, when someone across the room drops a compact mirror, causing it to break. One of the patrons, an old woman, offhandedly comments to that person that breaking a mirror like that is, SEVEN YEARS OF BAD LUCK! Ruby registers what the old woman says, and her face grows confused and concerned. She asks, Hey John, aren't you supposed to be watching Crow? To which she replies casually, What? No, it's Nora's turn. There is a pause before both turn to find Nora with one leg on a table and wearing a flapper's headband while pointing at the old woman who'd spoken earlier and declaring, Grandma, I am winning those pearls if it kills me! Ren is beside her with his own hand of cards, hiding his face in embarrassment of Nora's behavior. John and Ruby share a look, and he shrugs. I'm sure he'll be fine? Ruby drops her head and sighs before standing. Knowing him, he's probably passed out somewhere instead of packing. 
I'm gonna go look down the train. Do you guys mind heading up the train to see if you can find him? John stands, groaning but agreeing. With Ren's help, they pull the energized Nora away from the table. Weiss stands too, joining Ruby as she goes to the door. Left alone at their respective tables, Roman and Neo look to the old woman. Roman holds up a deck of cards and says, Ante up! The grandma sighs, stands, and rolls up her sleeves, surprising Roman and Neo with an anchor tattoo. Moving back to Team Ruby's shared cabin, we find Blake sulking in her bed, head buried in her legs. She wonders aloud, Why did I do that? This should be easy. While she's lost in thought, she misses two voices conversing outside, questioning if they have the right room. Seconds later, Cardin and Russell come stepping dramatically through the ajar cabin door, with Cardin smugly saying, Well, if it isn't Team... Blake. There is a beat of silence as the two stare at each other, during which Cardin catches sight of Blake's ears. Blake, the... that... Yeah, okay, that explains a lot. Russell is behind him, staring in absolute shock, and under their combined scrutiny, Blake folds her ears. Seeing the bitter look in her eyes, Cardin raises his hands and says, Hey, hey, I'm not judging. For a moment, he's quiet before clarifying, I know that I said some shitty things back at Beacon, but I'm... Things have changed. Cardin's face grows distant and sad, and Blake's face lightens with a bit of understanding, relaxing a little bit in their presence. Finally, Blake asks, What are you doing here? And Russell replies, stepping into the room, Why to say hello is all. Carton steps in after him. Thought we might catch up. A lot's happened since the fall. Blake scoffs and squeezes into herself. You can say that again. There is an awkward silence and the three shift uncomfortably, not quite sure what to say. Carton is the first to break it, asking, So, how have you been? Blake stares at him before sighing. I've been better. It's been a rough couple of weeks. Cardin and Russell share a look, and he asks, Want to talk about it? Blake glares at him, and he shrugs defensively. It's an offer, you don't have to take it. Blake sighs again, and takes a few cautious glances at Cardin before saying, Yang and I have been having a... thing. I... we haven't seen each other in months, and... I don't know, it feels like we can't get back on the same page. We try, but... Things just keep being awkward. Cardin and Russell share another look as Cardin moves to sit on Weiss's bed, asking, She said anything to you? And Blake shrugs in exasperation. She hasn't. It's like every time I try to help her, I screw up something and she won't tell me why. Cardin blinks, almost stating more than asking, Maybe she doesn't want the help. Yang's almost as stubborn as I am. It probably hurts her pride you think she needs help in the first place. Blake's face contorts as she registers his words before slowly unscrewing in a mini epiphany. That... I mean... Maybe you're right? Cardin leans back into the bed's support strut, threading his hands behind his head. Of course I'm right. No maybes about it. Blake raises a doubtful brow at him. And when did you, of all people, become so well-versed in relationship problems? Cardin shrugs. I'm just taking cues from Velvet. She's like... the most empathic person I know. Blake looks down at the mace at Cardin's hip, where a small rabbit keychain is dangling from the grip. Uh-huh. And what other cues have you taken from Velvet? Blake asks, motioning to the keychain. Cardin follows her gaze and immediately snaps his head away, cheeks reddening. I'm a big fan of pumpkin peats, so what? Blake actually manages a small, teasing smile at that. Oh? I never knew they sold keychains. Russell shifts against the bedpost, speaking up really for the first time the whole conversation. Ah, uh, don't tease him, Belladonna. He doesn't like to admit he's a big softie. Cardin glares at the smug Russell. I'm not! Look, after you fall down an elevator shaft with someone, you can get a little bit sentimental, you know? Blake's eyes widen, asking, You fell down an elevator shaft. And Cardin replies, It's a long story. We fade back in on Ruby and Weiss walking down one of the carriages of the train, Weiss saying, Ruby, he's a grown man. He can look after himself. And Ruby replying, He's supposed to be looking after the relic, Weiss. Ospin entrusted us to get it to Ironwood, and it feels like he's not taking that seriously. They open the next compartment and find Crow at the bar, schmoozing it up very closely with a random woman. Both girls stare in open disgust, and Ruby pinches her brow as she approaches, while Weiss watches with a disheartened sigh. Ruby walks up to her uncle and grabs him by the collar, dragging him off his chair and towards the door leading down the length of the train. He of course flounders and asks, What? Ruby, what are you doing? And she responds, 
come on, you need to pack or else you'll lose something. The woman at the bar watches in disdain as he's dragged away, glaring at Ruby and Weiss as they guide him out. Crow stumbles, saying, I was gonna do that later, you didn't have to worry about it. His voice fades out and we cut to them as they step onto the carriage with Team Ruby's cabin. Crow and Ruby are still bickering when Weiss stops abruptly. Ruby glances over at her confused, only for her eyes to fall to the end of the corridor, where Adam is just standing there, menacingly. He locks, uh, eyes with Weiss, at least as best he can do with his blindfold on, before Blake and Carden poke their heads out from the team's cabin. Blake follows their gaze and immediately her face lifts in shock as she says, Adam? We cut to black. End of episode. Episode 4 follows up immediately where Episode 3 left off, at the stare down with Adam. Crow reflexively shoves Ruby and Weiss back through the train car door, peppering Adam with harrying fire and yelling at them to run. Carden similarly shoves Blake back into the cabin and yells at Russell to get her to safety. Blake and Russell barely share a glance before both pop out the cabin's window and worm their way up onto the roof. Pressing an intruder alarm on his scroll, Carden rushes out of the cabin to join Crow in fighting Adam. We cut away to Roman, Neo, and the old woman, locked in a heated hand of cards when the alarm begins to blare, bringing everything to a screeching halt inside of the lounge. Roman barely gets a moment to say, the hell, before the glass ceiling of the carriage is shattered. Landing among the shards is a manticore, its scorpion tail raised to strike, and it takes only a second for panic to set in, spurring the civilians in the car to flee. Roman and Neo manage to dodge out of the way as the tail slams between them, but Roman is blindsided when it swings with its horns. He and a table are caught and thrown into a wall, trapping him behind it. On the gangway where Crow had shoved Ruby and Weiss, the two are heatedly debating about what to do. Ruby is quick to say, We gotta find Yang, and Weiss counters, We don't know where she is. Ruby then suggests, We regroup with the rest of Ranger, and again, Weiss shoots it down. They're at the other end of the train. Frustrated, Ruby claws her fingers at Weiss. We can't just leave them to fight Adam alone! Weiss, equally stressed, says, We don't have our weapons! Which causes Ruby to pause. Her eyes spinning with a plan, she declares, Then we'll have to get them. From above, Blake's head hangs down from the roof of the train. That'll be easier to do from up here! She shouts over the rushing wind, offering her hand to Ruby and Weiss. As the two are pulled up, both they and the audience get their first solid look at the descending flock of Grimm swarming over the train. Awed and alarmed, Weiss asks, Did Adam draw all this? Ruby frowns and remarks, One person couldn't draw this many Grimm, could they? Turning to Blake, she comments, Getting to the caboose might be tricky. Russell steps up and pulls out his scroll. With a press of a button, defense turrets raised from the center of each compartment, automatically tracking and attacking the closing Grimm. Spinning a dagger in his free hand, he says proudly, I got you girls covered, get your stuff! The three smile and nod to him, turning to rush across the train. The four barely make it halfway across the cabin when Adam's blade comes cutting up through the ceiling, knocking Russell prone and forcing him to scramble as to not fall off the train. Cutting a hole, Adam jumps up onto the roof, glaring at them under his blindfold. Weiss begins pushing Ruby forward, yelling, Go, go, go! Get our weapons! We'll catch up! As she and Blake begin to run as well. Ruby, reluctant though she is to leave her team, rushes forward in a burst of petals. Adam stalks forward after the girls, only for Russell to lunge at him, forcing him to back off but not quite phasing him. Carden and Crow jump up through the hole Adam cut and join Russell in engaging Adam. The three are tenacious, but Adam manages to hold his own against all three with some amount of strain. Back in the lounge car, Neo has joined Roman under the table, trying to get him free as the manticore stabs at them with its stinger. Neo rolls to the side to avoid it, but Roman's mobility is limited by the table and he's forced to twist his body in uncomfortable ways to dodge it. Roman yells, Neo, do something! And Neo uses her semblance to summon a perfect decoy of herself, all while trying to pry Roman out from under the table. Unfortunately, the manticore ignores it, its tail shattering the illusion incidentally as it flails through the air. The two stare at where the image was and she looks to him. He shrugs defeatedly. Well, it was something as he barely dodges the next stinger attack. From the engine side door, John, Ren, and Nora push their way through the fleeing civilians, entering the room and quickly taking stock of the situation. John begins giving orders, starting with, Get the civilians out of the room! And prompting Roman to yell, Save the civilians! Save us! Just as the stinger embeds itself in the wooden table. John grabs a slab of broken table to use as a shield, and Nora rips a curtain rod off the wall as an impromptu hammer. Ren, for the first time in a long time, gets to show off his unarmed fighting techniques, running in without any weapons whatsoever. 
When the Manticore Singer doesn't pull free of the table all the way, it actually jerks the table loose, giving Roman and Neo the opportunity to scramble away. Unfortunately, Neo is swatted aside by the Grimm's claw, and Roman is cornered, pushed back against the wall as the Stinger rapidly stabs down at him. As one of the strikes is about to skewer Roman, Ren runs up in front of him and blocks it with his palm, focusing his aura into one spot. With the fingers of his other hand, Ren stabs into the base of the Stinger, causing it to explode and force the Manticore to recoil. Roman, grabbing at his chest, aimlessly exclaims, You bastard, I could kiss you, earning a glare from Ren. The train enters a tunnel, catching John's attention. Calculating a plan, he yells to Ren to keep it off balance, while telling Nora to rush past the Manticore with him. Getting around it, Ren batters it with his open palms until it's disoriented enough to walk onto a flattened table. John, holding Nora's shoulder, boosts her aura, which she then uses to reinforce her body and lift the Manticore up through the broken window. The creature is pushed up into the stone ceiling of the tunnel, and friction does the rest, grinding the Grim away. As it turns into a fine black powder, chunks of its skull fly back, cutting into the gun turret of a car behind them, damaging it. Our five protagonists inside the lounge car stare at where it was, winded and shocked. They begin to celebrate, only for the tunnel to end and something outside to catch their eye. Waves and waves of Grim flying down to attack the train. John groans. That is a lot of Grim. Back with Ruby, we find her in the midst of said Grim, ducking and weaving as the train's defensive turrets are barely keeping the Grim at bay. She slides to a stop in order to catch her breath, cursing, Stupid caboose, why are you so far away? Before continuing her sprint. Zipping down the train, she passes over Yang's gangway. Yang barely catches the red blur out of the corner of her eye, and asks in a confused daze, Ruby? We continue following Ruby as she slips into the last gangway of the train, disappearing inside the caboose. From inside a weapon locker, we see Ruby open it and say, My baby, Mama's missed you and she needs your help! Cut to Yang poking her head up from the gangway in confusion just as the winded Blake and Weiss arrive. She asks what's happening, only for Ruby to run up with their weapons haphazardly strewn across her body. Wordlessly, she distributes the proper weapons to her teammates, and the team gets Yang caught up on what's happening. Adam's attacking the train, and he seems to have brought an army of Grimm with him. Yang, hearing this, freezes, realizing that it was actually Adam that she saw when she was having her breakdown earlier. As Ruby and Weiss rush off to join the fight, Yang hesitates. Blake, about to take off herself, kips back and asks Yang if she's okay. Yang shakes it off, saying she is, breaking into a run after Ruby and Weiss. Blake furrows her brows in concern and follows. Back with Adam, he's still holding up well against the other three men, and even turns the tide. With a slash, he knocks Russell clear off the train to be quickly snagged by a manticore mid-fall. Cardin calls after him in a panic, and Adam uses that as an opening to knock Cardin into a gangway. Cardin collapses against the side, and his arm is wedged between the two cars as they collide, crushing his shoulder and flaring his aura as it fully expends itself to protect him. He manages to roll onto the gangway properly before he passes out from the pain. Crow and Adam spar briefly, but it doesn't last long as Harbinger becomes caught in the hood of the train, and Crow is dazed by a headbutt from Adam. His opponent disoriented, Adam looks down the train's length and sees Blake in the distance. He slams Wilt into blush and begins to glow, preparing a moon slice that will cut across Team Ruby in one fatal blow. Crow, in a double-sided daze, instinctually tackles Adam, who finishes the slice mid-fall. The wave red arcs just over Team Ruby's heads, missing them all by a foot or two and cutting into the mountains behind them. Adam and Crow slip into the valley fog below. Blake flinches as the red slash slams into the mountain, and she watches the slope crack and shudder. Horrified, she mutters, Avalanche. The rest of her team looks to her, equal amounts of horror dawning on their faces. From the fog below, a lone Corvid flies to catch up with the train, rushing into a damaged train car where it shifts back into Crow. Stumbling into the next car over, he finds Cardin being tended to by John, Ren, and Nora, while Roman and Neo keep guard by the doors. He stares at them all for a second before saying, Ruby's got your weapons. The three look to each other, and Ren asks, Where is she? Crow points to the ceiling. Up top. Cardin tries to push himself from the wall, saying, I should be up there. But John pushes him back down and replies, No, every capable person with a weapon should be up there by in time. You need to stay down here and protect the people on the train. I'm relying on you. John punctuates this by resting a hand on Carton's good shoulder. Carton grabs John's wrist for support and nods, standing even though he's clearly uneasy on his feet. Opening his scroll, he takes control of the PA, ordering all people on the train to move to the front cars for shelter from the Grim. 
Cardin forces himself to regain his footing as he wanders out of the car. Roman and Neo move to follow, only for John to stop them. No, you heard what I said, get up top! Roman and Neo look at him, confused and horrified. Why? To which John responds frankly, We're all unarmed, we need escorts. Up top with Team Ruby, the four are already locked in a desperate struggle with the swarm of manticores. While they're individually doing okay, as a team, they're uncoordinated, and when Ruby lists off attack names like Ice Claw and Rosefire, the four only seem to step all over each other. Ruby in particular becomes frustrated, yelling, Yellow Jacket, no, Yellow Jacket, damn it! She herself is struggling more than usual, still carrying most of Team Juniper's gear, and she's forced to make an off-the-cuff attack with Magna Hilt. Thankfully, the hammer and the simultaneous grenade kill the manticore that was attacking Ruby. Unluckily, the blowback is so intense it sends Ruby tumbling back towards the front of the train. This is when Nora arrives and catches the hilt, and Ruby offers Nora a sheepish smile, saying, She has a bit of a kick. Nora grins wickedly, hefting her weapon with pride. And that's just when I'm not the one wielding her. John and Ren arrive just behind Nora, and Ruby passes off the rest of the weapons before ordering, Sugar Rush into Olympus Drop! Nora swings her hammer in a wide, quick arc, while Ruby jumps and lands on the head during the first spin. A second spin, and Nora uses the built-up momentum to fling Ruby forward into the fray. John runs in front of Nora, offering up his shield for her to spring off of. Ruby flies in the air and hooks one of the manticores by the neck with Crescent Rose, tipping it mid-air while Nora comes sailing in to smash it from the side. Nora lands and catches Ruby just as Neo rushes by to assist Yang, who is struggling to take down one of the manticores. Lagging just behind her is Crow and Roman, the latter of which only entering the fray to protect Neo. As the fight takes on a decidedly more chaotic tone, the train begins to cross a massive chasm spanned by a massive bridge that ends in a tunnel, all while being chased by the rapidly approaching avalanche. As their fight nears the halfway point of the bridge, the avalanche hits it, breaking apart struts and supports. The caboose is the first car to fall, becoming consumed in the snow, and it quickly begins to pull down the rest of the cars on the train. Ruby, seeing this and realizing it's going to domino until it drags the entire train down with it, shoves Nora onto the adjoining car with John and Ren. She gives them one final terrified but resolute look and wordlessly cuts the car connection with one clean swing. John's eyes widen, realizing what just happened, and he reaches for Ruby, screaming her name as they pass into the tunnel and its entrance is covered in snow, cutting the scene to black and ending the episode. Episode 5 opens on a pure white screen that slowly crumples into the rapid snowfall of the avalanche. The wind and snow clear just enough to see the train, plummeting down the mountainside only moments after the end of the prior episode. We get snapshots of each character from the bottom of the train going up, catching their initial reactions to the fall. Yang is lowest, having her metal arm dug into the side of one of the carriages and being dragged down the side of it by gravity. Blake is doing her best to keep herself stable by swinging from piece of debris to piece of debris with her ribbon. Weiss and Roman are near the middle of the falling train cars, gripping on for dear life to opposing gangway ladders. Roman is gripping onto Neo, who had opened her umbrella to float and almost became swept away in the disaster. Crow lands on the door to one of the carriages, just as the one above it slams down onto it, forcing it inside. He hurtles through the center of the train before turning into a bird and flying out the other end. At the very top, where the train was severed, is Ruby, who managed to hook herself onto the dome of the train car and is struggling to keep track of everything happening around her. Weiss watches as a manticore comes bursting out of the snow, catching Blake off guard and knocking her off her swing. Quick on her feet, Weiss slides down the side of her compartment and stabs Mirton Aster into the roof, summoning a gravity glyph to keep herself in place and one that safely locks Blake down on the same car. Unfortunately, further down, she sees Yang begin to fall, and she has to expend extra effort to summon a third glyph and keep her grounded as well. Weiss is visibly sweating at keeping all three glyphs in place, and it's made even more stressful as a manticore comes flying in to kill her. Before it can reach her, Ruby sees this and shifts Crescent Rose into its rifle mode, willingly letting herself fall as she opens fire on the Grim. It's knocked away, and so is a second one, but as Ruby is falling, a broken beam from the bridge comes sliding in to crash against the carriage she's sliding down. She barely dodges in time, but Crescent Rose is caught between the beam and the carriage and is damaged, locking it in its rifle configuration. The beam continues tumbling, taking it on a crash course with the dazed Blake. 
Yang looks to Weiss and shouts her name, and Weiss quickly releases Yang so she can spring up and punch the base of the pillar, shattering it into splinters all the way up its spine and saving Blake. Unfortunately, this sends Yang careening off into the avalanche's flurry. Neo, seeing Yang in danger, disengages her umbrella and plummets after her. Roman, still gripping her leg, yells, Neo, Neo, and he is forced to let go. Neo skydives through the chaos after Yang, flipping and running along fragments of the bridge into the snow. Roman, having lost his balance and his grip, falls forward, landing on Weiss's back and breaking her concentration on Blake. She maintains her own glyph, thankfully, and manages to recover in enough time to lock down Roman as well, but Blake barely manages to clear her head in time to sling her ribbon into the debris and reorient herself. Too low to ascend anymore, Blake focuses on slowing her descent with the falling collateral. Up with Ruby, she's barely balancing on the side of one of the train cars when a manticore charges her. She tries to transform Crescent Rose in order to cut it, but discovers its damaged state and has to dodge in a panic as the manticore swipes at her. It careens past her into the snow, right past a train car that's beginning to drift towards the one that Weiss is standing on with alarming speed. Without sparing a second thought, Ruby activates her semblance and rushes down the train cars, pushing her speed to its absolute limit and suffusing her legs with aura to try and kick it beyond any speed she's ever reached alone. Her legs strain under the pressure, but it achieves the desired effect. The world around her begins to slow as she rushes down the side of the train cars, dodging grim and debris all the way down to her partner. As the carriage closes in to crush Weiss, Ruby tackles her, pushing her out of the way just in time. With her concentration broken, Weiss's glyph holding Roman breaks as well, sending him into freefall. The two carriages collide in a show of sparks, and time speeds back up. We watch as the caboose lands at the base of the mountain first, followed by the subsequent car hurtling into an icy lake, smashing it open. Yang and Neo follow right after, splashing down into the water. Blake slingshots around one of the cars just before it lands, and manages to land almost perfectly on the ice. Roman, hurtling unassisted, is caught by Crow, and both men tumble into the snow covering all the ice. Last are Ruby and Weiss, who touch down using Ruby's momentum to attempt a horizontal skid. Ruby's form is off, however, and she lands on one foot only. There's a sickening snap as she and Weiss go rolling across the ice, Ruby shielding Weiss as best she can with her own body. Over with Blake, she's breathing heavily, seemingly relieved to be alive, only to hear another crash behind her. We get a wide shot as Ruby, Weiss, Roman, Crow, and Blake all see another train car crash into the lake. Ruby and Weiss watch with horror as the ice begins to crack around them. Crow, meanwhile, looks up and sees the rest of the falling debris, his vision clear but hazy around the corners. He yells, Ah crap! Get off the ice! Blake immediately begins to dash for the tree line, while Ruby uncurls from Weiss and tries to run, only to falter on her bad leg with a yelp. Weiss rushes behind Ruby and loops an arm around her torso, dragging Ruby as quickly as she can towards the nearest patch of trees. Under the water of the lake, Yang and Neo are reorienting from the crash, only for a train carriage to smash down between them. The two flounder and take off away from the crashing debris. They get about two-thirds of the way before a long stretch of bridge crashes down onto the ice and into Neo, hooking her and dragging her deeper. Yang sees this and swims down to Neo, who is now pinned between the beam and the lake's floor. She tries to free Neo, but struggling makes her choke on her own breath, and she's forced to retreat to the surface. She bursts out of the lake, hanging on the edge of the ice like a swimming pool deck, coughing and sputtering for air. Blake, having gotten herself to safety, immediately rushes to Yang's side. She tries to help Yang out, but Yang panically declines Blake's hand, sputtering, Neo's trapped, and pointing into the water. Blake freezes until she hears Roman calling in panic for Neo as well. Blake snaps to awareness, ties her ribbon around her waist, throws the blade into a nearby tree, and jumps in, followed swiftly by Yang. The two men see this, and Crow takes a moment to register what the ribbon is for. As soon as he realizes what Yang and Blake are doing, he's rushing to grip it and yelling for Roman to help. Weiss and Ruby manage to hobble over, about to ask what's going on, when Crow hushes them. He stares at the ribbon, everything around them going quiet save for the parts of the train still crashing and sinking into the lake. After an uncomfortably long pause where we cut between the surface characters and the water, the line gets a tug. Crow and Roman immediately begin to pull, but the strain weighs on them. Crow yells for Ruby and Weiss to help. Ruby tries, but her leg buckles under her and Weiss has to step up to assist, even straining herself further by summoning a glyph to keep the three of them anchored. After an intense struggle, they manage to pull Blake, Yang, and an unconscious Neo free from the water. 
Still coughing up water herself, Blake jumps to start CPR on Neo, and after a few solid pumps to her diaphragm, Neo also coughs, retching out a small flood of liquid from her lungs. The small woman rolls over and painfully spits up the rest, and everyone's shoulders relax after all the physical and emotional exhaustion. Yang flies into Neo's side, hugging her tightly and flaring her aura just as Roman drops down and hugs her from the front. Weiss and Crow slump against the tree that Ruby is resting under. Blake watches Neo and Yang with some level of jealousy, but distracts herself by taking off her soaking coat. Awkwardly holding it in her arms, she comments, We'll need to find our luggage. All eyes turn to the cars that manage to land on solid ground, including the caboose. Ruby nods in agreement, takes a focusing breath, and turns to her uncle. Crow, you, Roman, and Blake start looking for anything that survived the crash. Weiss, make us a fire. Use dust if you have to. We need it now. Yang, Neo, both of you warm up. With that, she unbuckles her cloak and passes it over to Roman for him to cover the shivering duo. Uneasy stares are shared, and they're only made more uncomfortable when howling can be heard echoing in the distance. Ruby hardens her face and rests Crescent Rose across her hip, saying, Everyone stay alert. There's a moment of lag before everyone quietly breaks apart and spreads out to accomplish their assigned tasks. Ruby looks to Yang, who is huddling tight to Neo, trying to reassure her that everything will be fine. Neo shifts a little, but is still barely responsive. We crossfade to an open flame that Weiss has managed to start, with Ruby, Weiss, Yang, and Neo all trying to keep warm around it. Several bags are dropped into the snow by Blake and Roman, and Blake explains, We found what we could, but there's not much that survived. Even less of it that's dry. Crow walks up behind them, adding, Well, at least one thing survived the crash. And he wheels Bumblebee up to the crude campsite. He scowls, however, and looks to Yang. Sorry, kid, but it's come out worse for wear. It won't start. Yang frowns, but is too tired to complain, shivering closer to Neo. Y speaks up, shaking her head in disbelief. It doesn't make any sense. Adam couldn't have attracted that many Grimm. Blake immediately counters that bitterly. You haven't met Adam. Only for Ruby to cut in stoically. No, Weiss is right. It couldn't have been him. A single person couldn't do that. Weiss agrees. Even when the Bramlins herded Grimm, it was a group effort. Blake, however, sticks to her guns and insists that Adam could, in fact, draw that many Grimm. But the conversation fades into the background as Roman is watching them. His eyes drift into the distance, as if distracted, and it slowly peels away into a look of confusion, then shocked revelation. They followed us he mutters. Then he repeats more loudly to overpower the argument. They followed us. The conversation dies out and Ruby is quiet, putting a finger to her lips. After a moment of rumination, she catches on and says, After I cut the cars, the Grimms seemed to stay behind with us. They didn't follow the rest of the train. They got themselves buried in an avalanche instead of chasing after a whole train full of panicking civilians. Crow shrugs and challenges her observation. Grim aren't choosy. They're first come, first serve. And Roman retorts, Well, evidently not. Yang, teeth chittering, offers, Maybe it was just a fluke? Weiss shakes her head again. It can't be. The last time a pack of Grimm acted like coordinated was... And Crow finishes. Beacon. He looks over to Roman. Hey, Oz. What do you make of all this? Roman blinks and pauses for a moment, waiting for Ozpin to arrive at the forefront. Only for Ozpin to not manifest. Brows furrowing, Roman turns away to talk to himself, tapping his temple and saying, Hey, old man, you in there? He becomes more and more confused and looks into a nearby chunk of ice to see his reflection. He stares into it as if it'll talk back to him with Ozpin's voice. Instead, there is silence. However, gradually, we hear the sound of Ozpin's whispers, inner thoughts that sound incomprehensible to us but are seemingly readable to Roman. Roman's eyes narrow further and he says, You know what drew them in, don't you? Ozpin is silent, but Roman pushes. Is it me? Finally, Ozpin replies, No. Is it you? No. Grasping at straws and with a brief pause, Roman asks, Is it the relic? Ozpin's reply is slow to come. No. Roman realizes it is the relic and looks to where it's clipped to Ruby's belt. Osmond realizes that Roman knows and quickly tries to obscure it by mentally saying, Its intentions are not to draw the Grimm, but... Roman cuts him off. Intentions? That thing thinks? Is it alive? 
Ruby blinks in surprise and takes a moment to figure out what it is. She pulls the relic from her hip, looking at it in confusion and anxiety. Again, mentally, Ozpin says, You mustn't say a word more, prompting Roman to snarl. What are you hiding from us, Oz? Roman's posture changes with an almost audible snap as Ozpin takes over. He looks to Ruby and speaks in Ozpin's voice with a calm, clarifying tone. You need not worry about the relic. It is perfectly safe. Roman's face contorts as the real Roman reasserts control. He manages to shout, Oh, that's bullshit, and you know it! Another twist in his face, and Ozpin takes back over, Roman's body warring between the two men's distinct posture. Ozpin hisses, Your naivety is endangering everyone, everything! The rest of the party watch this exchange in confusion and horror as the two men fight for dominance of the body. Neo especially, in her half-awake daze, is horrified. Roman's body locks up and he begins to breathe heavily, mixing the audio of both men breathing. Eventually, Roman looks to Ruby, gritting his teeth and saying, Jin! She's called Jin! Red, call her now! In her terrified confusion, Ruby looks down at the relic, then to the struggling Roman, then to Neo's frightened eyes. She looks back to the relic and calls Jin's name. A fog drifts in from the trees, thin at first, then thicker and thicker, the winds weaving random patterns in the air while kicking up the fallen snow. Then, in the consuming whiteout, a magnificent woman of blue and gold appears, floating above the barely visible ground. I am Jin, she announces, a warm smile on her lips. She continues, Sent by the gods to catalog the knowledge of existence and to bestow it upon the inheritors of man. I can answer questions of all there is and all there used to be. But temper your thirsts for knowledge, for I can only answer up to three questions. And once asked, each question takes a century to renew. This is my second summoning in as much time. As such, there are only two questions that remain. Please, tell me, what is your query? Everyone in the group is visibly awed at the sight, completely unable to speak. Ruby looks to Roman, who matches her gaze, as Ozpin. Ozpin pleads to Ruby, please, Ruby, don't. Crow steps beside Ozpin, looking to the group and saying, hey. He doesn't get another word in as Blake and Weiss draw their weapons on him and Ozpin, faces confused and panicked. Crow raises his hands in defeat, looking to Ruby as he says, do whatever you think is right, kiddo. Ruby silently looks to Jin, the cogs in her brain turning, and she asks, What is Ozpin hiding? Instantly, Ozpin rushes at her to physically stop her, and Ruby reactively twists to face him, drawing the damaged crescent rose and firing right at him. Ozpin vanishes into the void as the gunshot reverberates around the room. Ruby, now completely alone, looks around in a panic as Jin narrates, Once upon a time... There was a girl. Cut to black. End of episode. Once upon a time, there was a girl. A girl? A girl. She's supposed to be 16. Really, Ruby Fairy Tales? This is a 16 year old? God damn, we really do need to fix everything in this goddamn show. Once upon a time, there was a girl. Beloved by her father, he sought to keep his fair child safe for all time, sealing her into his tallest tower with lock and key and spell. Pampered though she was, with all the toys and books that she could ask for, all the sweets the cooks could make, the girl was very lonely. She would look out the window, sighing to herself and wishing upon every star in the night sky for a prince so charming, like those in the books that served as her only company. She would spend her days reading, playing, doing anything to ignore the loneliness she felt. Her father, knowing of her plight, tried to appease her and on her 16th birthday gave her a magic glass that would allow her to see the world beyond. The girl became dazzled with what she saw within the glass, and unbeknownst to her father, it only made her hunger more for her freedom. Eventually, she had enough. Gathering paper and quill, the girl wrote to her prince, whoever he may be, and breathed life into the paper. With the wings of a bird, the papers flew, scattered from her lonely tower across the world. She waited and waited, watching the horizon for a hero to arrive. And to her delight, not one, but many crested the hill. 
but sadly, none would make it up to her tower, as her father had protected the castle against all who would come to steal her. Dismayed, the girl lost all hope, turning her eyes from the window never to look back again. And then, one day, came a man saddled in silver. More cunning than brave, the man fought his way through the castle, up the tower, and vanquished her conniving father. The spell broken, the girl leapt into the man's arms. In thanks for her freedom, the girl fell to her knees and offered her hand in marriage in all the lands her father possessed. Instead, the hero lifted her to her feet, declaring that she need not be in another man's cage. Instead, she can belong to the world. Hand in hand, the two fled the castle and ventured the world, all while the girl grew to love life and the hero that had rescued her from her solitude. The storybook facade peels away, pulling back to reveal a weathered children's storybook in Neo's hand, labeled The Girl in the Tower. Neo's appearance has reverted to her Jane Doe look from fixing Volume 4, and in fact, she's bedridden in the hospital that she was retained in during that period. She looks at the book in confusion, before resting it down on her bedside table. Stubby hands reach up and pulls it down, and when we cut cameras, it's now a different storybook labeled The Love Not Meant To Be, being held in the hands of a very young Yang. She's resting her head on someone's lap, and smiling all the while as she cracks open the book and begins to read aloud, her voice pitching back into Jin's. Long, long ago, there traveled two adventurers, a noble knight and his rescued ward. The knight had love for all, but his ward had love for one, and she treasured this love every day she could spend by his side. For many years, she held her secret close, refusing to tell him out of fear for his answer, though it pained her to do so. Together, the two traversed this world, seeking new lands and adventure. Along the way, they met people of all flags and banners. Many became friends, many became foes, and a special few became family. Sadly, the winds of fate were unkind and the knight took ill. The ward was inconsolable as she searched far and wide. No healer, no spell, no incantation across the world could save him. Finally, she prayed to the gods to save him, night and day, and as his time neared, she anguished whether to reveal her secret. Before she even knew it, the knight found himself at death's door. With his final breaths, the knight looked to his ward and smiled softly. You are so beautiful just like I knew you would be. Unbeknownst to her, the knight was wise to her affection, and all he had wished in his final moments was to have her by his side. The night would pass, and day would come, leaving the ward and the world to mourn for the times that never would be and would never come again. A grand funeral was held in his name, with celebration to his life and success. A statue, magnificent in scale, was erected and all those they had touched along their journeys would come to pay their respects. Upon the foot of his statue, the ward cried, and pledged to live her life for him, and without regret. Yang's, now adult, voice carries on the last few words from Jin. The adult girl is sitting beside a bed containing two nebulous figures, as if she had been reading them goodnight. Yang closes the book and looks to the two warmly before something clicks in her brain and she shakes free of the feeling. She stands, pushing the chair back and dropping the book. We follow the book as it falls, before it hits the ground, changing into a new book called Mighty and Despair as it does. Stepping up to it is little Blake, in Gira's study in Menagerie. She picks it up curiously, taking it over to his couch and hopping on it before beginning to read, her voice blending quickly into Jin's. In a land far away, there was a grieving widow who had grown tired of mourning. With no more tears to shed, she sought out the gods to relieve the ache in her broken heart. Seeking the god of life, she made her pilgrimage across the world to his verdant lands. Tired from her journey, the widow knelt before the glistening waters of life and beseeched the god who dwelt within. The god of life rose from his pool in a golden visage, and she begged of him, Please, my lord, listen to this widow's plea. My love has been taken from me too soon. I would only wish that you might bring him back, that we might spend the rest of our years together. The god looked down at her with pity. What you ask cannot be done. You wish to spend your years together, but he has no more years to spend. The widow yelled in anguish against the god, but for all she wished to spend one more day with her love, the god would not grant it. Undeterred, the widow left his spring and sought his brother, the god of death. From the shores of his blackened pool, the widow begged once more. Please, my lord, listen to this widow's plea. My love has been taken from me too soon. 
I would only wish that you might bring him back, that we might spend the rest of our years together. The god of death was shocked, for all mortals feared him, and he asked, Why do you not seek my brother, the god of life? It is his domain that governs those who live. The widow, in cunning, replied, Who is the god of life to dictate who dies? It is you, my lord, who is domain over death. It is the beauty of all that live that they should die. Whom I love was not given the time he was deserved, and only you can grant the time so owed. I only ask that he be given time enough for us, then both you may take. Flattered, the god of death replied, For what you have braved to be here, begging prettily does not suit you. Stand, child, and have your wish granted. And with this, the god of death breathed life into the widow's love. The widow rejoiced and embraced her love, but their reunion was not meant to last. The love's return affronted the world itself, and from the darkened pool of the god of death grew lifeless shadows. Before them, in a flash of gold, the god of life appeared. To the shadows he motioned and said, Brother, behold what you have wrought. This widow has fooled you, and now you bring about that which was never meant to be. Indignant, the brother returned. As you decided who dies, I shall decide what lives. These are my creations. In fear, the widow and her love fled from the fountain. However, the god of life witnessed this and snapped his fingers, returning her love to dust. In rebuke of his brother, he said, Pretty flattery has blinded you. So quickly she came to you, and so quickly she leaves. As she did to me, she has done to you, my brother. In spite, the god of light ensnared the widow and dropped her beneath the waters of his tree, saying, For your deceit, you shall never know death's embrace, and you shall never return to your love. With his creation gone, the god of death roared, I shall decide what lives and dies. In reply, the god of life said, In that, brother, I am afraid you are wrong. Taking to the skies, the gods became as dragons and fought for ages uncounted. From below the water, the widow was refused the release of death, drowning in life as the gods waged war above. As time faded by, so did the gods, and upon the shores the widow found herself breathing. And the widow wandered the scarred world under the broken moon for all of eternity, forever to be haunted by shadows. Blake's voice fades back in as she appears in her beacon outfit, laying on her bunk in Team Ruby's dorm room. Like the rest, she seems confused and lost. She closes the book and rests it on the bookshelf between the beds, standing and walking past the camera with a hurried step. From the direction of Weiss's bunk, tiny hands reach out and take the book off the table. We transition over to where a tiny Weiss is sitting alone in her cavernous bedroom at the Schnee Manor. The book has changed once more, gaining the name Nothing Beside Remains. She cracks it open, and her words begin to bleed into Jin's voice. In the beginning, there was peace, a balance between gods and man. However, this would not last as the gods, affronted by man, cast shadow down upon humanity. The shadows fed upon the flesh and souls of the people, and drove fear across the land. From this, four wise magi rose from the ranks of humanity to revolt against the shadows and lead them in this time of crisis. With vim and vigor, the magi fought, using mighty armies and protective wards to keep the shadows at bay, and for a time, there was hope. But the people grew scarce, and the armies grew thin, and the magic did not last, for a candle, no matter how bright it burns, will go out. Then one day came an immortal. To the Magi she wept. It is fault of mine that the shadows claim these lands and have brought ruin to your homes. It is because I cannot die that I wish only to serve humanity and repent my wrongs. I am your torch to bear. May you use my light to cast away the shadows. The Magi, feeling pity, said to the immortal, you bear no fault for the plight the gods have given us. May you be a beacon in the storm. May all our peoples find sanctuary beneath your glow. And, for a time, the immortal's light protected the people of the Magi, and humanity began to grow. Memory of the gods began to fade, and the immortal was hailed for her sacrifice and kindness. The peoples visited her tower, and showered upon her love and praise and gifts. The immortal adored the people she served, but her heart was empty, as no matter her effort, the shadows came for all who surrounded her. The people bathed her in light, and upon her they offered her praise and worship, and created for themselves a false god. 
Affronted for the second time, the gods appeared before the people and said, Who is this that you might call God? She who hath brought upon the shadows that curse your world. The people shouted back, You are the ones who have forsaken us. These shadows are of your doing. She has offered us nothing but light and hope. The gods, angered, rose hand to strike down the immortal, but the four magi gave their lives that she might be safe. The gods laughed as the magi died. You mortals speak of truths you cannot comprehend. You have been led astray by this accursed immortal, and for your folly, nothing will remain. With a snap of their fingers, humanity was turned to dust, and the immortal was left alone. Abandoned by the gods and cursed to isolation, the immortal gave herself to the shadows, bathing in the night as if water to drown. No longer would she be anyone's light. Weiss's voice finishes the story, and as we pull out from the pages, a cherry petal falls over the words. Weiss looks up at the cherry tree from Volume 5, sitting under its shade next to Vernal's tomb. Realizing where she is, Weiss stands, looking around the brightly lit spring sky in a panic. We look down to her hands, where pudgy little fingers grab the book and gently pry them from her palms. As the camera cuts, we find a two-year-old ruby, having just pulled a new book, Timeless Lovers, from the hands of a ghostly figment of her father. Ruby is in her bed while the man sits beside it, appearing despondent, holding one of his hands over his eyes in grief. Ruby snuggles into the covers and looks to him with an innocent, ignorant smile before reading to him. Once more, her voice bleeds into Jin's. There once was a traveler from a long lost land, said to be sent by the gods. They spoke unto him, Across the globe we have scattered four gems, relics of a world once lost. Within each is a semblance of our grace and the fate of the inheritors of man. Roam these antique lands and gather each gem in turn. When the four be brought together, we old gods shall return to cast judgment or salvation upon this world. Take heed, traveler, of the hearts of these inheritors. Should they prove themselves more than mindless shadows, their world shall be freed from sins long past and redeemed. If not, they shall be cast into eternal night, and this world shall truly die." The Traveler awoke in a strange land in a strange body that spoke a strange tongue. Beset by beasts, these lands were lost to chaos and confusion, and yet the Traveler braved on. Proving himself worth his mettle, the Traveler pushed through all hardship and sought the relics at hand. He traveled through battlefield of ash and bone, over lone and level sands, through ruins and decay. Along his journey, he would wear many faces, always a stranger, the traveler never belonged. Doubt grew in his heart as he saw the cruelties of men, the chaining of their kin, the warmongering of their neighbors, and the torture of their brother and sister. Just as he was to lose faith, he found an angel of the old world, alive though scarred and battered, much as humanity was. But below her scars he found her light, and clung to it as his last vestige of hope. And to her he whispered, You are so beautiful, just as you have always been. And the angel wept, for none had seen her as more than a curse upon the land. Together, the traveler and the angel set out to complete his task and restore the world, that the gods might judge them worthy, and along the way they made peace with the new world. As his heart came to love this world, and long for its salvation, so too did his adoration for the angel. However, the doubts were not kept at bay forever. The more and more the Traveler learned of his fallen angel, the more and more he feared, for the angel's sins were deeply cut into every one of her scars, and upon the god's return, the Traveler feared that, much as humanity, she would be taken. Duty and love quartered his heart, and of his gods he began to question. For aeons the Traveler suffered, torn between the two things most precious to him, and to his angel he confided his fears. Noble is your quest, and your love for the people great, the angel spoke. Upon my body are many scars, and yet such scars dwell within the hearts of man. We need not the gods to redeem us. We shall be redeemed should we choose to be. In her words, the traveler found his answer, secreting away the gems. Quest abandoned, he chose to live and rule among the inheritors of man beside his angel. Within the scars of his heart, he found peace. Ruby's voice overwrites Jin's, and we find a red trailer era Ruby sitting by her mother's gravestone in spring, reading the book in her lap while kicking her legs lazily off the side of the cliff. Ruby starts, 
looking around in panic much like Weiss did. She reaches up to her face, finding tears running down her cheeks, and she paws at them in confusion before dropping the book. We follow it as it falls and it disappears behind the branches of a tree, emerging out near the lower branches as a new book entitled The Gods of Kings. The book lands in the open hand of a young crow Branwen, lounging in the branches beside three other ghostly figures. Cracking the book open, Crow begins to read, his voice becoming Jin's after only a moment. In a kingdom lost to time, there were a king and queen who had no land and had no castle. Brick by brick they built for themselves a fortress, that they and their people might flourish and never come to harm. As time wore on, the walls grew outward, grew taller and more powerful, and the king looked out to his neighboring lands, so full of chaos and strife, and said, Would it not be wonderful if they were as peaceful as we? Hesitantly, the queen agreed, and so their lands expanded, and their people were happy. Beyond the paradise they have made, the king spied further lands, fruitless and lean, and asked, Would it not be wonderful if they were as prosperous as we? More readily than before, the queen agreed. However, they were not met with fanfare, but derision, and the lands so sought declared themselves prosperous enough. When the king told the queen, she dismissed the lands and said, They know not what they wish. With us, they shall be more. And so the king agreed, and they made the lands more prosperous, and the people rejoiced. For their lords, the people built a tower, and upon it their lords rested to be revered as gods. Upon this tower, the queen spied lands across the mountains and asked, would it not be wonderful if they were as enlightened as we? The king agreed, but again, the lands across the mountains decried the king and queen with spite and vitriol, declaring that they were not blind to the truths of the world and had no need of their guidance. The king sought his queen, and she said, I am with child. For the sake of their future, we will bring them into the light. And so the king was reassured and enlightened those lands beyond the mountains. The people celebrated the wisdom of their gods and those that did not were returned to the darkness. The kingdom grew, and so too the tower, and from atop the spire that scraped the sky, the queen spied lands beyond the seas and said, Would it not be wonderful if our children inherited these lands, that they might rule? The old king agreed, and so he set sail to those further lands. With him away, and the queen atop her tower, the heirs were left alone, and in the shadows they were struck, for many would disagree. The king, ever older, returned home with new lands but fewer children, and his heart broke upon the castle stone. The queen would weep upon the child's casket, and to the king she said, You are who protects these lands, who would keep our children safe. Where were you when they were slain? Their deaths are on your head. The king, no longer young and courageous, disagreed. I have sought new lands, for peace, prosperity, and the future of man, and have lost just as much as you have. Were we together, our heirs would be here yet. Let us be together still, and be as the gods we once were. You know nothing of loss, and you were never a god, the queen yelled. Enraged, she stomped her foot, and the tower, grotesque in height, shattered. The kingdom below was entombed in stone, and its prosperity vanished overnight. The king looked to his old lands, his children now buried, and said to his queen with his last breath, My love. Look upon our works, ye mighty, and despair." Crow's voice bleeds back in at the end of the story, and as we pull out we find him leaning against the wall of Ospin's office back at Beacon. It takes him only a moment to come to awareness, looking down at the book with growing rage. Shouting, he tosses the book, throwing it through the glass of a window that shatters under the impact. As the book falls, its appearance is reflected in the shards of glass, and as they spin it morphs into one final book simply titled Ozymandias. The glass shards fall towards the camera, and as they come near we realize it's not just the book in the reflection. The book is being held by a young Remus Putnam, reading to a sick, bedridden Aventine Brunswick. He speaks, and Jin's voice comes out. Once upon a time, there was a man named Ozpin. Cursed to live lives that were not his, he was tasked to bring mankind into a brighter day. However, his heart had other plans, for he could not let his lost love go. For lifetimes upon generations he sought her hand, and in times many and times few that touch was returned. Though this would not last, as the woman he loved had become bitter towards him and the remnants of the world they once lived in. With her fury turned on these remnants, Ospin had no choice but to bring arms to his beloved, but despite her great evils, 
he could not bring himself to hate her. With no victory, the war became a dance, a waltz with no end. In his grief, Ozpin saw a wise jinn and asked, How do I stop Salem? And to this, the jinn answered, You cannot. Again, he asked, How do I defeat Salem? And again, the jinn answered, You cannot. Finally, the broken man asked, Can Salem be killed? The jinn leaned close and answered for the third time. Only the gods could kill Salem. Distraught and unwilling to see his love to her grave, Ozpin sought an answer and found only one among the dust of his crumbled world. The war must not end, the conflict prolonged forever, his love eternal. He would keep Salem alive. The story ends following the ghostly image of Magnus Reinhardt as he reaches the edge of the field. We fade in on reality the environment starting to come into focus, as though once obscured by a thick fog, and now that's settling. The characters all look to each other in shock. They find themselves in late evening as the sun is setting and the fire has gone out. Wherever they were, time has progressed. Neo and Yang flinch into Ruby's cloak from the sudden biting cold. Of the group, Blake is the first to ask, Did... We all just see the same thing? And Weiss points out, It's almost night. How long are we in... There? What was that? Crow turns to Roman, who is silent and says, Oz? Roman meets his eyes, concentrates for a second, then shakes his head. He's gone. Crow, angry, steps forward and grabs Roman by the collar, pressing him into a tree. What do you mean, gone? And Roman sputters, I mean gone! I'm making a collect call and he ain't picking up! Blake remarks, He can't be gone. If he had his choice in host, wouldn't he have left by now? Ruby cuts in, interrupting the brewing argument and says, Uh, guys? We don't have time for this. She slowly raises the mangled crescent rose and nods her head to the tree line. All heads look around, and glowing eyes can be seen in the shadows of the trees. The rest of the unimpaired team draw their weapons and begin to circle around the injured, weapons pointed at the trees. Beowulves begin to slink out of the shadows. Ruby checks Crescent Rose's chamber and mutters, Where's Ren when you need him? From seemingly nowhere, a blur launches out of the tree line, slamming into one of the wolves. A mysterious silhouette swings around and decapitates one of the many Grimm, very reminiscent of Ruby in the Red Trailer. As she lands, she rolls with the momentum to throw her mini scythe in a boomerang pattern. It spins around the clearing, killing all of the remaining Beowulves, their heads flying in the air before disintegrating in unison. The scythe comes back around and is caught by the silhouette. The momentum causes the person to stumble, wrenching their arm out of alignment, and we see it's actually a hunchbacked old lady. The crew stare in awe at the woman before she says to them snarkily, Are y'all just gonna keep standing there? She doubles over in pain. I just threw out my back! And the episode ends. Episode 8 opens on a dark train station within the walls of Argus, the crossing signal sounding as the Argus Limited pulls in. It is snowing, and the platform is lit by a few overhead lights in the distant warm glow of other buildings. Otherwise, it's dark. Throngs of people rush off the train, borderline kissing the ground they're walking on after the harrowing ride. John, Nora, Ren, and Cardin are helping escort people off alongside the conductors, though all four of them look visibly exhausted. Especially Cardin, whose arm is in a makeshift sling. With all the people deboarded, Cardin speaks to an Argus security official, who runs off while Cardin returns to John, Nora, and Ren. He explains, I requested a rescue team and a medic to go search for the other half of the train, but we really don't have the people to spare. John asks, Isn't there an Atlesian base here? Couldn't they help? Cardin looks off to the side and replies, From what I've heard, they've been withdrawing for a while now. As long as I've been here, they haven't done much. As they're rounding out that conversation, the remaining two members of Cardinal walk up to switch shifts. They pause, looking at the injured Cardin without Russell, their faces paling. Cardin quickly gets them caught up on what happened in the simplest terms possible and explains he's already put in a request for leave to go locate Russell. If they're lucky, his scroll is still transmitting and they can find him within a couple of days of searching. Nora balks at that and asks, Just Russell? What about Team Ruby? To her surprise, John shakes his head. Ruby cut the train to save us. She'd be pissed if we went back into the fray like that. I have faith in Team Ruby. They'll make it here. I'm sure. Ren stoically watches the explanation, but catches sight of John's fist trembling as he speaks. John looks to Cardin and nods. Go save your partner. Cardin gives him an appreciative smile and says, 
If we see Team Ruby, we'll give them a hand. The two teams split ways on amicable terms, and Junior makes their way to the main terminal of the station. There they meet John's older sister, Saffron Kata Ark. She greets them warmly, though comments, I thought there was going to be more of you. It takes her a moment to read the room that something happened on the train. John is honest and says, Grim attacked and our group got split. But I I'm sure they'll be along eventually. Saffron jokes slightly that, if they can keep you safe getting here, I'm sure they'll make it just fine. John gives a slightly pained smile and nods. Saffron continues, saying, Well, I hope you don't mind if I stop for groceries on the way home. I need to pick up some nuggets for Adrian. He's been on a big chicken kick. There's a silence from the three when Ren speaks up for all of them. Not a problem. I think we could all use some normalcy. We cut to a Mistralian house near a stream where we see an empty clothesline, smears of blood, and smudges of something much, much darker. We cut over to the street beyond, where Cinder, now wrapped in the hooded outfit we saw her wear in Canon Volume 6, is barely walking through the back alleys of Mistral, clutching her grim arm, which is dripping black ooze. She nears the mouth of an alley, when a patrol of Menagerie Militiamen walk by, on a patrol to set up wanted posters around the city. Cinder herself is included among the posters, and she shrinks into the alley, pulling her hood down over her head a little tighter. She vanishes into the shadows as one of the Militiamen look her way before moving on. We have a small montage of Cinder trying to cross the city, and constantly coming across different forces who are all looking for her, such as the previously mentioned militia, but also the local Mistralian police and huntsmen. This includes Team Auburn, who come the closest to discovering her while she's ducked under a bridge. When they go to check, however, Cinder has smuggled herself onto a fishing rowboat that was docked below, and cut it loose to flow downstream. As she hides below the lip of the boat, she looks to the sky and we transition to one dyed a deep sangria color. A young cinder sits up in a skiff, wincing from a bruise on her head. At the controls, unaware of her consciousness, is Tyrion, steering them down what appears to be a river. Quiet as she can, cinder escapes from her binds and tries to jump into the water, only to pause upon seeing it. The water is a deep, gooey black a veritable sea of grim ooze that we've come to know over the last few volumes. Tyrion, without looking at Cinder, explains, Oh, that's not water. Wouldn't want to fall in, now would we? Cinder falls back onto the bench and asks, terrified, Where are you taking me? Tyrion bends his neck backwards to look at her, smiling from ear to ear. To meet our goddess. Cinder begins to respond, I don't believe in a... And Tyrion cuts her off. You will. You will. They continue sailing forward as Evernight Castle peeks over the horizon. Evernight fades away only to be replaced by a well-worn Mistrali building that has been host to a number of businesses over the years. Cinder, standing in an alley, approaches it as casually and stealthily as she can. She slips inside, revealing it to be a renovated hostess club with a familiar spoder motif. Cinder walks through the club, taking note of the security guards dotting the floor, and noticing they're all very subtly taking notice of her as well, despite carrying on a festive and relaxed atmosphere. After a moment of searching, she locates a table in the back that she walks up to brazenly. She throws a pouch of Lien on the table, just as two bouncers step up to protect the woman sitting at it. Seeing the money, she waves the two back, and for the first time, we get a good look at little Miss Malachite, no longer behind a screen and lazily smoking her cigarette on a holder. Little Miss raises a brow and looks at Cinder skeptically. Quite brazen of you to come in here after that stunt your bully boy pulled. Cinder sits at the chair across from Little Miss and stares her down. I had nothing to do with that decision. He oversold what he could do and snapped under the pressure. Little Miss fans herself. Ah, but you were associates, weren't you? Cinder leans back and crosses her arms with a slight wince. He was a useful idiot. She looks to the bouncers around Little Miss. Something I'm sure you can relate to. The biggest bouncer narrows his eyes and leans down to Little Miss, asking, Ma'am, is she insulting us? Little Miss confirms, Why yes, she is. He glares at Cinder, You want me to kill her, ma'am? Little Miss pats his arm, No, no, don't worry about it. Mama's got this. Little Miss turns her own glare to Cinder, Better relations, better results. Treat your subordinates like friends, and they'll treat you just the same. Cinder snaps, I don't have time for this. Little Miss takes a long drag of her cigarette and puffs the smoke out in Cinder's direction. No, you don't have time. Half the underworld, all the overworld. Surprised at this point anyone could stand you. Suppose that's why you came to me. Cinder shoots back. You have low standards. 
Little Miss Cooley responds, Plenty good in the bargain bin. You'd be surprised what you can find. Little Miss taps out her cigarette and says, Let's cut to it, shall we? You're desperate, and just put your life savings on the table. Cinder shrugs. Someone's. Little Miss offers a bitter smile. Cute. What do you want to know exactly? Cinder responds, I'm looking for a huntress in training and her tagalongs. Name's Ruby Rose. They were involved in the noise up at Haven. I need to know where they are, where they're going, and a way to get there. Little Miss scratches her chin and thumbs through the lien on the table. Ah, a travel package. Not my usual forte, but I like a challenge. She smiles wickedly at Cinder. And you bring plenty of that. I'll try to have you some results within the week. Cinder stands, slamming the table. A week is too long. Little Miss pushes back. A week is what it'll take. Believe me, the sooner I'm done with you, the better for me. It'll be done in a week. She turns to her bodyguard. Wilbur, will you be a gentleman and show our guests the door? Cinder pushes her chair away, clearly livid, but she composes herself. Don't bother. After Adam, I'm not dealing with any more insects. Cinder stomps towards the exit while Wilbur leans down and asks Little Miss, She knows that spiders are arachnids, right? To which Little Miss just pats his arm and says, Yes, honey, she knows. As Cinder walks out the door, the contrasting light from outside blinds the camera. When the light dims, we're outside a grocery store in Argus, with John, Nora, Ren, and Saffron. Saffron heads towards the door and says, I'll just be a minute. There's a nice coffee shop around the corner where the rest of you can wait. Though, the prices are kind of getting up there. They have everywhere. The trio thank her for the recommendation and begin walking down the street. Nora comments that John's sister is nice, and John remarks, You didn't have to grow up with her. She's nice now, but she was a demon to me until she moved out. I still remember her and my other sisters treating me like their personal dress-up doll. He shivers at the memory. Nora retorts, I have no clue why. You really don't cut a good figure in a dress. Have you seen your shoulders? John defensively grabs his shoulders and asks, What's wrong with my shoulders? Ren cuts in, Nora. And she replies, I've never been wrong a day in my life. John and Ren smile at that comment, but a moment later John catches sight of a park and a wall pocked with red flowers. Curious, he says, you two go on ahead to the coffee shop. I'm gonna check out the park. Nora asks if he wants anything to drink and he just offhandedly asks for a latte. He begins crossing the street as she says they'll meet him there later. John explores the park and walks along the wall, discovering it littered with names. Reading name after name after name, some occasionally marked with bright red poppies, he's eventually drawn to a point with the densest number of flowers, of all varieties, accompanied as well by a bouquet at the base of the wall under the spot. He stops and looks at the name. The camera zooms in on the glossy black surface, reflecting John's shocked expression as the letters come into focus reading, Pura Nikos. John's eyes widen and he looks up and down the wall, realizing all at once what this wall may very well represent. His eyes come back to Pira's name, and he reaches out for it, his fingers ghosting over it for a second. From the side, a very familiar voice pops in. I'm glad you finally made it. John whips his head around to see the speaker, and comes face to face with a dead ringer for Pira, though definitely older. She walks up beside him and rests a fresh bouquet at the wall, keeping her eyes locked on Pira's name. John says, You're... And she finishes, Helen Nikos, it's nice to meet you. John? He blinks and says, John Ark, and likewise. John's eyes wander back to the memorial wall and Helen explains, This wall was built to remember all the people from Argus that died at Beacon. My husband and I try to come here every week. White irises were her favorites. John stares at her sadly and says, I never knew. They stand in silence for a short while before Ren and Nora call out to John and walk up to him with their drinks. Nora asks, what are you doing? And the words die in her throat the moment she sees Helen. She manages to recover and drawls out, Sorry, who are... John motions between the three. Nora, Ren, this is... Helen Nikos, Pira's mother. Helen gives a tiny wave and says, Hello there. Nora is noticeably like a deer in headlights, while Ren bows his head to Helen and makes Nora bow her head gently as well. He adds to the motion, saying, It's an honor to meet you. Pira was a dear friend to us. All of us. His eyes briefly swing a glance to Nora. Helen smiles, and they overhear Saffron in the distance calling for John and his friends. Helen picks up on this and passes off her contact info. You three should come over sometime to chat. My husband would be thrilled to meet you. John thanks her, and she says, Not a problem. Don't be strangers. 
before walking back the way she originally came. John looks at the contact info on his scroll, then to the wall. His fingers come up to rest on the bronze edge of his armor, and he frowns. Saffron jogs up to the memorial, carrying two stuffed grocery bags while scanning the park for them. She catches the three at the memorial and visibly sags, slowing as she walks her way up to them. I wanted you guys to get settled before I showed you this, she explains, looking at it with somber eyes. I can't imagine what it's like seeing this when you're exhausted. John touches Pyrrha's name one last time, replying, It's fine. It wouldn't have mattered. Let's go. We follow a maple leaf as it falls beside the bouquet. Cut to black, end of episode. Episode 9 picks up in the clearing by the frozen lake, where the Grimm killed by the old woman are still dissipating and our protagonists are staring at her in shock. The woman is doubled over, pushing at her back and grousing after throwing it out during her attack. She turns to the crew and says, What are y'all sitting around for? Get your gear in order! We only have a few minutes until the rest of the pack shows up! Roman starts up, Now wait just a minute, only for Ruby to cut him off, saying, We don't have a minute. Everyone, grab what you can, we need to head out now! Ruby begins pulling at some of the dropped supply bags, only to realize that no one else is moving. Guys! She says, trying to get their attentions. Blake blinks to awareness, pointing to the relic at Ruby's waist. I'm sorry, but are we not going to talk about what we just saw? Yang's eyes are wide, chittering. Raven. And Weiss mumbles in understanding. Raven was right? Ruby says, We can talk about it later! Roman stomps his foot. Like hell we can! Did you see what that coot has been hiding from us? Ruby snaps. Yes, I saw! I saw, Roman, but she's right that there are probably more Grimm on the way! Roman scowls. Haven't you ever heard of Stranger Danger Red? I've met plenty of huntsmen, plenty of crooked ones. She could have us walking away without our kidneys for all we know. Crow steps in, staring at the old woman. You haven't met this one. Maria Calavera, the Grim Reaper. Ruby raises her head to that, looking at the old woman. Maria turns, her face still serious. Introductions are nice, but we're wasting time. Pick up the pace, we're burning daylight. Ruby's face goes from a flash of awe to serious. She turns to Weiss and gets her attention, saying, Weiss? Hey Weiss, I need you focused, okay? Weiss stares at her blankly before snapping too, gathering one of the bags and dropping to lift Ruby to her feet. Ruby goes about giving orders, having Roman push Bumblebee from behind, Yang and Blake push it from the handlebars so they can steer it, the luggage loaded onto its back, and Neo loaded onto the bike itself where Yang can keep her supported. Crow and Maria will serve as their first line of defense, and Blake serves as the rear guard of the team. The team, now organized, look nervously into the woods and Maria and begin their journey following her. We cut away to a spot in the woods a considerable distance away, where we find a lone hand sticking out of a massive pile of snow. It springs to life, and Adam crawls his way out of the mound. A strain of blood travels down from his forehead, dripping into the snow where it begins to blend in with patches of red leaves. Around Adam, the world has shifted to forever fall, the air flickering with leaves and snowfall. Gritting his teeth, Adam looks up at the mountain and clenches his hands, an act that helps him clear his vision. Picking up Wilton Blush, Adam limps into the wilderness. With a crossfade, we find ourselves in the woods with Team Ruby Kernum, trudging and crunching their way through the snow. Everyone is visibly tired and injured. The sun has dipped even further, and there's barely any of the pink light of the sun guiding their way. As night continues to fall, Maria turns on a flashlight built into her mechanical eyes, and Yang, a bit delirious from exhaustion, snorts with amusement as she says, Hi, Beams. Ruby looks to Yang with visible concern, while Weiss says, She's making jokes. That's a good sign, right? Ruby, silent, keeps her focus on Yang. After a little more quiet, Crow turns to Maria and asks, So, what are you doing out here? I'd heard you retired. Maria barely spares him a glance and replies, Raycon. Weiss, most directly behind Maria, glances around in confusion as the curt answer hangs in the air, asking, Recon for what? Maria replies, just as curt, Mission boards. There's a pause as everyone waits for more elaboration. Maria sighs in exasperation and says, For a huntsman, sweetie. Don't they teach you anything at Sanctum? Blake looks forward to Maria, correcting, We're not from Sanctum. Maria looks back at her and Weiss and says, Huh, could have fooled me, before looking forward again. Weiss's spine goes straight, bristling. Weiss says, Excuse you, we're from Beacon. And Maria rolls her eyes. Oh dear, you really are lost. Ruby pops up to defend her team's dignity, 
but the words never come to her throat and she deflates. Yeah, kinda. There's more silence before Crow says, We've had a bad day. These kids would impress you. They've been in tighter spots than you would think. Maria again glances back only a moment before saying dismissively, But still kids, huh? Crow seems almost physically slapped by the comment, having his words thrown right back at him. Dejected, he pulls out his flask, takes a swig, and continues walking without another word. Blake, from behind, sadly realizes aloud, We would have been third years. Yan grips the handlebars tighter as Blake says it. Ruby laughs exhaustedly and comments idly that, Yeah, we have just finished year two, wouldn't we? Yang joins in with a chuckle of her own, asking, Think we would have fought Juniper in the vital tournament next year? And Wise tacks on proudly, Yeah, we would have kicked their asses. Yang echoes back, Damned straight. The mirth of the conversation is undercut by everyone in the group shivering harder and harder as it progresses. Blake cuts in teasingly, The heiress swears now. Weiss retorts dryly, plane crash, to which Yang gives an exhausted giggle. Roman looks up at them, baffled. Are you kidding me? Have you all lost your minds? Maria cuts in. At least one of you still have your marbles. Focus up, kids. We still have a ways to go. There is quiet, but Ruby snickers as she reignites the conversation. And after that, we would have had Weiss treat us to a beach resort. Weiss blinks for a moment before smiling warmly and saying, Well... I know a few good ones. I could really work on my tan. Yang chuckles, interrupted halfway with a hoarse cough, before she says, Tan? Weiss, you're whiter than the snow. Blake groans. Don't talk about snow. Let's talk about the beach. You probably have fresh seafood and a nice warm place to curl up with a good book. Yang looks sideways at Blake with amusement, and Blake rolls her eyes with a smile. You know what I mean. Roman stops pushing the bike and puts his hands to his head, saying, you're all insufferable. Crow turns back and says, They're just trying to keep their spirits up. Roman's shoulders slump as he stares with dead eyes at Crow. He walks towards the center of the group, waving a hand to Ruby and Weiss. They're not taking anything seriously. We need to be doing more than just walking in a random direction following some battered old crone. The group stop walking and he continues. We have two people freezing to death, and Red here can't walk on her own. Crow shoots back. If we rush, we'll just exhaust ourselves. And Roman is quick to fire back. And if we don't rush, we'll freeze to death. Blake scowls at him. We're making the best time that we can. As she says this, the color slips from Neo's illusory appearance, reverting her to the version of her introduced as Jane Doe back in Fixing Volume 4. Roman, unaware, continues his rant. Best time to wear. No one here has actually questioned where the old crone is leading us. We could have just set up some fires back in one of the train cars and waited for rescue. Ruby breaks in. We would have been overrun in hours. We need somewhere safer, and she's the only person that knows the terrain. If she says we'll get there, we'll get there. Roman finally snaps. I don't know if you remember, but I'm on borrowed time! After the outburst, Roman is breathing heavily, completely frazzled. He elaborates. Red, none of us know how long I have left. If I'm gone, Neo will- Before Roman can finish, Neo succumbs to hypothermia and falls to the snow with a weak thump. There's a moment of pause before everyone reacts, Roman especially rushing to Neo's side and pulling her up into his arms. He bundles her up with the cloak, and with a panicked breath, he looks to Maria, murder in his eyes. Where are we going? We cut away to Adam, stumbling through the forest due to his injuries. Losing his footing, he falls to his knees, and we suddenly find ourselves in the shoes of teenaged Adam. He's doing hard labor moving boxes in front of an apartment building, and is being yelled at by a human man for dropping one of the containers. Adam's mother, an exhausted-looking bovine faunus nearby, tells Adam to listen to the man before Adam has to go off to his actual day job. The man, identified as his landlord, whispers into Adam's mother's ear, and the two go off together into their apartment, while Adam is left working and glaring after them. As he finishes stacking the boxes, one of the faunas helping around the building asks him, Hey, wanna make some quick cash? It'll be no skin off anyone's back, just a couple of humans. Promise. Adam takes a moment to ponder the offer, and we gradually fade into the present, with adult Adam wobbling to his feet. As he slinks deeper into the forest, we hear young Adam ask, Where do I need to go? We cut away to blackness, hearing Maria saying, I was going to scout this place before I saw the train crash. 
We get intermittent cuts of feet rushing through the snow and a cut of Roman rushing far ahead of the group, with Ruby's voice tailing after him. Roman, wait up! We don't know what's in there! The camera focuses on the tree line where Roman and the others can be seen trudging out. It pans down, passing behind a farmstead sign as they approach. When Roman closes in on the sign, he pauses, sparing it a glance before hardening his eyes and boldly walking through the gated overshadows. The rest of the party stumble their way to the sign and look up at it, revealing the boldly carved name, Brunswick Farms. Everyone looks at it with trepidation, save for Maria who is indifferent. Roman, meanwhile, has already tread halfway down the central thoroughfare of the homestead, keeping his head down and refusing to look at the buildings, pulling Neo's slumped form closer and closer to his chest. He reaches the door to the main house and goes to open it, only to find it locked. He tries to bash it in with his shoulder, and when it doesn't give, he sucks in a breath of frustration and kicks it. We cut the black on the sound of the door breaking, ending the episode. We open episode 10 inside of the farmhouse's entryway, staring at the door moments before it's kicked in by Roman. We follow him at a low angle as he very purposefully strides into the living room and lays Neo on the couch. He stands there a moment, looking around the room and rushing to the fireplace to light it, only to find it empty. At this time, the rest of the group chaotically begins to pile in, and Ruby, still leaning on Weiss, quickly appraises the situation. She turns to the group and quickly drops into giving orders. Yang, go back out and stow your bike in the shed near the house. Uncle Crow, find a place to sit on lookout. Weiss, set me down on the stairs and clear the floor. If you find a kitchen, check for any food that might still be good. We'll need it. And Blake, scout around for firewood. Roman perks, looking at Neo before piggybacking on that order. There might be wood in the shed. Ruby nods at the suggestion and tells Blake to go with Yang. Maria up nods towards Yang and says, Kiddo, maybe not, drawing Ruby's attention to the fact that Yang has all but slumped against the wall, barely standing and conscious. Ruby looks at her sister for a moment and her composure breaks, her face conflicted seeing her sister so weak. Maria goes to Yang and supports her, taking her to the couch. While she walks, she turns back to Ruby and says, Keep giving orders, you're doing good. Ruby composes herself and takes a moment before looking to Blake. Take Bumblebee with you to the shed. She turns to address the whole team and begins to snap her fingers while thinking aloud. Light, light, we're going to need light. Everyone keep your eyes out for lanterns, oil, candles, flashlights, whatever might work. From the living room, we hear Maria's voice. There's books here too! And Ruby perks at that. Paper, books, they're good for kindling. Uh, also blankets or anything that could pass for one. Everyone wordlessly splits to their assigned jobs, scurrying around the household to fulfill their tasks. Roman falls on the couch besides Neo, who is now bundled up with the collapsed Yang, and threads his fingers in concern before mumbling to himself bitterly, There's no place like home. We montage between different team members moving about the farm, starting with Blake as she stows Bumblebee in the cluttered shed. She notes a trailer wagon hooked up to a defunct tractor and collects a pile of wood that's been neatly stacked against one wall. With Crow, he pulls up a chair to one of the windows in an adjacent room and stares out, Harbinger at his side. Meanwhile, Weiss has already found the kitchen and begun scrounging around. There's a kettle with water still inside and after a quick, unpleasant sniff test, she determines it to be stagnant. More of note, she finds the dinner table still set for three people, cobwebs linking all the glasses. There's not much else of note beyond a dusty liquor cabinet and a number of shoes in the mudroom offshooting the kitchen. The latter catches Weiss's attention narrowing her brows at them, but she continues searching for supplies. We fade away as time passes and pick up from the inside of the fireplace just as it is lit, and our cast is gathered around it huddling for warmth. Yang and Neo, sans extra layers, are now on the floor, between the fireplace and the coffee table, wearing Ruby's cloak and the tablecloth from the kitchen. Weiss helps put Ruby on the couch and sits next to her, while Maria pulls up a chair for herself. Blake is hanging up clothing on and besides the mantel place to dry, including Yang's arm on the brick base. Crow walks into the room, saying, Fog's rolled in. Visibility's basically nothing. Ruby quietly thanks him, telling him to sit down and warm up. Blake asks if they found anything upstairs, and Ruby replies after a pause, No, we haven't gotten to that yet. I wanted to focus on clearing the ground floor and getting a fire started first. I was waiting for everyone to come back before we go up. Weiss mentions, There's also a door to the cellar in the kitchen, but I didn't want to go down there alone. Ruby smiles, We can check it out together after clearing the second floor only for Crow to volunteer to do so himself. I'll check out the cellar. I'm already standing anyway. He spares a wary glance to Roman, who is still staring intently at Neo's back before walking out of the room. With the group momentarily stabilized, Ruby pushes herself onto her good leg and has Weiss support her so they can check out the upper floor. Maria invites herself and Ruby invites Blake. Blake looks to Yang and Neo, asking if they'll be okay. 
Roman says, They'll be fine. I'll be watching them. Blake takes one last look at Yang before following after Maria towards the stairs. Ruby asks Roman, Are you sure? Yang and Neo should be safe now that they're warm. He just shakes his head. There's nothing for me up there, Red. Ruby and Weiss look at him, confused, but they make their way out of the room. Roman returns his gaze to Neo and rubs his face, clearly exhausted. He looks to Yang and says, Hey, Blondie, you two still holding up over there? There's quiet, but Yang's side of the bundle nods, and Roman leans back, clearly assuaged. As he does, we cut to the same angle where Weiss and Ruby left, where Ruby is back in the doorway, looking at Roman. His head lulls a bit as he leans back and he catches her out of the corner of his eye. Sparing her barely a glance, he says with some level of irritation, I'm not going, Red, before waving her off. Ruby leaves without a word, and Roman sinks into the couch, closing his eyes. Upstairs with Ruby and company, Maria is sidetracked early on by the study at the top of the stairs. She peels off with a curt, I'm checking out the study, leaving the other three to explore alone. Blake forces open a door with some small amount of strain, and a blast of cold air comes out. She discovers that it was once a child's bedroom, its roof now collapsed, the floor dusted with snow and debris. Blake finds a tattered backpack by the door, having been ravaged and torn by animals eating the food inside. She finds some batteries, pockets them, then discards the backpack and closes the door. She rejoins Ruby and Weiss, who have limped over to a door at the back of the house, and Ruby points Blake to what appears to be a closet, saying there's probably blankets or something in there. She and Weiss then casually open a door to what is the master bedroom of the house, discovering the petrified corpses of the Brunswicks. Weiss gasps, and after a second to process what she's seeing, Ruby just says, very dispassionately, Oh. Blake comes up from behind to see why the two stopped, and is equally stunned to see the corpses. To Blake and Weiss's visible surprise, though, Ruby walks forward into the room, bringing Weiss with her and saying, Set me down on the bed. Weiss is visibly uneasy about it, but Ruby insists. As she's set down, Ruby directs Weiss and Blake to search the closet and under the bed, while she herself searches the bedside table. Before she does, Ruby idly looks at the bodies and says, curious, but sad, I wonder who they were. She turns to the nightstand and finds a framed photo on top, showing the entire residency of the farm. Ruby stares at it, brows furrowing, when Weiss asks what Ruby just said. Broken from the trance, Ruby carefully puts the picture frame face down, responding with, never mind, find anything? Blake pops out from the closet and says, there's plenty of fresh blankets, well, not fresh, but you know, Clean. I mean, not clean. Weiss shakes her head and says, We get it, Blake. Weiss looks to Ruby and says, There's a first aid kit under the bed. How about we get you downstairs and patched up? Ruby offers Weiss a small smile, and they hobble out of the room with Blake carrying several armfuls of blankets. We cut to Crow in the kitchen, already two glasses deep into a bottle of whiskey, pilfered from the liquor cabinet. He pours himself another glass, downs it, and then lays his head down on the table, looking at the bottle and playing with the lip of the glass. A moment later, a reflection of Ruby flickers in the glass of the bottle. Crow blinks and pulls closer to look at it, only for Ruby and Weiss to walk into the room behind him. Ruby takes one glance at Crow and furrows her brows, angrily asking, Weren't you going to check out the cellar? Crow sluggishly dips his head in her direction and says with a slurred tongue, I was exploring the liquor cabinet first, no harm, no foul. Ruby rubs her forehead, clearly exasperated with him, but Weiss pulls Ruby towards the cellar door, dryly saying to Crow, if you're going to do that now, do it next to the fire. Just not too close, your breath might ignite. Crow rolls his eyes, grabs the bottle, and walks out of the room, leaving the glass behind. Ruby watches him go, sad and frustrated, and Weiss asks if she's okay. Ruby replies, it, It's fine. We cut to a black screen, which slowly peels away as Ruby and Weiss open the cellar door. Ruby raises her scroll for light, while Weiss guides her down them, slow and steady. As they reach the bottom of the stairs, Ruby sees a light switch and flicks it, earning a raised brow from Weiss. What did you think would happen? And Ruby responds with a shrug. Something could go right today, I don't know. They sweep the room with the flashlights, finding a well-furnished bar, a wall along one side that's clearly been patched over with different brick, and a storage room beyond. Ruby looks at the bar and grouses. Of course there's a bar. Weiss silently puts Ruby down on one of the stools and begins to search, but comments, I'm gonna need the scroll for light. Ruby perks. Oh, I have an idea. She pulls a glass down from the bar and rests it over the light of her scroll, dispersing the light evenly throughout the room. Weiss is impressed. That's a good trick. Where'd you learn it? And Ruby replies, It was actually Crow. Me and Yang were scared one night. It was dumb, and the power went out, but Crow was there to watch us and he lit up the whole room. Weiss sits down next to Ruby and pulls her legs up to the bar stool, wrapping them tightly. Must have been nice. 
I've never had a blackout, but one night, I got lost in the mansion. I can't remember exactly what happened, but somehow I found my way to my mother in the drawing room, and we ended up playing piano the whole night together. Ruby comments, Your mom sounds nice. Wise shakes her head and says, Sometimes, but I try to keep that night in mind when she isn't. Ruby looks to the side contemplatively, seeing the storage room. She turns back to Weiss and asks, Do you think there's any food over there? Weiss shrugs. Worth a shot. Weiss lifts Ruby and they hobble over, finding a series of tightly packed shelf units that Ruby is able to support herself on. She and Weiss search, using the dim light dispersed through the room. Weiss comments, There's plenty of preserves, jams. Ruby pops out from the next aisle over and says, And more importantly, beans! Holding up a can of shrimp-flavored beans. Weiss raises a brow. Why? And Ruby responds, Protein! Weiss looks unamused, and Ruby puts her arms weight down on a shelf. There's a cracking noise, and the shelf breaks, causing her to yip in surprise and fall to the ground. Weiss rolls her eyes and goes to pick Ruby up. We cut to Maria in the study, poring over book after book after book, a montage set to a steadily increasing ticking. Maria becomes more irritable as the ticking gets louder, and she jumps when someone enters the room. She lowers the book and looks up to find Blake, carrying a plate. We've, uh, made... dinner. Maria asks, What do you make? Blake replies, Beans on toast. Maria is surprised. You found bread? Blake shakes her head. No, it's actually just canned beans. Blake sets down the plate and looks over the book, asking, So, anything good in here? Maria waves dismissively at the library. Some garbage fiction, philosophical swell, dime novels. The only thing worth a damn here are a few journals I found written by one Mr. Brunswick. They're not the most exciting read, but they might tell us what happened here. Blake adds morosely, Looks like they died in their sleep. It's weird, but it's not completely unheard of. Maria gives a dismissive harumph before picking up her spoon and taking a bite. She coughs and says, Is... is that shrimp? To which Blake replies, Yeah, isn't it great? We cut ahead a bit and follow Blake on her way down the stairs to the fireplace where everyone is grouping up to sleep. On the way, she passes Crow, walking out of the room to go sit on watch. Meanwhile, Blake looks to the fireplace where Yang is already nestled up with Neo, and besides Neo, not touching but watching, is Roman. Blake frowns at this before Ruby and Weiss beckon her over to share blankets to keep warm. Blake smiles weakly and lays down to join them. Our last shot of the episode lingers on Maria, still in the study, looking at the journals as we pull out of the window. The wind howls, the fog obscuring the limited light coming from the study and the living room. Eventually, the light is obscured in fog, and the screen whites out before cutting to black, ending the episode. Episode 11 begins the next morning, as Ruby wakes up and discovers she's able to see her breath in the air. She struggles to keep her eyes open and pulls herself out from between Weiss and Blake. She stumbles before making it to the couch and realizing the fire is out. Nudging Weiss with her foot, she says groggily, Weiss, you need to relight the fire. Weiss curls into the blankets, and Blake mumbles, It's too cold. Irritated, but resigned, Ruby sighs and stands, using Crescent Rose as a crappy crutch to hobble over to the fireplace. She begins putting in wood and paper to burn, but pats herself down and realizes she doesn't have a lighter. She looks around the room to Roman, who is out cold, then to Mirtonaster, near Weiss, before shaking her head and calling quietly for Crow. She's met by dead quiet, save for the creaking of the house. She calls his name more loudly, and then again, louder and more panicked as she begins to hobble her way out of the room, wincing all the way to the window where Crow has set up his watch. He is motionless, and Ruby rushes to his side. She exhales with relief, discovering he's alive, but that relief turns to frustration when she sees an empty bottle of liquor on the floor and one hanging limply from his hand. Face twisting in anger, Ruby, trembling, grabs the bottle in his hand and throws it into the wall. The shattering sound wakes Crow and startles the rest of the crew, who struggle to get up. Crow, startled, looks to Ruby and says, What? Ruby, what's happening? Ruby points to his chest. What's happening? How should I know? You were supposed to be on watch! Crow rubs at one of his eyes and looks out the window. I was just resting my eyes. Ruby throws her hands to the empty bottle on the ground. That's crap, Uncle Crow! The fire's been out for hours! You were supposed to be the one stoking it! Crow shakes his head. So I screwed up a little. Is anyone hurt? Ruby's face goes red. A little? Yang and Neo have hypothermia! It was on you to make sure they were warm! I was worried! I thought you'd been eaten by a Beowulf or something! Crow laughs curtly. 
As if a Beowulf could get me. Ruby stomps her foot. That's not the point! Yesterday you said you'd check on the cellar, but you investigated the liquor cabinet instead. Before that you were drinking on the walk here. Before that you were hung over in a bar on a train when Adam showed up. Even back at the festival you were so drunk that John had to babysit you. You haven't stopped drinking since we got to Mistral. You don't have bad luck, Crow, you're just a useless saddled drunk. As her rant ends, she's left standing in front of him, breath ragged. Crow is stunned, while the rest of the team have awoken and are peering in from the other room, drowsy but alarmed. Bitterly, Ruby continues. I can't believe I ever looked up to you. Weiss swoops into Ruby's side, taking the place of Crescent Rose as Ruby's main strut of support. Ruby, you shouldn't be standing. Ruby turns to look at Weiss and notices everyone is awake, looking shocked, and a little sobered by her overreaction. Ruby quietly says, Sorry to the crew before looking up the stairs at Maria, who's watching them from next to the study. Ruby scans the crew again. Blake shrugs and says, How about some breakfast? Yang, peeking over the couch, asks, You wanna make it? Blake deflates almost instantly. Not really. Ruby looks between them all and moves towards the kitchen. Come on, Weiss. We can have some of that jam you wanted to eat last night. We cut to outside the house, the front door opening as Crow languidly makes his way outside. Taking a deep breath, it's clear he's been shaken by Ruby's outburst. He pulls out the photo of his team and mumbles, Ah, Summer. What am I doing? We see the photo from his perspective, and when he lowers it, we see a cape-like flicker of red and white disappear behind the farm's windmill. Crow blinks and rubs his eyes. With a growing frown, he goes to investigate the windmill. We cut to Yang sitting by the fireplace, wiping a bit of jam off her face and thumb before reaching down and attaching her arm. She flexes it a few times, staring at it emptily, closing it slower and slower. Blake walks up to her and gets her attention, though it's clear that Yang is somewhat indifferent to Blake's presence. Blake says, Hey, remember what I said about the wagon in the shed? Yang, her voice hazy, replies, Not really, and pauses before, Sorry. Blake shuffles on the spot. Oh, well, I wanted to ask if you were up to working on Bumblebee. I think if we attach the wagon, we won't have to walk our way out of this. If we can get Bumblebee running, that is. Yang is slow to respond, but ultimately says, Sure. She looks to Neo, who is still warming herself next to the fire, then looks up to Roman, who is stoking the fire. Crime boss man. You got Neo duty. Roman matches her gaze and nods quietly, resting the poker down and sitting next to Neo, who curls into his side. Satisfied, Yang stands and limply points towards the door, saying, Well, lead the way. We cut to a slower-paced montage of Maria opening the door to the other houses and exploring within. We get cuts of her searching through books, pocketing a few, and finally stumbling upon multiple different bodies, all roughly in the same condition as the ones in the main house. She touches one of the corpses, getting the texture of the skin, and frowns. Finally, we cut to her finding a body against a wall, surrounded by books and papers, all messily scrawled upon. She collects the book he's holding and walks away, and as she does, the camera lingers on a scrap of paper that flips over in a draft that says, Don't sleep. With Yang and Blake in the shed, Yang has just finished appraising Bumblebee. There's a number of problems all over the place, but all things considered, she could be a whole lot worse. Yang scratches at the back of her head. I could probably get it running if I could just fix the starter. Blake perks at that and says, That... that's like the battery, right? And Yang replies, Yeah, sort of. Blake pulls out the batteries from last night and says, Would these help? Yang stares at the batteries, then to Blake, lingering on her partner. And then she says very flatly, No. Blake shrinks in embarrassment and says, Oh. Sorry. Shoving the batteries into her pocket. She looks to the tractor and asks, How about that? Yang looks at it and nods tentatively. Yeah, there should be something I can use in there. The two work in silence for a bit, and we montage to them testing the bike where it thrums to life. Both look satisfied, but not quite happy. As Yang turns off the bike, Blake pulls up the wagon to the back and notices that Bumblebee doesn't have a tow hitch. Yang reaches under the cowl and pulls out a custom curved hitch that fits into the body of the bike. Blake says, Oh. And Yang gives a weak smile. Yeah, who do you think taught Ruby? Yang pauses before muttering bitterly. And then she got way better than me. Blake responds wryly. Well, you're way better than me. Yang smiles more fully at that. Well, let's get back to the house. Scanning the rest of the room for anything useful they might have missed. 
If we leave soon, we can make it to Argus and... As she looks through the window towards the house, she sees Adam, standing in the snow, menacingly. Yang immediately loses any positivity, paling and locking up, the world descending into a black void with floating embers. She takes one step back and Blake puts a hand on her shoulder, getting her attention. We can hear Blake's muffled cries of Yang's name before she comes back to reality. Yang turns to Blake, breathless, and Blake asks if she's alright. Yang double takes, seeing that Adam is gone from the window, but panic is still gripping her words. Adam's here. Blake is baffled by that and replies, Adam fell straight off the cliff. Even if he survived, that was miles away. He, he couldn't be here. Yang turns and grits her teeth. I saw him on the train. He was right there, Yang says, terrified and a little guilty. If I'm wrong this time, Blake walks up and cups Yang's hands with her own and says, He's not here, Yang. But if he is, you don't need to worry. I'll protect you. Yang snaps out of her panic and yanks her hands away. She growls at Blake. I don't need your protection. Blake is stunned, verbally slapped by the outburst, and fumbles to express a coherent thought. Yeah, that's... I mean... While she's still scrambling, Yang waves her off. Forget it. We gotta warn everyone. Without another word, Yang heads out the door. Blake hesitates, but then follows. We cut to Ruby and Weiss, mid-conversation at the kitchen table as Ruby is saying, I just... feels like he's not taking anything seriously anymore. I... I don't know... As Ruby is talking, Yang comes through the front door, the sound loud enough to startle Weiss and Ruby from their conversation. Yang stomps her way into the kitchen, and both girls look up to her, though Weiss seems a little more sluggish than Ruby. Yang says, I... Uh, Adam. I saw Adam. Ruby and Weiss jolt to a stand, Weiss accidentally knocking a plate to the floor as she finds her footing. Ruby looks between the two and immediately asks, Where is everyone? We cut to Blake and Yang checking the study, only to find Maria gone, and then jump to Ruby and Weiss getting Roman and a barely awake Neo at the fireplace. Ruby shoots a concerned look to the chair where Crow had been sitting, before shaking it off and the crew collects outside around the well. Weiss, who looks slightly more winded carrying Ruby, leans Ruby against the well, which prompts Ruby to shoot her a quick, confused glance before rolling it off. Ruby raises the broken crescent rose and readies it, asking, By the shed? Yang nods and Ruby keeps her gaze affixed in that direction as she follows up asking, Does anyone else know where the others went? Roman whines, pulling Neo close to his chest. Somewhere warmer than here, can someone explain to me why we're outside? Blake turns to him and says, Yang saw Adam. Roman gives her a deadpan stare. And I care why? Neo is still freezing, we're better holding up inside. He turns to Yang. Unless you've got that bike running, Blondie, then we just get the hell out of here. Ruby hesitates, but ultimately says, We're not leaving Crow, or Miss Calavera for that matter. She looks to Yang. Yang, are you sure you saw Adam? The question is frank, but not accusatory. Yang, however, takes it as such. I know what I saw, Ruby. I... I, I know I have problems, but he was there. Ruby puts her hands up defensively as Yang gets more irritable. I, I know, Yang, but for all we know, there's more going on than we think. Maybe Emerald followed us. Weiss, thinking deeply, posits. For all we know, it could be a side effect of using the lamp. Maybe we're still in the illusion. Roman rubs his head and says, man, that thing is more trouble than it's worth. Weiss agrees, tiredly and dryly saying, you're telling me, I spent all this time trying to find you guys again, and now we're heading all the way back. And I'm no better for it. Weiss clutches the shawl around the white lily. Blake, defeated, asks, Why are we even taking that thing to Atlas anyway? It's a literal grim magnet. Ruby asks, But what about Salem? Yang replies angrily, What about Salem? Raven was right. Oz never had a plan. We signed up to save the world, not just delay the inevitable. The thing's worthless to us. Weiss slumps and absently mumbles. We probably wouldn't even be able to get it to Atlas with the blockade. Yang, clearly at her wit's end, continues. We should just drop that thing down the well. If we do that, it'll at least buy us some time to... to... I don't know. Ruby takes the relic into her hand and looks deeply into it. Weiss folds her hand over Ruby's and they meet eyes, Weiss silently communicating a lack of judgement for whatever choice Ruby makes. Ruby looks to the others and gets similar looks. She glances at it one more time before turning to hold it over the well with one hand. 
She hesitates, and she actually begins to pull it back when a massive wooden crack can be heard in the distance, coming from the windmill. Surprised, Ruby twists towards the sound, putting a weight on her ankle. Her knees buckle, wincing in pain, and she drops the relic, which tumbles into the well. Ruby glares in the direction of the sound before staring down the pit beside her. Slowly, awareness seeps back into her eyes and what just occurred. A slow, loud scream of frustration bubbles out of her throat, startling everyone and seemingly waking them from their malaise, if only for a moment. Taking a deep breath after having a good scream, Ruby looks to her team and says, We can't leave without that. Turning to Roman, she says, We'll go down and get the relic. You try to find Crow and Miss Calavera. That sound was probably one of them. Roman rolls his eyes and carries Neo towards the house, muttering sarcastically, Probably. Yang groans. Look, I really don't want to go into that well. Blake agrees. Me neither. Ruby cuts her off almost angrily. We're all going. One by one, the girls carefully enter the well, but we don't linger on them. Instead, we follow Roman as he sets Neo on a step beside the porch, saying, Stay put. I'll be right back. If we get cold, the fire's right around the corner. He stands to leave, and Neo catches his sleeve with her fingers. Roman looks down to her and shakes his head. It'll only be a moment. Get some rest before we leave. Neo drops her hand and watches sadly as Roman walks towards the windmill. We cut to the inside of the well as Weiss and Yang drop down, while Blake lowers herself and Ruby down to the shin-high water of the tunnel. The group look around in confusion, and Blake remarks, It's a whole waterway. Weiss moves a single foot through the water, rushing around her feet. Less of a well, more of a cave. There's a current. Ruby watches the water shift around Weiss's foot with a frown. And it's strong. It's gonna make things difficult. Everyone start looking. Blake, you're in front. Give me a hand. Blake sighs and says, I guess. The quartet slowly make their way down the tunnel, shining their scroll lights into the water, struggling to find the relic. They pass a number of tunnels along the way, and Weiss comments, These probably run out of the entire farm. Blake adds, Should we be walking in this? For all we know, it was something in the water that killed everyone. Yang gives a huff of disbelief. Wouldn't they notice if something was wrong with the water? You know, dig a new well? Blake shakes her head. I... don't know. I don't... I don't really care. Let's just find the stupid thing. The quartet pass one of the offshoots, and a glint of gold catches Ruby's eye. She points it out, and takes Blake with her as she pulls the two of them towards it. The relic is bobbing in the water, having become wedged in some fallen brick, and Ruby sighs with relief, commenting, It's more buoyant than I thought. Blake shakes her head in irritation at the comment, but lifts her gaze to further down the tunnel and blinks. She rustles Ruby's side, whispering, Ruby, as she nods down the path. Ruby turns and shines her light. The light passes over the crude cut stone of the tunnel, until it catches something standing in the shadows. Gnarled, humanoid figures, skin blacker than the shadows around them, with jagged bone bursting from the seams of their body in cold, white masks creating the vaguest notions of a face. Monstrous, humanoid grim, standing listless, staring at her and Blake and the relic. With Roman, we follow him into the windmill, which is dark and stuffy, the inner mechanism eroded and creaking in the wind. As he wanders in, he almost immediately finds Crow in a pile of wooden debris, dazed from having fallen through the floor above. Roman lazily walks up to him and crosses his arms, giving him a dry look. I've heard a stumbling drunk, but did you have to take out the second floor with you? Crow shakes his head, still not quite lucid, mumbling something under his breath. As Roman pulls him to his feet, the crime lord asks, What are you saying? And Crow replies in a fit of panic, Summer! Roman raises his brow and asks, No, it's fall, you idiot! A second later there's a slam, the door to the windmill snapping shut. Roman looks up, the light so dim that he can barely make out the figure standing beside it. Cloaked in white, the figure stands, only a small section of her jaw visible, and Crow just mutters out languidly, Where have you been? She... They needed... Needed you. Roman, slightly more alarmed by stranger danger, side-eyes Crow and says, And I need you to explain what the hell is going on! The figure strides forward, quickly opening her arms, tears dripping down her still overshadowed cheeks. Crow watches her approach, smiling softly and stumbling towards her as she comes in for an embrace. Roman watches with confusion before his eyes go wide. Crow and the figure are only inches apart when Roman slams into Crow's side and shoves him out of the way. 
Drawing Ozpin's cane, he holds the figure at a distance, his eyes scanning her arms and seeing small, tooth-like spikes protruding from the inside track of her hands, wrists, and biceps. Roman stands in front of Crow and mutters bitterly, You and Red need to have a long talk about self-preservation. Roman glances down to Crow for a split second, only to look up and be met with Ruby, staring at him and Crow with big, curious eyes. Roman tilts his head and says, Oh, come on, really? The new Ruby lunges forward to hug Crow, only for Roman to kick her in the gut and send her tumbling to the opposite wall. As she does, her limbs don't move like any humans should, almost boneless with every impact. There's a second's pause, and then it contorts in place, almost instantly snapping to stand like a broken puppet. Crow's eyes widen, and he instinctually draws Harbinger and fires. The shot lands on the copy's shoulder, taking its arm off completely, leaving a thick, black, goopy mess to dribble down in its place. The thing looks down to the stump, unfazed by the missing limb, before looking up at the pair. A moment later, a bony curved blade erupts from the stump, and the creature lunges at them. Roman and Crow roll out of the way as the creature dives past them into the shadows. Crow stares at it before shaking his head, saying, Let's get out of here before it can finish licking its wounds. Roman replies, Gladly, and rushes to the door. Back in the well, we pick up right where we left off. Ruby's eyes widen and she hisses out, we need to leave. Now. The Grim begin to shuffle towards them, slowly, a few tripping in the water only to be crawled over by its brethren. Ruby and Blake retreat to the main shaft with Yang and Weiss. Ruby explaining, They seem slow, let's just get out of here. The group quietly makes their way towards the entrance, only to discover a number of the same Grim now illuminated as they wade into the light below the mouth of the well. The group reorient and stumble down one of the other tunnels, coming face to face with yet another horde. Yang breaks from her malaise, panic rising. What are these things? Weiss steps up and slams up an ice wall between them and two of the hordes, spitting out, I don't know, but I don't want to be dealing with them. They retreat to a different tunnel, and so begin to scramble through the waterways, with every other turn being met with a fresh gaggle of grim. Fleeing gradually begins to take its toll on them, wearing them down before they turn a corner to find Maria, kneeling over a body of a dead huntsman who could be seen in the photo in the bedroom. She looks to the girls and frowns. What are you kids doing down here? Ruby replies quickly. No time to explain, we gotta get out of here! Maria looks behind them, sees the shambling hordes, and motions them down the other side of the cave. Come on, it's the way I came in! The group follow her, and it's smooth sailing for a few seconds, until Blake says, Oh no. Pointing to a different group of Grimm blocking their path forward in the darkness. Maria mutters, Damn! And they divert following a similar routine as earlier, running into Grimm at every other corner. Eventually, they reach a cavern that dips low, so low that they're waist-deep in water, trudging and eventually coming out higher and higher until they're on completely dry land. They arrive at another T intersection, but the fork only offers two paths laden with persistent Grimm. Panic begins to set in, and Blake calls for Weiss to use some dust to give them some time, but Weiss points out that she used the last of it earlier. They've been practically running on empty since the crash. Ruby opens fire on the Horde, but even picking off one or two is difficult thanks to their surprising resilience. Maria is ready for them to get close, raising her sickle cane to pick them off herself, but the other three girls are having trouble standing, their faces heavy with mental exhaustion. One of Ruby's shots jam in Crescent Rose, and she begins a panic search for anything that could save them. Her eyes fall on the barely illuminated wall, squinting in the darkness. She mumbles quickly, Bricks, where have I seen these before? Blinking with an idea, she turns to Yang and shouts, Yang, punch the wall! Yang, barely conscious at this point, looks to Ruby confused. Punch it? The wall? Yang limply punches the wall and Ruby screams, Harder, Yang! Punch it harder! Yang scrunches her face in concentration and rage. There's a flicker of fire, and with a solid punch, she bursts through the wall, revealing the cellar underneath Brunswick's house. Ruby gives a sigh of relief and orders everyone into the cellar. Go on ahead! Get up the stairs! Maria leads the group towards the door, followed by the sluggish Yang and Weiss. Yang gets halfway into the room before her legs give out, slumping against a support pillar before collapsing in a dead heap. Weiss moves to help her, but as soon as she kneels, her strength leaves her and she falls beside Yang, unable to move. Ruby grimaces, limping forward to help them, trying to drag Blake with her as she does. Blake is firing into the crowd with Gamble, only for her gun to go dry with several empty clicks. As Ruby keeps trying to pull, Blake lets go and falls to the ground, making Ruby tumble into the cellar alone. Voice tired and strained, Ruby begs, Blake, get up, please. Blake sighs, muttering, It's 
Fine. Ruby looks to the rest of her team for help, but only finds Maria trying to help Weiss and Yang up. She looks as the Grim clutter around Blake, who has closed her eyes, and in a flash of frames we get glimpses of Ruby's time together with Blake. She screams Blake's name, and the white flashes from her eyes, causing the Grim to recoil. Maria, hearing this and seeing the flash, turns to Ruby in surprise. She drops Weiss and shuffles as best she can over to Ruby's side. Ruby? What color are your eyes? Ruby tiredly whispers. Silver? Maria grips Ruby's head and tells Ruby. You are family, friends? Ruby asks confused. What? She stares at the still approaching Grim, and Maria yanks her head so she's looking towards the ceiling. Don't think about them. Think about the people who you love. Focus on the thought of them, the way they make you feel. Ruby closes her eyes and conjures up those feelings, those moments, and we get small flickers of her time with her team at the festival of the bracelets she bought and gave to her team. She wraps her hand around the bracelets on her wrist and brings them up to her chest. Life is beautiful. It's precious. Focus. Ruby's eyes open and flood the room with light, tears dripping down her cheeks. The grim beyond are burned away in a flash of white, leaving only bones behind. As they dully clatter to the floor, Yang, Weiss, and Blake all begin to stir to wakefulness, free from whatever force was affecting them. Ruby, exhausted, lets her head fall back into Maria's lap. She asks, Who are you? Maria pats Ruby's cheeks and says, We're not out of the woods yet, kiddo. We can talk about it later. Pulling Ruby to her feet, the group rushes to the exit of the cellar. We cut back to Roman and Crow, fleeing from the windmill, the camera following from behind. It swings in front of them, angling up to see the top of the windmill, where the gnarled copy of Ruby has clawed out on top. It leaps from the windmill off screen in the direction of the house, and our two characters are none the wiser. Roman and Crow scramble to the door of the house, Roman instantly noting that Neo isn't there. They burst through the door, Crow shutting it and barricading it with his body. Roman immediately looks to the now dying fire where there is still no Neo, and his breath quickens. Crow peers out the nearest window and says, I don't think it followed us. Roman replies, heading towards the stairs, There could be more. Crow asks where he's going, and he says, I gotta find her, you check downstairs! Crow stares after him, but quickly pushes away from the door and walks towards the kitchen, blade drawn. We follow Roman upstairs as he kicks open the door to the study, calling Neo's name. In quick succession, he stomps down the hall, kicking open door after door. At the master bedroom, he walks in, his voice becoming more and more panicked as he calls for Neo. After checking the ensuite bathroom, he turns to leave, only to find Neo in the doorway, looking at him quizzically. Roman lets out a sigh of relief and says, Neo, you're okay. You're perfectly fine. Neo cocks her head as Roman narrows his eyes and draws Ospin's cane. He steps forward, raising the cane to strike, but Crow's voice carries on from below. Hey, Roman! Roman looks away for only a second, but when he looks back, he's met with the childish eyes of Ave Brunswick. Roman locks in place, his eyes sinking, his arm frozen. The creature stands there, staring at him, but steps forward, raising its arms. Roman's face is conflicted, his arms shaking and his eyes trembling. The creature takes one more step, only to stop with the sound of a blade entering the flesh. The camera pans down to a blade sticking through the creature's chest, pulling back up to reveal Neo skewering it with her umbrella sword. The creature goops almost instantaneously to be facing Neo instead. Neo's eyes widen in shock and panic as she stabs it, again, and again. The creature weakly raises its arms to wrap around Neo, but Neo just keeps stabbing it, over and over again, pushing it to the floorboards and straddling it where it becomes a destabilized, goopy mess before finally disintegrating under the repeated trauma. As the flecks of darkness wash away in a draft, Roman falls to his knees and drops his cane, unable to process what just happened. There is quiet until Neo coughs and slumps against her blade, still impaled in the floorboards. Roman breaks from his stupor and scrambles to support Neo, pulling her into a hug and holding her close. As they're hugging, he glances to Ospin's cane, glaring for only a moment before softening and holding Neo just that much tighter. We jump to Crow at the bottom of the stairs, yelling up, Hey, are you two alright up there? There's an extended pause before Roman yells out, We're fine, we'll be down in a minute. Crow exhales and walks back towards the kitchen, going to open the cellar door and finish his check on the lower floor. Instead, the door slams open into Crow's face. He stumbles back onto his ass, gripping his nose as Maria rushes past him, carrying Ruby over her shoulder. She spares him a glance and says, No time to sit down, young man! We need to move! Here, carry your daughter! Crow blinks in surprise as Ruby is roughly tossed into his hands, barely given time to sputter. What? But she's not... What's happening? 
as the other three members of Team Ruby rush past him. We cut to a quick montage of the team gathering their effects from the house, taking everything outside where Yang is wheeling up Bumblebee in the attached wagon near the well. As they load it up, we find Roman staring at the house in silent, enraged contemplation. We focus down on his hand where a Molotov cocktail is nudged between his fingers. He looks over to find Ruby, balancing on Crescent Rose, pushing the Molotov into his palm. With a bit of trepidation, he takes it, and they share a glance before he pulls out his lighter and hands it to her, silently letting her do the honor. Ruby smiles, lights the wick, and Roman chucks the Molotov at the house. The two stand there watching the house begin to burn, before they turn their backs on it and Roman supports Ruby on their way back to the wagon. We cut to black, ending the episode. A special thanks goes out to all of my wonderful patrons for supporting the channel. If you like this content and want more of it, please consider supporting it. Also consider picking up my new action-adventure novel, The Artificer, which is now available for purchase on Amazon in digital and in print. With that all said, back to your regularly scheduled fixing. Episode 12 opens with a white fang bullhead cresting a blackened hill, coming into view of a massive castle. The bullhead lands, and Emerald, Hazel, and Mercury all exit onto the castle's landing pad. As in the canon show, Tyrion welcomes them and questions where Cinder is. Mercury and Hazel are stoic, but Emerald looks away, and Tyrion picks up on this. He slinks over to her and comments, Well, shall I announce our new maiden to our beloved Queen Salem? Emerald winces, and Tyrion retracts, cartoonish surprise on his face. Oh, am I mistaken? She did pass it on to you, didn't she? His words are dripped in sarcasm, because, you know, he's an asshole. Emerald draws her blades. I will cut off more than just your tail. Tyrion walks through the blade calmly, cutting himself as he goes, saying, You would spill blood on her hollowed ground? Not even Cinder would be so bold. Mercury calls him a freak and tells him to back off while Hazel steps in the pull Tyrion away, saying, Stop antagonizing them. She's waiting. Tyrion perks, skipping in front of the group before saying, Yes, of course, she's eager to see all of you. We'll have time to mourn dear Cinder later. Tyrion begins to laugh as he leads them eagerly up the stairs. We cut back in as Bumblebee drives past the camera, pulling the wagon through the melting snow of the forest. Yang is driving and Crow is perched backwards on the seat behind her, while the rest are sprawled around the wagon. We look at our heroes, all worn and ragged, practically collapsed inside the wagon, save for Maria, who is holding a book. She begins to explain out loud to our crew what happened at the estate. The apathy. They're not strong or ferocious. They drain your will to live. Bartleby's estate was hemorrhaging money towards the end. He wanted to cut costs on huntsman protection, but in order to do that, he needed everyone calm. He managed to track one down and lead it back, sealing it behind a wall in his cellar. The camera pans over to Roman as she says the next part. Apparently, the trick worked, but... Apathy don't tend to travel alone. And where there's one, more will follow. Crow looks up and belatedly asks, Can they... change their appearance? Shapeshift, like into a person. Maria gives him her best side-eye and explains, They can. An apathy that's fed too much can grow into a mimic. Much more dangerous, those. They can eat entire towns if no one catches them. You were lucky to escape. Roman just nods and pulls Neo in tighter, saying, Yeah. Lucky. Maria closes the book and puts it away, reiterating, Incredibly lucky. Man to save you folks and find my target. I was just supposed to find a place and report back, but we ended up taking out a whole chunk of the problem. You guys are in for a bit of a payday. Weiss raises a brow and says, We're getting paid? Maria nods. Partially, yeah. Not a full job. We'll still need a listing for actual huntsmen to clear that place out completely, but you've saved them some effort. Blake rolls her eyes. Great. That'll help us save the world. Yang groans and says back, Blake, we are not going to talk about that now. Blake leans forward. Why not? It's the literal end of the world. Roman glares at Blake and says, 
Ah, uh, shut up, we're all too tired. Blake moves to retort, but Ruby perks up, saying, Look, we're going to talk about it, but he's right, we're all exhausted. We can unpack everything with the rest of Ranger. Blake's ears droop, and her face hardens at Ruby's words. Maria looks at the crew, confused. What are you all talking about? Roman looks at Maria bitterly. Grandma, we literally just said we don't want to talk about it. Crow looks at Roman. Have a little more respect, she's a living legend. Maria waves it off. Nah, no disrespect taken, Sonny. I'm old. It is at this point that the crew ride up on a hill and overlook Argus, sun shining high in the sky. The crew are all smiles seeing it, and Ruby gets a call from John. Ruby's grin grows even brighter. We hard cut to our crew reuniting with John, Nora, and Ren at the entrance to the city. Ruby and John are the first to meet, getting a big old hug between them. Ruby winces from her injuries and tells him to ease up. He does, pulling back, saying, Ease up? You should be glad I'm not yelling at you. Actually, I'm going to yell at you. What were you thinking? John pulls Ruby in and gives her an anime noogie, while Nora in the background yells, You tell her, John! And the rest of the crew have their reunion. Weiss hugging Nora, and Ren hugs Blake and Yang. John stops bullying Ruby and looks her dead in the eye, saying, Seriously, though, what you did up there, that wasn't cool. It was the right call, but it wasn't cool. Ruby looks solemnly at John, sighing, I know, I'm sorry. John smiles, You made it back. I guess that's all that matters. Nora bounces up behind Ruby and pulls her into a hug with an accompanying squeaky sound. Nora puts her down gently and says, We really did miss you. Ruby turns around and returns the hug, saying, I really missed you too. Their hug lasts a little while before Roman walks up behind Nora, saying, Hey, Red! Surprised, Nora spins on her heel and lands a punch square in Roman's gut, causing him to double over in pain. Nora gives a genuine, Oops! Covering her mouth with her hand. Uh, sorry. Force of habit. I'm glad you're okay too? Roman, in a breathless, raspy voice, says, No problem. While Roman is doubled over, Maria walks up to Ruby and holds up her scroll, asking Ruby to do the same. Ruby does, and after tapping the two together, Maria says, There! You and your team can pick up your reward at any huntsman board in the city. My word's good with them. Ruby thanks her and Maria waves it off, walking away from the group, clearly not intending to linger. Ruby gives a look of consternation before asking Maria to stop, and clarifying, You never did tell me who you were. That advice you gave... Maria pauses and looks back to Ruby. Is it that hard to figure out? Maria lifts her cane and points to Ruby's face. I used to have silver eyes. Ruby gives a long, hard blink and quickly becomes giddy. That's exactly what I need! You can teach me- Maria lifts a hand to cut Ruby off. No, 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 don't get so giddy, kiddo. If you want to go down that path, I can't stop you, but I'll tell you, it's tough. Maria pulls back out her scroll, bopping it to Ruby's. Tell you what, there's my address. You and your team can come over and I'll give you some pointers. But only if you're really sure. Ruby frowns at it, but otherwise says, Thank you. Maria waves Ruby goodbye, walking away. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yang rolls Bumblebee up behind the group, asking John if he knows a place where they can sell a tractor wagon. John looks at her confused when Tara and Saffron walk up carrying their son, Adrian. Saffron says warmly, I'm pretty sure the garage we rented for your bike would be willing to take it off your hands. We can drop it off on the way home. John looks at the crew and introduces. Everyone, this is my sister Saffron, her wife Tara, and my nephew, Adrian. Saffron, Tara, Adrian, this is everyone. Cut to the crew, all tired, smelly, and disheveled, making for an interesting first impression. Insult to injury, a piece of bumblebee creaks loudly before it falls off. Tara puts a hand in front of Saffron. Saffron, wait, look at these girls. The camera pans over to Ruby, Neo, Yang, and the still-recovering Roman. What happened to you all? Is that a sprained ankle? Did you break your leg? Ruby, like a deer in headlights, shrinks under the increasingly intense gaze of Terra, saying meekly, I... I think it's just a sprain. I don't really know. Terra continues, more livid. Where's the brace? You didn't make a brace? You just wrapped it in bandages? She turns to John, baffled. John, you told us they were all trained in first aid. John rubs the back of his head and shrugs. I, what, I said they were trained. Tara grips her forehead. Saffron, I can't in good conscience bring these girls back to our home. I need to get them medical attention. Saffron stops her wife, saying, 
Honey, this is one of your days off, and Adrian wouldn't like being stuck in a hospital. I'll take them. This leads to a brief back and forth between the couple before Tara finally complies. Ruby sighs in defeat, not having enough energy to argue. She looks to Yang and Neo, then to Weiss and Blake, asking, Think you guys can handle our stuff? Weiss and Blake nod, exhausted. Ruby offers a smile. Rest up, you guys. You need it. Yang adds, Especially you, Weiss. You need a shower. Weiss goes red as Ruby and Yang laugh, heading towards the streetcar, with John carrying Ruby. Blake is next to Weiss, chuckling softly, and Weiss sharply says, Stop that! Crow walks up to John and Ruby and offers to take her, but Ruby can't quite look Crow in the eye as she says, Uh, no. John's got me. Crow recoils a bit, somewhat lost and looking around for something to latch onto. He looks to Yang's bike and says, Yeah, well, right, well, I guess I'll just take care of Bumblebee then. John gives Ruby a worried look and she just quietly nudges him to keep moving. All said and done, Saffron, John, Ruby, Neo, Yang, and Roman all board one streetcar, while Tara, Ren, Nora, Weiss, Blake, and Crow make their way towards another. We cut to John and Saffron, watching as his friends are admitted to the emergency ward of a hospital, leaving the two of them alone in the lobby. John sits in one of the seats with a sigh, and Saffron remains standing, watching worriedly as Ruby's cape disappears around the corner. Idly, she says, I'm glad your friends made it, but you know, they're in really rough shape. John sighs again and rubs his brow. I wish I had a better grasp of my semblance. We could have skipped coming here. But it'll take a lot more than a train crash to kill my friends. Saffron looks down at him and grows concerned. Will it? Will it really? John is silent, finding a point on the floor far, far away from Saffron incredibly interesting. John, you never finished school. None of you did. John counters. We made it all the way here, didn't we? Saffron shakes her head. And how much farther will you get before something catches up with you? You've been really quiet about why you're trying to get the Atlas, but it can't be so important to keep you going like this. John just looks at her, resolute. It's bigger than you can imagine, Saffron. We can't just abandon it. Besides, we were going to become huntsmen anyway. This is just par for the course. Saffron sits down next to him and rests a hand on his knee, saying, There's more than just one way to be a huntsman. Not everyone needs to go on a grand quest, John. She leans in and her voice becomes soft and even more honest. We need huntsmen here. With Atlas withdrawing and the disaster at Mistral, we're out on our own over here. You could do a lot more and it doesn't have to take you halfway across the world. The camera focuses in on John's conflicted face, pulling in closer and closer before cutting away. We match cut to Emerald's concerned face and we pull out, revealing she's in Salem's throne room her, Mercury, and Hazel kneeling in silence. We pan over to Salem, standing beside a window, looking out at the lands beyond and paying them no mind as her golden accents stand out among the shadows. At the door are Tyrion and Watts, both at ease and watching intently. She asks Hazel, calmly, Explain, exactly, how you failed so spectacularly at Haven. Hazel speaks in return. When the White Fang moved up their timeline, it threw everything off. There was no way we could have accounted for the Menagerie Militia. Salem gives a sigh and asks, Emerald, why did you all fail? Emerald winces and sputters out, I... I don't know, ma'am. Again, Salem sighs. Let me rephrase my question. Who is responsible for your abject failure? The ground below the three begins to bubble with black smoke, something that does not go unnoticed by them. Emerald, panicked, is unable to speak. Hazel, seeing this, resigns himself to his fate and stands, declaring that he takes full responsibility for the failure. In an instant, Salem's hand curls, and several dark tendrils launch out of the shadows and wrap around him, dragging him to his knees. Emerald and Mercury jump away in terror while Watts is unamused and Tyrion is giddy at the events before him. Salem turns and begins to walk towards the group, arms behind her back. The arms begin to pull him forward across the floor as she approaches, meeting her halfway as she says in a low, measured tone, But that wouldn't be fair. We all know who's truly to blame. Hazel tries to resist against the tendrils and sputters out, Ma'am, before one of the tendrils wrap around his mouth, silencing him. Salem steps past him, approaching the now frozen in terror Emerald and Mercury. She pauses and simply says, Emerald, before facing the petrified girl. Pressing closer, Emerald screws her eyes shut until Salem is right above her. Almost immediately, Emerald cracks and chokes out. 
Cinder! We failed because of Cinder! After a beat, Salem rests a comforting arm on Emerald's shoulder, and the tendrils around Hazel release, letting him breathe. That took strength. She coos, caressing Emerald's cheek. It is important you take responsibility for your own failures and not those of others. Pulling away, she side-eyes Hazel as he stands. Though you are not blameless, Hazel. He lowers his head and says, Ma'am. Turning and walking back towards her throne, Salem continues. I will hear and discipline Cinder accordingly when she returns. Watts, once relaxed, now looks up at her in surprise and maybe a little disbelief. She's alive? Watts quickly realizes he's spoken out of turn and covers his mouth with his fist, coughing and apologizing quietly before sliding back against the wall. Salem glares at Watts, but composes herself and says, I've heard enough. You may leave. Then, more warmly, she says, I'm sure all of you are very tired from your trip. Without hesitating, Emerald and Mercury turn and quickly exit the room, followed closely by Watts and Tyrion. Emerald slows on her way out and looks back as Hazel lingers and says, Ma'am, there's one more thing. Wordlessly, she looks to him and waits for him to continue. Ozpin has taken a new host. He was there, helping them. Salem doesn't seem to react to the news, but the camera zooms in on her fingers, curling into her hand. Hazel idly notes the windows around the room cracking under some unseen pressure, and when he looks to Salem, she only says one word. Leave. He heeds her order and turns back to the door, grabbing Emerald as he walks into the hall and the massive doors begin to close on them. We fade on the sound of cracking glass, and Emerald stares in horror as Salem's pristine form begins to emaciate. The doors close, and we cut away. We cut to the Kata Ark household, where Weiss is exiting a bathroom, fully clothed and still drying her hair with a towel. She exhales in bliss. A shower feels wonderful after a crash. Blake, who is playing with Adrian and Tara on the floor, raises a brow, while Tara adds, The fact that you can say that with such certainty is alarming. Blake smirks and continues, And here I thought Ruby was crater face. Weiss rolls her eyes and throws the towel at Blake, smacking her straight in the face. Tara sits straighter at Ruby's name and looks at the clock. Ah, right. Saffron said they'd probably be on their way back by now. I gotta get started on dinner. Can you girls play with Adrian? The two readily agree, and Tara rushes off to the kitchen. Weiss walks over and asks Adrian, in a cutesy voice, what he wants to play. He says, Pilot! And Weiss freezes for a second while Blake looks for his toy. Finding a toy manta, Blake playfully flies it in front of him, pressing the button, only for the sounds it makes to die out quickly. Adrian looks disappointed, about to cry, and Tara pops her head up from around the kitchen. Are you playing with the Manta? It's his favorite, but he keeps burning through those batteries. Try to distract him with something else. Adrian looks even sadder, and Weiss distracts him by picking him up and saying, You know, piloting is a very dangerous career. While Weiss distracts him, Blake's ears twitch, and she hurriedly fishes into her jacket's pocket. Pulling out the batteries from Brunswick, she plops them into the Manta and presses the button. Adrian turns, hearing the sound, and begins to burble happily. Blake hands over the toy, and Weiss sets him down so he can play with it. He begins to nom on one of the wings, prompting the two to coo over him dramatically. The front door opens and Saffron comes through, followed by the rest of their posse. Neo and Yang seem substantially better, and Ruby now has a proper splint on her leg while John helps her through the door, carrying her crutch. Roman follows behind them into the living room and collapses on one of the couches. Blake asks how the hospital trip went, and John replies, Well, Ruby's got a small fracture, but thankfully it's not worse. Neo and Yang need warm fluids, and they all have checkups scheduled in a couple of days. Well, that's being said, Weiss is still playing with Adrian, who crashes the Manta into the couch. Weiss frets over him, saying, No, 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 that's bad, that's bad. John rests Ruby on the couch near Weiss. Neo sits on the floor near Roman, and Yang settles down next to Neo. John and Saffron go off to help Tara in the kitchen, and the crew in the living room just deflate, decompressing. Ruby asks where Ren and Nora are, and Weiss replies, Last I checked, they were up getting the beds ready. Ruby nods and pauses before asking, What about Crow? Weiss shrugs and continues entertaining Adrian as she says, He went out a while ago. Said he'll be back by dinner. Ruby rolls her eyes and says, Of course he will, at that, and sinks deeper into the couch, closing her eyes. There is more quiet, and an unknown amount of time passes as we focus on Ruby resting before Saffron calls out that it's dinner time. 
Ruby opens her eyes and we match cut to her sitting outside on a chair on a deck in roughly the same position, only to lean forward where she set up a crude repair station for Crescent Rose on a porch table. She resumes work on the partially gutted weapon, covering herself in grease as she goes. She goes to reach for a tool but can't seem to find one, only for a hand to come into frame and offer her the missing device. She looks up to find Crow standing there, holding a kit in his other hand. He says awkwardly, I figured a civil servant and a stay-at-home mom wouldn't have the tools you'd need. Ruby takes it begrudgingly and begins to rifle through the kit, finding what she needs and continuing to tinker without sparing Crow a second glance. He pulls up a chair beside her and watches. She sends him a single look, but continues to ignore him in work. The two exist there for a time, in almost uncomfortable silence. You know, when your mom got angry, she'd do the same thing. Your dad could never stand the silent treatment. He'd always go off and do something somewhere else, let her cool off. She never did it to me unless I really messed up. Ruby slows for a moment but doesn't say anything and then resumes her regular speed quite quickly. Crow sighs and says, I've always tried for you, Ruby. You and Yang. I... Me and Tai, we can't... What I'm trying to say is, I'm trying to do right by you. And sometimes I just... Can't. I wish I could, but I was never as good as your mother was. Ruby fully pauses at that, but keeps her head focused on Crescent Rose. Crow waits a beat before standing and saying, Try not to stay up too late, kiddo. You deserve the rest. Crow heads to the door only to bump into John, who was on his way out. The two pass each other wordlessly, and John goes to talk with Ruby. From behind, we see Ruby very subtly rub at her cheeks with her wrist. John walks up beside her and asks, Everything good? Ruby glances at him and nods, sniffling. Yeah, I'm fine. John leans on the table and says, You know it's 1am, right? Not many people doing maintenance at this hour. Ruby, slightly bitter-natured, turns to shoot him a knowing look. Not many people up at this hour, period. John raises his hands in defeat. Touché, touché. Ruby smiles, but it quickly fades. There are things we need to discuss. John nods. Yeah, we got some things to talk about, too. Ruby says, We can do it in the morning. She sighs and looks up at the awning. Man, things will be easier when we get to Atlas. John winces. About that. Our last scene finds us outside of a mountainous airbase situated on an island just off the coast of Argus, nicknamed The Boot. The camera lies just outside The Boot's gate, facing inward where the assembled team is getting locked out. Ruby, in frustration, claws at the sky, and screams. We cut to black, and end the episode. Episode 13 opens on Caroline Cordovan walking through the boot, an Atlesian experimental research base, drinking coffee while giving orders to move supplies and crates to and fro. One of the soldiers fumbles a box, and winces as Cordovan approaches. Cordovan tells him not to fret, and in a voice laced with pride, goes on a patriotic screed about the greatness of Atlas and how well it treats even those who are too inept to do their job properly. We will mold you until you are the perfect soldier, and nurture you until you can stand on your own two feet, for the sake of Atlas if nothing else. But that will be coming out of your paycheck. The man slumps in defeat and walks off with the crate. Cordovan watches him sulk away with a proud smile when she's called on her scroll and takes a sip of her coffee as she answers it on speaker. One of her subordinates, D. Tweedle, says, Ma'am, there is an incident at the front gate. There's a group of people requesting to talk to you. Cordovan shakes her head, drinking more coffee. Who would come to the front gate unannounced? D. replies, One of them claims he's a huntsman, ma'am. Cordovan rolls her eyes. Well, tell him we're not the guild. We're the brave Atlas military. D continues, I did, ma'am, with great honor and pride. Cordovan waits for him to continue, only to add herself. And? D finally says, One of them claims she's a schnee. Cordovan breaks into a coughing fit. Swallowing as fast as she can, she shides him. Why didn't you lead with that? I'll meet them in the first floor conference room. Have them escorted there. D gives an affirmative and signs off. Cordovan strains her back and tightens her collar, smoothing out her uniform to seem more presentable. She walks off, muttering to herself, What is that Schnee vixen doing here? She just left. Did... did she talk with Ironwood? I passed the last audit with flying colors. Cordovan continues rambling to herself as she goes through several corridors, arriving finally at the conference room. 
After a quick pat down, Cordovan folds her hands before herself and walks through the automatic door. With her eyes closed, she begins addressing, Specialist Schnee, to what do I owe the... She opens her eyes and sees Ruby Jr. Kern, assembled in front of her, trailing off as she does. Pleasure. Her face hardens and she yells, D! Dudley! Immediately the two large officers form rank behind her, saying, Ma'am! Cordovan looks at them and points to our heroes. Who are these people? Ruby steps forward, starting, I'm... Cordovan turns and snaps at her. Did I ask you? Looking back to her men, she snaps, Answer me! Both hop on their feet and answer simultaneously. Crow Branwen, Weiss Schnee, and guests, ma'am! Cordovan glares at them. Crow who? Branwen? Crow steps forward now, holding up his scroll to her with proper identification, including that legion seal on his license. Look, Commander, I'm a friend of General Ironwood. Cordovan glares at him, asking, How could a tribal be friends with General Ironwood? She appraises the license and scoffs. Could be a forgery. With Mistral and Vale incommunicado, things have been left to the wayside. There's no way to verify this. Every Mistrali gutter snipe carries forged at Legion documents. Cordovan sits. Weiss puts her hands down on the table and says, Well, you can't fake being a schnee. Cordovan looks at her and says, Oh, no, no, no. I recognize you. The runaway brat. Weiss pulls back and her face begins to heat. She quickly composes herself. Be that as it may, I and my companions are seeking passage to Atlas. I would hope, with my family's good standing with the military, that could be easily arranged. Cordovan looks the crew over and says, We're quite busy here, Miss Schnee. If you hadn't heard, Atlas is withdrawing to the homeland. Normally, passage would be quite a simple task, but unfortunately all our transportation is spoken for at current. In tandem with Atlas's borders being closed to civilians, I must regretfully inform you your request cannot be fulfilled. Ruby steps forward. Um, Admiral? Cordovan gives a look of disgust and shoots back. Commander, Cordovan, I don't believe we've had the pleasure, miss. Ruby is briefly flummoxed, but continues. Rose, leader of Team Ruby, and we have an important message for General Ironwood. Cordovan feigns interest. Oh dear, an important message. I find that quite ridiculous. Picking a piece of lint off her own uniform, she continues. However, if you do have important information, I would be more than happy to pass it along for you in our next communique with Central Command. Crow speaks up. Unfortunately, it's classified. Ironwood's ears only. Cordovan raises her brow. What level? Crow scoffs. Well above yours. Cordovan is taken aback and scans him up and down. I find that hard to believe. Crow crosses his arms and takes a more aggressive stance. Look, lady, if you won't take my credentials, then how am I supposed to prove that what I'm saying is true? She leans back and wrinkles her nose. You could come without smelling like a distillery, sir. Crow squares up, insulted. Maybe you'd like to stand on this table and say that to my face, ma'am. Cordovan, very measured, folds her hands and says, I have quite a busy schedule. D. Dudley. Please show our colorful guests to the door. Cordovan stands and begins to walk to the door. Ruby rushes forward as best she can. Wait, 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 wait! Crow puts a hand on Ruby's shoulder and says, Come on, Ruby, this lady's not worth... Ruby shrugs off the hand and says definitively to Cordovan, We need to get to Atlas. This is... Life or death. Cordovan pauses on her way out of the door and turns to reassess Ruby. You are very adamant about this. Ruby replies, We walked all the way from Vale. We stopped a coup in Mistral just to protect this. Impulsively, Ruby pulls off the relic and places it on the table. Cordovan looks at it quizzically, while the whole group beside Ruby are clearly shocked and uncomfortable. Crow particularly jolts forward and says, Ruby, this isn't. Ruby cuts him off, only looking at him out of the corner of her eye. Your way wasn't working. We only have a few weeks before the borders close permanently. What other way do we have? Cordovan continues looking at the relic before glancing to Ruby and asking, What exactly is this? Ruby replies, That's the part we can't tell you. What we can tell you is that Atlas would want this protected. Ironwood would want this protected. And Professor Ozpin died to keep this secret. Cordovan straightens up, the weight of Ruby's words falling on her. Slowly, she says, I hope you realize I cannot verify anything you've just told me. Looking Ruby in the eye, she says, But... 
I am poised to give you the benefit of the doubt. She takes a pointed look at Crow before continuing. And only you, Miss Rose. Taking a seat at the table and leaning on her elbows, she explains, There was no exaggeration about our transports to Atlas. We need every hand we can to ensure our pullout is smooth and successful. To that end, if you desire to get to Atlas, I would simply ask you assist in our withdrawal. And as compensation, I will personally guarantee your route to General Ironwood. Ruby perks and smiles, but it fades when Cordovan points to the relic. However, until such time, that object will be kept here under lock and key. The whole crew, again, starts with surprise, and John says, we, we can't do that. Ruby looks conflicted, but Cordovan offers. If this object is as valuable as you let on, then there is no place safer than here. The boot is an experimental research base. We have the tightest security Atlas can provide. Ruby bites her thumb, but says ultimately, and somewhat confidently, Fine, but I want the key. Cordovan leans back, reappraising Ruby. Very prudent of you, Miss Rose. I agree to your terms. Cordovan reaches out, and the two shake after a moment of hesitation for Ruby. Business done, Cordovan stands. Follow Quartermaster Tweedle and Quartermaster Tweedle to the lockup to secure your parcel. They will contact you tomorrow with your assignments. You can sort the tasks amongst yourself depending on capability. Shooting a glance to Blake, and then the rest of the crew with narrowed brows. I do hope your compatriots are up to the task, Miss Rose. We smash cut to the team outside the fortress as the main gate slams closed, with Ruby staring at the keycard in her hands. They all look a little lost as Blake asks, What just happened? And Yang responds, I think Ruby just got us enlisted? Ren corrects, Technically, this would be conscription. Weiss rubs her brow, I literally went to a different continent just to avoid this. Ruby sighs and leans into her crutch. Well, at least we have a plan now. Looking to the crew and focusing on Junior, she says, Let's go back to the house. There's a lot we need to discuss. We cut to the inside of the Kata Ark household, looking at mounted wall clocks and framed pictures, one or two of which fall loose as the walls shake violently. We see John storming out the door, his fist shaking, while Roman is slouching against the wall, nursing a blackened eye. He yells after John, You punched the wrong guy, asshole! Crow chases after John, yelling, Hey, kid, come back! As Roman stands and slinks off to the bathroom, Neo in tow, we pan over the rest of the room. Ruby is watching despondently as John marches out the door. Ren and Nora are sitting on the couch and holding each other's hands for support. But I thought Oz had a plan. There is silence as the people in the room process the words. After a while, Ruby shakes her head, saying, There has to be a way. There has to be. Blake says, there have been humans for thousands of years. Ospin's been around since the beginning. If there was a way to stop her... Yang breaks in. But he wasn't trying to stop her. This whole time he was trying to keep her alive. We know what can kill her. Get the relics together. Blake replies, You want to risk Judgment Day? Ruby counters. We don't know if it'll be Judgment Day. It was kind of vague on the whole thing. Ren counter counters. Ruby, what does it mean for humanity to be more than mindless shadows? The world could die. Bringing those relics together sounds... questionable, at best. Ruby, exasperated, asks, So should we just give up? Nora surprises everyone by saying dejectedly, Maybe? Maybe we should just give up. What can we do? Ruby retorts, Something, anything. We can't just let her destroy the world. Ren asks, very measured, but what if we destroy the world in the process? Do we even have the right to risk that? Yang leans forward and replies, Oz and Salem, we're literally playing God. We haven't had the chance to do anything. If we don't take this risk, we'll be stuck in this goddamn cycle forever. Weiss just mutters to herself, I'm still just reeling over there being actual gods. I'm not the only one, right? She looks to the crew, and Ren is the only one to raise his hand. Ruby growls in frustration and says, we're getting nowhere. Roman walks up to the group, brushing off his shirt. I agree. I think you're all being petulant about this. He winces as he touches his black eye. Ruby looks back to her friends and says, We... we need to focus on what we know. With a look of concentration, Ruby begins to list facts. We know that Salem's immortal, and we know that Ozpin didn't plan to kill her. 
Yang tacks on. He wasn't even trying to stop her. Ruby glares at her sister. Yang, stop. Yang crosses her arms, but stays silent. Weiss picks up, saying, There are four relics, and if they're brought together, the gods will show up and the world will be... redeemed? What does that even mean? Ruby shakes her head and says, I don't want to linger on what ifs. Blake says, That's all Jin gave us to go on. Nora asks, Couldn't we just ask her about something else? Ren asks in return, Will that be worth anything? How do we know we can trust the relic? How true is any of this? All of it could be an illusion. Roman is thoughtful for a moment and then points to Ren. This kid is asking the right questions. How can we trust it? He turns to the group, waving his arms emphatically. From what I can tell, the old man's been stringing people along for centuries. Longer, possibly. He's had all this time to set up all this convoluted bullshit to trick people into doing what he wants. Gods, immortals, maidens, grim magnets, I don't care. I only came along to get the old man to shut up. And newsflash, I haven't heard a damn thing from him since all this got outed. I don't know what reasons you all have to stick around, but I am struggling to find one for myself. I'm done. Roman turns around and walks to the door, sparing Neo a glance. She briefly looks to Yang and shoots her a conflicted look before following after. Yang sighs as Neo leaves the room, and the room goes quiet as the front door closes. There is silence for a time. Ren, ruminating on that last line, looks to Ruby and says, You know, John was talking to me and Nora last night. He mentioned that we could stay here. Get our licenses. Stay in Argus. Ruby looks up at him, floored. But we... we walked across Mistral together. Blake's ears twitch at that. Nora replies, Yeah, but... We can help people here. Ren squeezes her hand and adds, That's all we ever wanted. To help. Yang gives a scoff of disdain at the whole situation, standing and walking out to the back patio. Blake looks to the remaining people before following Yang. Ruby's face is despondent, and she sweats in silence over the whole conversation. Weiss looks at the deteriorating group and Ruby's deteriorating mental state, resting a hand on Ruby's shoulder. Talking generally to the room, she suggests... I think we all need to get some fresh air. She helps Ruby stand and leads her to the door. They leave, and shortly afterward, Ren and Nora go upstairs, leaving the room empty. We linger on the room in silence, and it fades in on a similar camera shot overlooking an equally silent forest floor covered in melting snow. Grim paw prints can be seen in the slush, and we hear the crunchy squelch of footfalls gradually getting louder as Cardin, Sky, and Dove come into view. Cardin leads while Dove closely monitors his scroll. We learn why when Sky asks if Dove has picked anything up. Dove replies, annoyed, Sky, it hasn't even been an hour. If his transponder pops up, I'll tell you. Sky shakes his head, nodding to the setting sun. Sun's going down. If we don't hear something soon, we should think about setting up camp. Cardin stops and shields his eyes from the sunlight, his face conflicted. It's been three days. If we stop now... He reaffirms himself, his face hardening. We don't stop. Not until we find him. The other two look at him solemnly, and Sky says, Come on, these Earth's tracks are still pretty fresh. They're being drawn to something. The group carry on in silence, and we get a crossfade to some time later as they're all beginning to huddle together for warmth. The wind is beginning to pick up along with light flurries. In the distance, a new set of footfalls can be heard, and the three freeze, looking into the growing darkness in front of them. Moments later, a lone wolf bursts out of the brush, rushing past them and into the woods beyond. The three watch in confusion, only to hear a pained wolf howl ahead of them. The trio spread out into a cautious, tactical formation, drawing their weapons. They brace themselves against a smattering of trees and peer around, to see Adam, having just cleaved through another wolf, flicking the blood off his blade into the snow and sheathing it. At his feet are a slaughtered pack of wolves, their blood still steaming into the cold night air. The three boys fly behind their respective trees and try to silently communicate with each other about what to do. All are clearly panicked, and it's only exacerbated when they hear Adam begin to walk. Cardin steals himself and grips his weapon, lifting it to a ready position, but he falls short of rounding the tree to attack Adam. Instead, Cardin lowers his mace and holds still. We see both Adam and Cardin in shot as Adam pauses, unmoving in the rising moonlight, before walking onward stoically, his gait uneven but undeterred. Once he's out of sight, Cardin, Dove, and Sky all visibly relax, letting out deep breaths of relief. 
Immediately, Cardin looks to Dove and orders him to call Argus, only for Skye to interrupt and hold up his own scroll, saying that he's been trying to for the last minute. They're clearly out of range. Cardin scowls and looks to the blood trail in Adam's wake. Dove asks, What are we going to do? Cardin responds, eyes sunken but hardened. We keep going. He turns, and the two only hesitate a second before following in step. The camera lingers on the bloody trail leading into the woods, before cutting to black. We open episode 14 with the camera drifting through a traffic jam in downtown Argus. Inside an immaculately clean minivan, we find Ruby and Nora being driven by a hunched over and stressed out Terra. Terra leans out the window and yells at the surrounding traffic, using a fair few bleeped out explicatives before sliding back into her seat, now perfectly calm. Ruby and Nora have pressed themselves as far away from Terra as possible, staring at her in abject shock at her language. What? He cut me off. Ruby says, Nora? I'm scared. And Nora replies, Me too. Tara rolls her eyes and says, Ah, oh, come on, I've heard that uncle of yours. Man swears more than the sailors at the port. Ruby's shocked posture deflates at the mention of her uncle, and she mutters bitterly, Only when he's not drunk. Nora catches Ruby's tone and says unconfidently, I mean, he's not that bad. Ruby sighs. He... Can we change the topic? Tara, having missed the conversation in lieu of yelling out the window some more, leans back in and chimes pleasantly. Okay, Nora, we're here. The minivan pulls up to the docks where several Atlesian ships are parked. Both Atlesian military and Argus dock workers are flittering about, loading equipment into the ships. The van is met by Dee and Dudley, who are standing at attention as Nora gets out. They both hop on their heels and say in tandem, Hello, Miss Valkyrie. It is good to see you again. Nora groans. Guys, please, I keep telling you, call me Nora. They hop on their heels again and say, Our apologies, Miss Nora. Nora puts a hand to her head in frustration when she turns around to talk to Ruby and Tara, only for Tara to quickly say, Have a good day at school, I mean work, bye! The minivan jolts forward and begins to careen up the road with a soft, Help me! from Ruby echoing over the screeching tires. It rounds the corner and Nora turns back to the duo with unveiled annoyance. Dee and Dudley are unfazed and continue speaking. Miss Nora, today we will be loading surplus equipment for the ocean wall into transports heading to Atlas. The two don't wait for her response and begin walking into the docks. Nora crosses her arms and walks after them, asking, You guys are more uptight than even Weiss. Are all at lesions like this? Dee replies, Actually, we're both born and raised here in Argus. Dudley adds on with a smile, Our mother's maiden name is Helvig. Nora says, And is that supposed to mean something to me? The two men share a look and ask, Miss Nora, you're a Valkyrie, are you not? That's a proud Fiskarin name. Nora shrugs. I mean, I guess. I've never really thought about it. I don't know much about where I come from. The trio arrive at a set of boxes and Nora looks to the biggest one with a sigh. Walking forward, she lifts it and carries it towards the cargo ships, the two men getting their own boxes and following behind. As they place the boxes down, Dudley turns to her and says, well, Miss Nora, Argus is one of the few remaining bastions of Fiskaran culture. D continues, It's one of the reasons we requested a station here after our training in Atlas. Nora nods absently and walks over to another pile of boxes. I was gonna ask about that. If you're from Argus, why are you working for Atlas? Dudley replies, picking up another box. Our father loved his home and wanted us to as well. D backpacks on that, saying, Ungodly cold up there, unfortunately, but it further instilled in us a love for Argus with its warm seas and temperate winters. Dudley concurs, saying, In fact, we nearly got sunburned when we returned. In his excitement, Dudley waves his arms and knocks the box Nora is carrying from her arms. It falls and breaks open, scattering what looks like sensitive electronic equipment everywhere. The three stare at it and Nora mutters, I hope the boys are having a better time. We cut to John sneezing on the wall overlooking the outskirts of the city, groaning. Man, I'm bored. Behind him, Blake walks up and offers him a cup of coffee. She comments idly. You want to do something with a little more action? Go down to Menagerie. There's a reason I hated being put on the wall down there. John takes the coffee and she adds. Though I'll give you, the shifts have been longer here. John nods and sips his coffee, almost spitting it out. Uh, this is almost pure sugar. Has Ruby gotten to you too? Blake looks at him apologetically, leaning on the battlements. Sorry, old habit from Beacon. John hesitantly tries to swallow the coffee and winces the whole way through. Blake continues talking. I can't believe how long it's been. Feels like so much has changed. 
John shrugs, though his words become softer as he speaks. Well, at least you guys still got Ruby. She was an anchor for us after the fall, and... Yeah. Blake shrugs back. I don't know. Everything just feels off. John looks at her and asks, What do you mean? Blake shakes her head. I mean, like, on the train for instance, we just botched everything we tried to. Then when you guys came in, she seemed like she was in her element. Now the four of us... It just feels like we keep grating on each other's nerves. John raises a brow. Have you tried talking to Ruby about this? Blake shakes her head no. I wouldn't know where to start. It feels like a mess in my head. John comments wryly. Or maybe that's just the coffee making you anxious. You should sleep on this. Blake gives a dry scoff. What if I could? I've got double shifts all week. John commiserates, saying, Ah, I'm missing my bed too. We cut to Evernight Castle as Mercury is exiting the training room, wiping his sweat off with a towel. Inside the room, Emerald is laying on her back, clearly exhausted and covered in bruises from what we can assume was a tough sparring session with Mercury. Hazel walks into the room past him, getting a grunt of acknowledgement from the younger man. He approaches her and comments dryly, He giving you a tough time? Emerald looks at him before staring at the ceiling and saying breathlessly, He doesn't pull his punches. Or his kicks. Hazel nods and picks her up. He rests her on a bench and pulls out some bandages from his pockets. Emerald notes humorously, You carry those around with you? Hazel smiles as he grips her arm, causing her to flinch. I don't feel pain. I'm not invincible. He begins to patch her up, and there is quiet before she works up the nerve to ask him something. Why did you take responsibility for something that's not your fault? Without missing a beat and staying focused on his work, he challenges back. Why did you sell out Cinder? Emerald sputters. I, I mean, and Hazel calms her. It was rhetorical. There is quiet as he continues to tend to her. Then he elaborates. I indulged Cinder on her plans. I could have pressed her harder to delay. I could have... Yada, yada, yada. He breathes before continuing. You follow orders. I helped make the plan. When you break it down, I'm the only person that can take responsibility. And it's better me than you or the kid. Emerald looks downcast and mutters, Cinder's plan could have worked. And Hazel replies, But it didn't. And both of you did what you were supposed to do. It makes no sense for you to shoulder the blame. Emerald is quiet and Hazel finishes bandaging her, sitting on the bench beside her. Eventually, she asks, Are... Are we doing the right thing? Hazel gives her a knowing side eye. Sounds like something you should have asked yourself earlier. Emerald grips her head and shakes it. When... I was... Cinder, she... Hazel rests a hand on her shoulder. Take it easy. I figured as much. You actually remind me a bit of my nephew. Always eager to please, never quite thinking ahead. Emerald looks at him indignantly. And what's that supposed to mean? He just smiles. Always getting yourselves into trouble. Tell me I'm lying. Emerald backs down, a bit dejectedly and obviously sad. Hazel continues. But he has a good heart. I think you have that too. It's why you're doubting yourself, doubting all of this. He motions to the black wall of the castle and Emerald follows his hand. Shaking her head, she says, That doesn't answer my question. Hazel takes a deep breath and nods. Because the right thing isn't clear cut. We've done some horrible things, Emerald. Plenty of people would call them the wrong things. But just like you, they're not thinking far enough ahead. Emerald leans forward and asks, And you are? Definitively, and staring into space, he replies, I have. I know where this leads me. Juxtaposing that line, we find ourselves cutting to Crow, lonely drinking on a concrete bench near the memorial to those that died during the fall of Beacon. There is the muffled sound of someone's voice, but Crow ignores it, lost in a drunken haze, even as it steadily becomes louder and louder until eventually a stick comes thwacking down on the back of his head. Crow winces and looks over to find Maria, who says, if you want to drown your sorrows, the ocean's just down the hill. Crow looks to her bitterly, saying, Ha ha, very funny, before looking back at the memorial. Maria matches his gaze and hops on the bench beside him. Jokes aside, drinking here is pretty disrespectful. People are trying to grieve. Crow holds out his flask and says, Don't know if you've noticed, but I'm grieving too. Maria gives an understanding, Ah! Road you lose. Crow pauses his drinking and looks up to the sky. Where do I start? 
My sister, my best friend, my mentor, a niece I didn't even know I had, and apparently the last 20 years of my life. Maria looks at him solemnly. I see. A lot to unpack there. Well, you still got your daughter. Crow blinks and shakes his hand at her. For the last time, she's my niece. Maria flinches. The one you lost? Crow grips his brow. No, I've known Ruby all her life. His voice trails off and he looks to the flask. Not that that means anything. I think I'm starting to lose her too. Well, that'd be a shame. She's gonna need all the help she can get. Don't want her to wind up old and alone like us two codgers. I don't think she wants my help anymore. I don't think I can give it either. Maria tilts her head and points to his flask with her cane. Can't or won't? His fingers tighten around it. It's the only way I can... Maria jams her cane into his foot, making him wince in pain. Don't give me that. You're too old for excuses. Crow shakes his head at her and asks, What do you want from me? She points at him with her stick, forcing him to lean back away from it. I'm trying to help you. There are reasons you don't hear about the Grim Reaper anymore. Crow narrows his eyes and retorts. You got old and retired. She points more insistently. No, I made too many mistakes and gave up. Crow shakes his head in disbelief. You were a one-woman army. What would make you give up? Maria slams her cane into the ground. Same thing that happens to every huntsman. I don't know your teammates, and I bet you can't name any of mine. Crow praises her before offering his flask. Sorry, I didn't know. Sounds like you might need this more than me. Maria looks at it before shaking her head sadly. What I need, what we both need, are our teammates. Crow pulls back his flask and narrows his eyes at Maria. Hard to keep anyone around when I'm a walking bad luck charm. Maria glares back at him. And drinking helps with that. Crow, shaking his head, says, It helps me. But Maria cuts him off by jamming her cane into his foot a second time. Stop doing that! Maria's cane pokes into his chest. I'll stop it when you stop feeling sorry for yourself. I said no excuses. Nothing good was ever found at the bottom of a flask. Lowering her staff and her tone, Maria continues. You'll just keep on burning whatever bridges you have left. Whether you know it or not, that girl is going to need you. Or at the very least, you'll need her. Maria becomes quiet, her eyes distant, and the ticking of a clock begins to echo over the scene. We get quick cuts of a young Maria in her prime, brought to her knees. There's the flicker of a crocodilian smile and the glint of a blade, followed by Maria curled up and crying through bloodily cut eyes. Maria seems to come out of her fog, sighing as any sense of levity leaves her. I'm not your mother. Pick yourself back up. Or don't and end up dead in a ditch somewhere. It's not my problem. It's yours. Maria shuffles off granny style, leaving Crow to stare at her before turning to look at his reflection in his flask. We cut to black, ending the episode. Episode 15 opens on a spinning wheel, and we have ourselves a nice little montage of a bright red moped careening through the streets and around corners. We pan out to see an excited Ruby riding on the moped, screeching up to the front of the Kata Ark House early in the morning, where an unamused Weiss is standing. She shakes her head at Ruby, asking, It's 5 a.m. Why are you so happy? Ruby smiles and says, well, normally they have me lugging around a whole bunch of paper and boxes and stuff, but today I got to move around munitions! I've only ever seen artillery shells on the net! Weiss, deadpan, asks, Why were they having you carry around artillery shells on a scooter? Ruby blinks and puts a finger to her head in confusion before shrugging. I didn't really think to ask. Weiss shakes her head as Yang and Blake walk out the front door. Yang is seemingly fine, but Blake has heavy bags under her eyes. Yang takes one look at Ruby and says, Every time I see you on that thing, it looks more and more ridiculous. Ruby pouts and says back, well, I was either riding with Terra or on Bumblebee, and you never let me ride on Bumblebee. Besides, I think it looks cool. Weiss looks to Yang, confused. Really? You've never given her a ride? Yang scoffs. She runs faster than it! And Ruby snaps. It's not the same, my legs get tired! Blake groans and says, can you please talk more quietly? I was on wall duty yesterday and I had to pull a double shift. Yang shoots Ruby a look, earning a roll of her eyes in return, only to turn to Blake and say, Then you should probably ride with Ruby. She still needs a tune-up, she's a bit loud. Weiss asks, Are you talking about your bike or Ruby? Earning a, Hey! from Ruby, and a, You know what I mean, from Yang. As the crew load up, Blake asks, somewhat irritated, 
Why are we doing this? Ruby shrugs as Blake settles in behind her. Um, team building? And Weiss cuts in from behind Yang. Because it's awkward as hell inside the house, and talking with the old lady that saved our lives is as good excuse as any to get out of there. The four look to each other after that bold assessment, give silent nods of acknowledgement, and pull away from the curb, heading off down the road. We arrive in front of a normal suburban home where Maria is waiting outside. Our four girls pull up and discover that Blake has passed out on Ruby's back. Weiss and Yang dismount while Ruby tries unsuccessfully to nudge Blake awake. She looks to Yang, pleading for help, and Yang gives a, I don't know what to do, hand gesture. To both of their surprise, Weiss walks up and flicks Blake on the forehead. Blake shoots to awareness, blinking away her sleepiness, and Weiss just says, Ruby can't walk with you sleeping on her. Get up. Blake, in a sleepy daze, stumbles off the bike and stretches. Weiss is the first to head towards Maria, and Maria immediately says, There's coffee inside. Weiss quickens her step, and she and Blake are the first to enter the house, followed by Ruby on her crutch and Yang who lingers just behind in case Ruby falls. Inside we find Weiss and Blake sitting on a couch, both completely at peace while sipping down fresh coffee. Ruby and Yang are standing at the kitchen island, where Ruby is stuffing her face with sweetbread. Yang asks, looking at Ruby's leg, Wouldn't you rather sit down? And Ruby responds, mouth full, The bread is like cookies! Maria takes the empty pot of coffee off the maker and grabs Ruby by the cloak, saying, You've stuffed your face enough. Come on, we have a lot to discuss. Ruby complains, But I'm not done yet, before barely managing to swipe another piece of bread. Yang watches in confusion, asking back to the zen out Weiss and Blake, Are... are we supposed to follow? Guys? Ruby is dragged up the stairs and through the main hallway to Maria's study. The rest of the team follow behind slowly, curious, and as they do, we get passing shots of framed pictures in Maria's house of different people, most prominently what appears to be her former team of four. Ruby is pulled into Maria's study where Maria opens the window. There's a puff of dust as she does and she waves it away, saying, Oh, I haven't opened these in a while. She walks over to a comfy chair and sits down, motioning for the girls to sit on the rug in front of her. The four awkwardly sit down in an open circle towards Maria. Ruby asks as she finishes sitting, um, are we going to talk about the silver eyes thing? And Maria responds, Depends on your answer. Depends on all of your answers. Blake asks, What does this have to do with us? I thought it was just Ruby. Maria shakes her head. Well, you see, once I teach her, she won't be able to unlearn it. Can't unring the bell. You all need to be okay with that. Ruby narrows her eyes. Why would I want to unlearn it? And Maria snaps. Are y'all gonna let me talk? The team is visibly taken aback by the snippiness and go quiet. Good, quiet, I like that. Now where was I? Yes. Are you okay with losing who you are? Ruby leans forward, now more confused. What do you mean? And Maria replies, How willing are you to sacrifice yourself? Ruby's response is tepid. My... My life? Maria again shakes her head. No, yourself, your very being. Are you all willing to lose Ruby Rose and welcome whatever is left? Someone different. Someone who doesn't remember the victories you shared or the miseries you experienced. Your highs and lows. Would you stand by her? There's a brief quiet before Weiss asks, Would she still be Ruby? And Maria throws it back at her. Do you think she'd still be Ruby? Weiss looks over to Ruby with consternation, but the camera jumps over to Yang as she says, definitively, Of course she would be. Blake shares Weiss's concerned glance and asks, Would it be worth it? And Maria replies, It's what you make of it. I already know what Miss Rose's answer will be. I need to hear all of yours. Ruby turns to look at her team, and Yang looks to Maria, saying, I'm in. Slowly, Blake also agrees, nodding her head silently. The last holdout is Weiss, whose fingers are clutching at her shawl. She is silent before saying, I want us to hear it. Ruby looks at her and asks, Are you sure? Weiss gives Ruby a somber smile, before saying, I'm not totally sure, but I can't be the best teammate ever if I can't trust you. Ruby gives a soft smile before going serious and turning to Maria. Well then, Maria begins, Memory is the key. I suspect you've only experienced Silver Eyes when in moments of intense emotion, times when you've been threatened or someone you cared about was in grave danger or you felt alone and scared. Ruby, 
What do you feel when you recall a fond memory? Ruby's brow perks. Warm? Loved, maybe? Maria prods deeper. And the bad memories? Ruby's face sinks. Sad? Empty? Abandoned? There's a quick cut of Yang looking at Ruby, knowing but sad. Maria nods, saying, Those emotions are fueled by your memories, and those emotions are the light behind the silver eyes. The stronger the emotion, the more powerful the light. That comes at a cost. Every time you recall one of those memories, to get one of those emotions, a little bit of that memory erodes. Maria holds up a book, obviously damaged and worn. She flips through its pages. It's like a book you've read too many times. The words start to fade, the pages start to fall out, the spine falls apart, and suddenly… Maria holds up the book by one cover, and a whole sheaf of paper slides out. An entire chapter is gone. Ruby watches the sheaf fall, and her eyes widen, as the implication finally lands. Her three teammates look at her with alarm. Ruby sees her eyes reflected in Maria's goggles. She mumbles absently, I'm going to lose all my memories? Maria rocks her head side to side. Not unless you're really reckless. Use it carefully and you'll barely notice the difference, and hopefully your friends will be there to fill in any blanks that crop up. It sounds bad, but everyone begins to forget as they get older. Only difference is, you get the choice of whether or not that happens sooner rather than later. Weiss shakes her head. That sounds horrible. Maria looks to Weiss and shrugs. It is, to some. Yang scratches her chin and says, I don't know, there's a few memories I'd rather not have. Blake, deep in thought, asks, Would you get rid of them, though? Can you really say you're only your good memories? Yang crosses her arms and says, You wouldn't get rid of them? Blake, the whole time I've known you, you've either been trying to run away or fix your mistakes. Wouldn't you rather not have those? Blake's shoulders raise, getting heated. Those mistakes are a part of who I am. You of all people should know that. Didn't you cross a whole continent just to meet your mom? Yang tries to get a word in. That's not... But Blake overpowers her verbally. Isn't that just the same as telling Weiss to ignore her family legacy? Weiss's back straightens when her name is mentioned, confused and concerned as she stares at Blake. Again, Yang tries to interject. Blake! But Blake ignores her. Or telling Ruby to... Yang's voice finally cuts through, laced with venom. Wait, what about Ruby? Blake is taken aback. What about Ruby? Yang, you can't be that blind! Giving bad calls up on the train, getting us stranded in the forest, dropping the relic down the well! Ruby looks between the two, trying to get a word in edgewise as Yang snaps back. Those were hard calls, Blake. Leaders have to make them all the time. Blake leans back, baffled. Who was she leading with all those calls? Because she looked far more at home with Team Ranger. By this point, voices are raising. Yang and Blake have stood, and Ruby and Weiss are trying to stop the argument as it escalates. Ruby barely manages to break through. Where is this coming from? Blake turns to Ruby and says, You don't see it, do you? Our entire trip up to Argus, you've been more of a leader to them than to us. You left Beacon, you abandoned Yang just to go on an adventure with them. Ruby cuts in, defending herself. They needed me! We needed each other! Blake snarls. Yang needed you. I know you feel guilty about Pyrrha, but you can't replace her, Ruby. The room goes silent, and Ruby begins to tremble. Her eyes streaking with tears and her teeth grinding, she quietly bites out. You know, Yang wasn't the only one hurt when you left. Blake freezes, her eyes widening in shame. Ruby turns to Maria and asks, very bitterly, Where's your workbench? Maria, having watched the whole scene silently, puts a hand on Ruby's shoulder and guides her out the door. Right this way. The other three watch them leave, and Weiss stares at the floor, contemplative. She looks at Yang and Blake, and says, I'm going to need more coffee, before walking out of the room. Yang and Blake are left alone, and Yang glares at Blake. Good going. Blake puts a hand to her chest. Me? I'm right, Yang, and you know I'm right. I, I know she's your sister, but you can't keep babying her. She's made mistakes. Didn't Weiss almost die at Haven? Yang retorts, Well, maybe she wouldn't have if you had just been- Yang stops mid-sentence, the venom dying in her throat. Immediately, Yang forces her shoulders to relax, and she quickly walks to the door. I need to leave. Blake watches her go, 
face conflicted before her body sags and her narrowed eyes begin to tear up. We cut to Weiss walking out into Maria's garden with a cup of coffee, sitting and enjoying the view of the bay. As she watches, she pulls out the wooden Nevermore and holds it against her chest, closing her eyes. Out front, Yang sits beside her bike with a set of tools, finicking with the guts. Maria walks out and sits on the steps, commenting, I thought you'd have left by now after all that. Yang rolls her eyes and says, I would have if my bike worked. The people that fixed her didn't know what they were doing. They even messed with my seat. She presses down on it and it wobbles. It's not even adjustable. I don't know how they did that. Maria begins to talk, completely bypassing Yang's comment. Your bike isn't the only thing that needs work. Yang barely spares her a glance. Not now, Granny. I've got too much on my plate. She's exaggeratedly rough with her repairs as she rambles. I've got a fuming mad sister with laser dementia, my friend's group is collapsing, Weiss isn't here when she said she would be, and Blake... Blake... Yang trails off, and Maria is about to get a word in when Yang continues. I don't know what her problem is. She blew up on Ruby for no reason... Well, not for no reason, but she didn't have to do it like that. Ruby didn't deserve that. I... I just can't deal with her. I mean, even before this, she keeps apologizing to me profusely for things we already went over. Like, I get it, but I already accepted her apology. I don't know why she's making it weird. Trying to win me shit at the festival, trying to say she'll protect me, always trying to lift things for me? She just won't stop. Maria perks and just kind of casually says, Sounds like she's a mess. Also sounds like she's trying to make amends. Failing, but trying. Yang turns to Maria, pointing with a wrench. But she... The words die in her mouth. She... Blake... Is... Trying. Yang rests the wrench in her lap, eyes wide. Maria just looks at Yang and says, Yeah, that's what I said. Weiss walks out the front door with two cups of coffee and looks to Yang, saying, Hey Yang, you feeling up to talk? I got you coffee. Black and five sugars, how you like it. Yang looks up to her and says, somewhat confused, Actually, I think I'm alright. Maria's been really helpful. Maria silently raises a brow. Weiss looks between the two and deflates. Oh, that's good, I guess. Yang walks up, takes the mug, and nudges Weiss reassuringly. Thanks for the coffee, though. As the two enter the house, Yang says, Don't worry, Weiss, I'm sure Ruby would love to have someone to talk to. Weiss perks at the thought, and Speed walks up the stairs. But when she turns the bend, Blake is already entering the weapon bench room of the house. Yang, just behind Weiss, sees this and steps forward, but Weiss stops her, silently communicating that this conversation needs to play out. We zoom in on Ruby working on Crescent Rose, silently toiling away at adjustments. Blake shuffles up behind Ruby and asks quietly, Ruby, can we talk? Ruby doesn't respond in any way and continues her work. Blake continues talking anyway. I want to say I'm sorry about what I said. It it wasn't right, and it wasn't fair for what I put you through, everyone through. I didn't plan to yell at you like that. I was frustrated. Things haven't felt the same since Beacon, and I guess I got carried away. You guys have been through so much, and I... Ruby sets down her tools audibly, catching Blake's attention. Blake recoils, expecting a tirade. Very quietly, Ruby says, You were right. Tears fall on the workbench and Crescent Rose. I'm mad. At you? I'm mad at me? Ruby turns and looks Blake in the eye. So much of what you said was right, and I haven't been seeing it. Between Haven and the Relic and Oz, I guess I just lost sight. I took for granted we could all just pick up where we left off. Blake adds softly, but things are different now. We're not at Beacon. Ruby nods and begins to smile, soft but genuine. I miss the days where all I had to worry about was failing an assignment. Blake adds on, smiling too. I think the bigger problem for you was falling asleep in class. Ruby chuckles out. Says the girl that passed out on her way here. Blake shrugs. You got me there. They're both quiet before Ruby grabs Blake by the hands and says, I promise. From now on, things will be different. I'll make it up to you and the team, and I'll do my best to get us back there. To where we were at Beacon. Blake shakes her head. Ruby, there's no way we can go back to that. 
Ruby winces and begins to pull her hands back, only for Blake to reaffirm the grip and pull them closer. But we can try for something new. Something better than we ever would have been back then. Ruby smiles at Blake, much fuller now, and says, Together. Blake nods. Together. From the hallway, we hear Weiss enthusiastically cheer with her fist in the air. Together! Yang looks shocked at Weiss, but blinks to awareness and sees Blake and Ruby staring at her before hastily saying, T together and throwing her own fist in the air. Inadvertently, she ends up throwing her coffee mug in the air and it shatters against the ground. In the distance, we hear Maria yell, What was that sound? Before we cut to black, ending the episode. Episode 16 fades in on a stark red white fang symbol graffitied on a stone wall next to a detailed white fang mask akin to Adam's, before a wet sponge wipes across it. We pull out to show John, who is staring at the symbol, and says, We're... should we tell Blake about this? Nora comments, I'm pretty sure she doesn't like them. John shrugs, I mean, I know that, but like, you know, this feels wrong? Tell me I'm right, Ren. We look to Ren, who is staring at a grandiose Faunus street art mural, and he looks to the two, I think I agree with John. Nora shrugs, saying, Well, it doesn't bother me, before pulling out a sandblaster and starting it up with a manic grin. John double takes and says, Nora, what did I say about the sandblaster? Nora reluctantly turns it off and groans. Ah, uh, come on, this is so boring. At least Yang got doc work today. This feels like we're doing Cordovan's busy work. John rolls his eyes. It's not that bad, Nora. And she returns, Ruby gets a scooter. John retorts, She had to rent one, her leg's broken. Ren adds, It's just a fracture, actually. John groans, It's still broken. Nora continues, Look, all I'm saying is I feel Team Ruby has it good. John pauses while he's scrubbing, but picks it back up as he talks. Actually, they... don't. I talked to Blake the other day, and things... Well, they're not bad but apparently the trip to that old Huntress's place didn't go very well. Nora goes back to scrubbing, slowly, but comments. I didn't realize. They've seemed fine. I mean, beyond all the stuff with Oz, but we're all dealing with that. Ren adds idly. Roman and Neo still haven't returned. John nods curtly and says, Good. Nora looks up to John, concerned, asking, But aren't Ruby going to need him when they go to Atlas? John is silent, conflicted, but goes back to work. They're resourceful, I'm sure they'll figure something out. He raises his sponge but lowers it again, sighing. Let's take a break. We've been at this for a while. John comes down the ladder he's on and the three head towards a low wall where they sit down for a break. As they do, a passing figure stops its route, walking up to them, and we hear, Well, funny running into you three. Our trio looks up to find Helen Nico smiling down at them. John blinks, jumps to his feet, and they exchange warm greetings. She looks at their work in progress and says, Shame about the art. The graffiti ruins it. John looks up silently to the mural, but before he can say anything, Helen takes control of the conversation. Have you guys eaten yet? John says, No, it's all right, ma'am, when Ren's stomach growls, and he looks thoroughly embarrassed in front of her. Helen smiles and says, Sounds like someone begs to differ. She motions down the street and says, we're just around the corner. Come on, please, let me treat you. It's the least we could do. John looks between the wall, Helen, Ren, and finally Nora before saying to Helen, You know what? That sounds nice. We cut to the Nico's household with the sound of a closing door, and Helen calling out, Honey, we have guests! In response, we hear, Guest? And poking out around a corner is, A surprisingly average-looking dude. Nothing special or stand out, maybe he's a bit on the bigger, buffer side of things, but yeah, it turns out Pyrrha's dad is just… a dude. Helen steps out of the way and waves to the three, saying, These are Pyrrha's friends from Beacon. I told you how I ran into them the other day. Well, I did it again today and dragged them home. Troy steps out fully, wearing an apron, and holds out his hand to John first, introducing himself. I'm Troy Nikos, Pyrrha's father. John awkwardly takes his hand and says, I'm John… and Troy cuts him off boisterously declaring with a teasing edge. John Ark, short, sweet, rolls off the tongue. Ladies love it. John gets only a moment to blink before Troy has moved on to pull Nora and Ren deeper into the house. And you must be Nora, and you must be Lai. They're pulled towards a hallway, Nora unusually silent as Ren corrects. 
I actually go by Ren. Troy apologizes jovially. Oh, sorry, my mistake. You can only tell so much through letters and phone calls. Troy looks to Helen and hands his apron to his wife. Here, Hel, I got it started for you. Helen pouts playfully and takes the apron, muttering, Yes, Chief, before doing a salute and walking into the kitchen. Troy waves him into the living room. Well, come on, I've been thinking about what to show you if you came over. The four sit down and were treated to a pleasant conversation reminiscing about Pyrrha, about her time at Beacon, and the shenanigans she got into with Juniper and Team Ruby. Most of the dialogue flows from John and Ren, while Nora is notably less chatty. She still says things from time to time, especially when prompted, but it's clear that she lacks the energy she normally has. As the conversation goes on, the questions focus less on Pyrrha and more on John, Ren, and Nora. The married couple slowly become more concerned with the three's safety after learning about them walking across the continent, being in Mistral during the coup attempt, and the attack on the train. The three wave it off as part of the job, and the couple share a concerned look before Helen dispels the awkward air by suggesting they go eat. As they eat, Troy, to lighten the mood, questions the group if they know how Pyrrha discovered her semblance. The three all guess it wrong, suggesting some kind of heroic feat or intense training. Helen dispels that by explaining that one morning, when Pyrrha was 12, she saw a spider, and a second later, she was covered head to toe in silverware. Helen even burnt her hand, catching a searing hot skillet before it hit her daughter. Troy sighs ruefully that, after that, Pyrrha was never a big fan of pancakes. We cut to Roman in a library, flipping through several stacks of books. With an exasperated sigh, he slumps back into the chair, throwing a book onto the table. The book lands, and we can clearly see the author's name is Ozpin. Across from him is Neo, reading comic books, and she looks up with a raised brow as he groans. This is impossible. Half these damn books are written by that old coot, and the rest don't know what the hell they're talking about. He springs forward, looking over all the books, saying... Who knew there was so little written about ancient wizard wraiths from before the beginning of time? Neo puts down her comic and waves a hand towards him. He groans in response. Oh, I'm having a ball here. Can't you tell I'm just having the time of my life? Neo levels a glare at him and he shoots back. I'm not pouting. Her brow raises and he quickly adds. I'm not delusional either. If he can get in, I can get him out. Neo signs to him and he replies. They're useless, Neo. We're not going back just because you're soft on Blondie. Again, Neo glares, and he says, Look, they're an endearing bunch, sickeningly so, but we gotta go back to thinking for ourselves. Cut ties, fresh start. I'm thinking we head back to Mistral, set up shop and all the chaos back there. By the end of the year, we could own that town. Neo replies by throwing her magazine in his face. Roman blinks and says, Okay, little Miss Smartass. What's your suggestion? Neo signs and he drops his head to the table in frustration. You're like a broken record. We don't owe them anything. Neo makes a couple of gestures and there's a long pause before Roman realizes he needs to actually look at Neo to know what she's saying. He raises his head and says, Sorry, wasn't listening. Say that again. Neo huffs and signs again, a long, complex thought, expressing that the best hope they have for getting rid of Ozpin isn't sitting in a public library in Argus. Traveling with the others to find the relics is the best chance they have. Roman is quiet, his mouth floundering to find words before his face falls into his hands. Quietly, he admits, I don't know if I can do that, Neo. I thought it'd be better if he went away, but... Did he? There are times I wonder... He looks up into Neo's eyes. I don't know, I've never not been me. A moment later, a full book hits Roman in the face. He recoils, gripping his forehead, saying, Ah! That one was an almanac! He winces as he looks up to find Neo angry but teary-eyed. Neo signs to him that she will stop at nothing to separate him from Oz. Nothing. Roman unwinds from his recoil and stares at her with parted lips, before smiling. He hangs his head and sighs. Fine, he says flatly. We'll go back. He stands and looks to the books before waving at them and muttering, Eh, they'll pick them up later. He offers a hand to Neo, and as she stands, he asks, How much cash do you have on you? We cut back to the Nico's dining room slash kitchen where the meal has just been finished. The table is littered with empty plates, and Troy is taking the used dishware to be cleaned. John, reading the mood, takes a breath and leans forward, steepling his fingers before saying, I... I want to apologize to you. Both of you. Troy slows, and Helen looks at John with concern. John continues, I tried to keep her safe, and... I couldn't. 
I failed, and I couldn't even bring you back something to remember her by. Ren rests a hand on John's back. We're all sorry. Nora, to the side, is completely silent, her eyes sunken. Helen and Troy look at the three and their somber moods, when Helen leans over and puts a hand over John's, saying, Let us show you something. We cut to a dark room, light spilling in through an opening door before Troy reaches out and flicks on the lights. We're greeted to Pira's room, which is… Spartan, to say the least. More seriously, her room is rather basic, hosting minimal decoration, though there are enough present to tell that yes, Pira was a teenage girl. Most notably, there's a single boy band poster carefully framed and tactfully placed on one of her walls, among other things like plushies on her bed. As the team breaks out through the room, John is pulled in the direction of an umbrella stand on the ground. Inside rests a number of javelins of different makes and sizes, as well as a leather shield tucked between it and a dresser. Helen explains, You didn't need to bring us her belongings. We have all the memories we need. But you did bring us something. You came here, the friends we know she treasured. In the foreground of the shot, blurred by focus, is Nora sulking by the closet, her shoulders beginning to tremble. Troy adds, she always wanted to have friends over, and in some ways it kind of feels like she got what she wanted. As Troy trails off, Nora growls out, Why aren't you angry? All heads turn towards her and she snaps around to face them. You don't know what kind of friends we were. You just met me. I was petty. I hated her. I... Ren interrupts, rushing to Nora's side and saying, You didn't hate her, Nora. And she snaps back, shoving him off. I might as well have, Ren. Everything I said... Nora begins to tear up, and she leans against the wall. She hated me, and I don't blame her. Everyone stares at Nora, John and Ren moving in to help her. Helen and Troy share a glance and a nod. Troy heads out of the room while Helen approaches Nora and grabs her by the hands. Come over here and sit with me. The two sit on Pira's bed, and Ren falls to Nora's side. John sits beside him as Troy re-enters the room, carrying a bundle of letters. He hands them to Helen and comments. Pira was always kind of traditional about it. Helen pats Nora on the back until she takes the letters and holds them up for the kids to see. Helen takes the first letter and begins to read. Dear Mom and Dad, My first day at Beacon has been pretty uneventful. And we smoothly fade into Pira's voice reading her own letters as we get snippets of her time at Beacon with Team Juniper. Accompanying this narration are photographs printed out by Pira of different events they all experienced. Notable events include being made an official team, pancake social time with Juniper and Ruby, the John dress shenanigans, the team collapsed on the ground after an intense training session, and a tea party with Weiss. The narration begins to wind down before we reach the final letter of the pile, as Pira's voice comes through clearly. Sorry, I haven't written in a bit. I've been busy lately with the tournament and some other things. Nora got mad at me today. I should be focusing on the tournament, but I've never fought with my friend before. I don't know what I should do. Ren says she needs time to herself, but I don't know. I keep feeling like I should go to her, but I wouldn't know what to say. I'm scared. I'll listen to Ren for now and give her time. When she's ready, I hope she'll want to talk to me again. Mom, when you and Auntie Cass got into fights, how did you make things right? Helen's voice begins to fade in. I know it's a shorter let, but Helen stops when she hears sobbing. Nora next to her has started to cry openly, doubling over into her hands and wailing loud and pained sobs. Ren is already rubbing Nora's back, but Helen puts the letters aside and leans in to hug Nora. Nora leans into the hug and wails into Helen's shoulder. We fade out to later that night, back at the Kata Ark residence where John is sitting by himself on the back patio, staring at one of the Polaroids. The picture is of Juniper and Ruby having their pancake social, and John's eyes drift over him, Pira, Ren, and Nora. He smiles softly before his eyes drift over to Team Ruby and his smile fades. He exhales and lowers the photo, revealing his scroll where an application for a registered Huntsman license sits unsigned. John stares at it for a second before hitting cancel, closing his scroll, standing, and walking away, leaving the scroll on the table behind him. We drift up to one of the house's bedroom windows, and inside we find Ren laying down for the night. Behind him, Nora approaches him, unusually timid. 
Ren faces her and asks if something is wrong, and Nora quietly asks, Can we... Would it be alright if we sleep like we used to? When we were kids? Ren's expression softens, and wordless, he moves over to give Nora the space to slip in beside him. She does, and curls into his back. There is silence for several seconds before Nora's quiet crying can be heard. She presses her face into Ren's back, and Ren waits only a moment before turning around and embracing her. And the episode fades to black. Episode 17 fades in on the coffee table in the Kata Ark house, only for the quiet to be disrupted by a large binder slamming down onto it. On the couch across from the table sit Weiss, Blake, and Yang, all staring in disbelief at the binder, with the camera panning up to a smug-looking ruby who is vibrating with energy. Weiss sighs and pinches her brow. Oh dear lord, not this again. Blake froze her brow. Did you bring this all the way from Beacon? Ruby nods, saying, Yep, you never know when you're gonna need a good idea to pass the time. Yang, flipping through the book, comments, Half of these are veil specific she looks more closely to the list and points to one, saying, This place even burned down! Ruby hops on her heels. Oh, we can adapt! It's more flexible than you think! Blake adds, Ruby, half of these are already crossed off. Ruby shrinks into herself and rubs the back of her neck. Yeah, well, I mean, I sorta already did some of them with Ranger, Juniper, Junior, Team Junior. Blake glares at Ruby, and she's quick to correct. Hey, that doesn't mean we can't still do some of these things together. That's what's important, right? Doing these things together and valuing our time together? Blake sighs and crosses her arms before saying, We'll go. She opens one eye and smiles softly. If you cut down on the togethers. Ruby pops on her feet. I make no promises. Yang shrugs and seems to become infected by Ruby's mood. Good enough for me. Where do we start? Well, Ruby draws, pointing to the list. First I thought we'd hit up the beach! We cut to a close-up of Ruby dressed in a surf suit wearing an inner tube facing the ocean. Only for the camera to pan back and reveal a rocky, pebbly beach. A cold wind blows and Ruby turns around, shivering. Alright gang, last one in's a rotten egg! We pan over to the other three, all looking bemused at Ruby, and all of them are still in their normal clothing. Ruby pouts, and through chittering teeth, says, Aw, oh, you guys didn't get changed! Weiss says, Ruby, it's freezing out. Yang squints out into the ocean. I think those are icebergs. Ruby turns to look and says, Not nah, those are seagulls! Uh, no, you're right. Those are icebergs. She turns back to them and hops on her feet. Come on, guys, it can't be that bad. Here, I'll prove it to you. As team leader, I'll go first. We immediately hard cut to a cafe where Ruby is draped in a blanket and shivering while drinking down hot chocolate. Weiss is shaking her head. I can't believe you actually jumped in there. Ruby sneezes and sips her drink. It's spring. It's supposed to get warm. Blake, deadpan, says, It's fall. Ruby's brows furrow. What? But the spring festival? Ruby, we crossed the equator, Blake elaborates. Ruby pauses for a moment before having a realization. Oh. Blake stares at Ruby with some level of amused disbelief. Forgot about that? Ruby shrinks into herself. Forgot about that. Blake snorts and shakes her head with a smile. Ruby perks back up and says, through her sniffling, Well, hey, at least it worked out well with our second stop. How's the tea? Blake comes happily as she drinks it. It's good. Some of the best I've had. You picked well. Ruby blushes and smiles proudly while Yang agrees, downing her own drink. Yeah, I don't normally like this kind of fancy stuff, but it really rocks! Weiss looks at Yang in disgust. Did you even let that cool? Yang shrugs. No? Wei shakes her head when a waitress comes over and places a slip of paper on the table. Thank you for coming. Here's the bill. You all have a nice day. Weiss looks at the bill and says, Hmm, that's actually pretty reasonable. I'll cover this. She reaches for her purse, but pauses and purses her lips in consternation. She sits back up and pushes the bill to Ruby, saying, Actually, I left my wallet at home <coughs> in Atlas. Thanks for treating us, Ruby. Ruby takes the bill and her eyes bug out. Yang sees this and takes it out of her hand. Oh, how bad could this be? Oh. That's a lot of zeros. We cut to outside the cafe where the four are slinking to Bumblebee and Ruby's scooter. Ruby says, Thanks for picking up the rest of the tab, Blake. You didn't have to do that. Blake just replies, somewhat good-naturedly, I did, or else you guys would be washing dishes for the rest of the day. 
Ruby sighs as she gets on her moped. Well, sorry about this, Weiss, but I don't think we'll be going shopping today. Weiss gets on the scooter behind her, saying, Well, I guess we can save that one for later. Where's the last place we're going? Ruby hems and haws. Well, it's a little early, but I think it'll still work. We cut to Team Ruby standing inside a dimly lit room. Ruby jumps in place. I know how much Yang loves to dance. The camera pans out to an almost completely empty nightclub, save for the bartender and one man whose motto is, it's five o'clock somewhere. Ruby continues. And we never got to go to one together, so I thought we'd give it a shot. The three look confounded at Ruby and Yang says, I usually come to these kinds of places at night? Ruby pouts, waving her arms for emphasis. I know that, we were supposed to have a whole shopping trip and get here in the evening, but you know. The three look at her and she runs onto the dance floor, the panels of which light up when she steps on them. Look, we can still have fun here. We don't need a whole bunch of people. Check it out, the floor here even lights up when you stand on it. She looks down at the floor and you can even see the gears turning inside of her head. I bet I can actually spell my name. Weiss steps forward as Ruby begins to use her semblance. Uh, Ruby, no, stop, you just got your brace off. Weiss begins to chase after Ruby, only for Ruby to trip halfway through the R of her name. Weiss stops halfway and stares absently at Ruby, unamused, only for Yang behind her to start laughing. Blake glances over at Yang like she's gone crazy, only to start laughing herself. It's infectious as Weiss begins to laugh too. Ruby is nursing her leg when Yang walks up, still laughing, and offers her a hand up. Come on, Rubes. Let's dance. Ruby looks up and takes the hand. We cut to outside the club in the early evening where a line of people are starting to enter. Yang exits first, saying, I'm wiped. And Ruby adds, Too bad we wore ourselves out, looks like the party's really starting to pop in there. Yang adds back, Nah, they were cramping our style. Blake tacks on. Also, Weiss broke the floor, so it's probably for the best that we left. Weiss huffs and crosses her arms. It's not my fault they didn't build that floor for heels. Yang shoots back, Weiss, it's a dance floor. It's explicitly built for heels. Weiss snaps back. Then why did I get my heels stuck? Blake laughs. Because you can't dance. Weiss goes red and growls, and Ruby says, Nothing good comes from heels. Yang snorts and says, Just because you're no good in them, Ruby. But next time you'll just have to have Weiss teach you. Ruby slows to a stop and says, Next time, is there going to be one? I thought today went awful. Her eyes fall to her toes, and there's a pause before Blake steps up to her and wraps Ruby in a hug, followed shortly by Yang and Weiss. Blake says, Oh, it was awful, but I think it's exactly what we needed. Yang adds, I haven't laughed like that in a long time. Weiss shakes her head and says, Only you can make a day like that fun. We love your terrible plans. Ruby tears up and fully embraces the three, sniffling out, you think my plans are terrible? The four begin to giggle, only to be cut off by the ringing of their scrolls, staggered out almost simultaneously. The four break apart, and there's a generalized alert from the municipal government about a breach in the wall. The four turn to look at the wall in the distance and see smoke rising from a part of it. Ruby's scroll gets a call, and Cordovan's face appears on it. You are needed at the wall. What forces we have are already en route, but we need all hands on deck immediately. Ruby tries to follow up, asking, What are we facing? but Cordovan has already ended the call, leaving them with unanswered questions. They all look to each other and Ruby says, You heard the lady. Let's go. Everyone puts on their game faces and the two pairs ride off on their vehicles. We cut to them getting closer to the smoking part of the wall, the smoke visible over the rooftops. Ruby starts pre-planning with her team. Okay, so local Grimm are Manticores, Beowulves, and Ursa, but none of them should be majors this far north, only minors. What we have to watch out for, I think, should be aged Manticore. They can still be pretty smart, like back at the train. Yang yells forward. Think this is related to the lamp? Ruby shakes her head. We'll find out later. The group turn a corner and pull up to a plaza built next to one of the doors on the wall, discovering the door sliced clean off its hinges. Grim are flooding into the city, and while that's alarming, it's not as overwhelming as, say, the fall of Beacon. This is far more similar to The Breach, though still shy of what we saw back in Fixing Volume 2. That said, what is more alarming are the number of wounded and dead soldiers and huntsmen littering the plaza, having been sliced and diced. The camera pans up to where one huntsman is facing down a figure in the smoke. Team Ruby rush forward up the road to the bend as the huntsman runs towards the figure. Time almost freezes as the man and the smoke are both cut clean in two, 
revealing Adam, beat up, torn up, and enraged. Team Ruby hit the brakes, screeching to a stop, the squeal of their wheels catching Adam's attention. Like before on the train, there's a beat where their eyes meet. Adam's jaw droops with surprise before he rushes towards them. Ruby screams, Floor it! And the four take off down the bend of the road. As the four burn rubber, Adam jets off after them. What follows is an intense chase sequence as Team Ruby have to maneuver through gridlocked and panicked traffic, while the ever agile Adam jumps from car roof to truck roof using his boosted aura to keep pace. Notable moments here include Adam cleaving through cars with broad, swift swings of his blade, and Weiss using her glyphs to repulse a manticore that charged deeper into the city. While they're riding, our four heroes agree that luring Adam to the boot is their best bet to stop him. This is just before the midpoint of the chase where Ruby and Weiss are separated by a truck crossing an intersection, leaving Blake and Yang to evade Adam all on their own. Ruby screams over the chaos, We'll meet you there! Weiss and Ruby try to maneuver through side streets and traffic, and Weiss complains, We're getting nowhere, I can run faster than this! Ruby blinks and breaks in the middle of the street. Weiss is flummoxed, almost losing her balance. Ruby, what are you doing? She replies, I can run faster than this, Weiss! She begins to pull the moped off to the side of the road, and Weiss says, Then why aren't we going now? Ruby snaps, Weiss, we literally can't afford to lose this moped. Ruby locks the moped in place as Weiss tries to complain again, only for Ruby to snap. Weiss, snowdrift! Weiss flounders for only a second before summoning a haste glyph and jumping on Ruby's back. Can your leg take this? And Ruby says anxiously, We'll find out, before bursting forward at breakneck speeds. Back with Blake and Yang, Adam is closing in, but Blake is managing to keep him at bay with Gamble on its ribbon. The blade and the gun intermittently cut through cars, shatter windows, score buildings, and Blake just barely manages to pull it back before it hits a civilian on the streets. Ahead of them is the bottom of the hill, but there's a buildup of traffic preventing them from getting through. Blake comments, We need to get across that bridge before he hurts anyone else. Yang, seeing a parked tow truck, tells Blake to hang on as she guns the throttle. Blake yelps as Bumblebee speeds down the road and they ramp off the tow truck's bed. However, it was at a lower angle and they graze the top of the last car of the gridlock, sending them tumbling sideways. The two are flung from the bike while it skids off to the side. Blake uses her ribbon to catch her and Yang on a traffic light. Still, the two fall in a heap, rolling to a stop near the base of the bridge. The camera goes to the traffic, where Adam springs off a building's wall to stab down at Blake only for a blur of red to slam into him from the side, sending him tumbling to the asphalt with a flaring aura. Ruby and Weiss stumble to a stop, and Ruby collapses in pain, gripping her leg. Weiss kneels down to help her, only for Ruby to wave her off. No! Adam! Focus on Adam! I'll cover you! Pulling out Crescent Rose in its rifle mode, Weiss reorients just in time to dodge out of the way of Adam's blade. A second swipe sends Weiss rolling, and Adam quickly turns his ire to the prone Ruby. Ruby gets one shot off before he brings his blade down on her, and from her sitting position she deflects his blade using the flat side of Crescent Rose, her aura flashing over the three subsequent strikes. Yang bull rushes into Adam's side, knocking him away from Ruby. Adam spins with the momentum, and slashes the ground as he does. In slow motion, Yang and Adam come face to face, and she begins to lock up, her body unresponsive as his blade comes closer and closer, only for Gamble to cut across his face and wrap around his arm to yank him aside. Weiss summons a glyph to pull Ruby and Yang back to where she and Blake are standing, while Adam stumbles away off kilter. The five combatants compose themselves, and Adam stands to his full height, as the black ribbon around his face falls away, revealing a Schnee Dust Company brand over his burned-out left eye. The four stare in horror, Weiss especially, at not just the mark, but also the wild look in Adam's good eye as it zeroes in on them. Adam charges forward as the girls raise their weapons. He fires Wilt into Yang's face, jumps over Weiss's stab, spin kicks Blake in the face, and lands on Ruby's neck with one smooth motion. Weiss uses a gravity glyph to make Ruby weightless, and Blake pulls her away, leaving Adam unbalanced. Yang attempts to throw a punch at him, but with her unsteady state, he dodges and slams Blush into her gut, tossing her aside. Weiss is left alone, raising her rapier, only for Adam to batter it aside with a single swing and rest his blade at Weiss's throat. She freezes, and he looks to Blake, growling. Everyone dies. A moment later, there's a zapping noise. Adam's eyes roll back, and he collapses like a stone, leaving Weiss to exhale with a sigh of relief. As he drops, behind him is Cordovan with a still crackling cattle prod. She sneers at him, and delivers the line we end the episode on. Welcome to Argus, animal. Episode 18 opens, following Cordovan as she walks into her office and throws her scroll onto her desk. 
Looking out her window, she surveys the city and the smoke rising from it. She scowls as an aide announces themselves for a situation report. She allows them in and they give a rundown of the aftermath of the fight last episode. The breach in the wall has been temporarily sealed, though long-term solutions would require more time to implement. Of the 23 huntsmen who reported to the breach, only 11 survived, and of that, only 4 without injury. Reports are still coming in about total civilian casualties, but early observations note that it could have been significantly worse had breach procedures not been properly implemented. Citywide damages, Cordovan cuts off the aid and says, Argus can deal with its own finances. I care about relevant information. What's the status of the base? The aide is surprised, but acquiesces by scrolling through her report. Well, the base was completely untouched. We expended 48 rounds of ammunition from anti-air batteries to kill three rogue manticores. As of this morning, we are officially down to 25% base personnel, with another 5% expected to leave in the next shipment. 45% of the heavy equipment and 85% of the light equipment have been transferred out. We have been seeing a drain in power across the board, though the engineers are attributing that to the ocean walls, which are due for maintenance. But as per your approval, the maintenance equipment was already sent back to Atlas in the last rotation. Cordovan looks to the aide and asks, Anything to be concerned about? The aide shakes their head. The engineers say the numbers are still within specification. Cordovan nods. Then continued maintenance will become an August issue. Forward the report to August City Hall. It'll be on them soon enough. Cordovan pauses before asking, And as for my request? The aide nods to Cordovan's desk. It's already been sent to your scroll, ma'am. Cordovan sits at her desk and dismisses the aide, scrolling through the information on her terminal. She only lasts a few seconds before frowning and getting Dean Dudley on the line, asking, Where are Miss Rose and her team? Dee replies crisply, In the infirmary, ma'am. Cordovan nods, eyes narrowing with thinly veiled anger. I would like to arrange a meeting with Miss Rose and her team. In fact, I simply insist. We cut to the flickering vision of Adam as he's dragged through the boot, barely conscious. He tries to lift his head, which takes some effort, and he starts to curse the two Atlesian soldiers carrying him. As he succeeds in lifting his head, we're suddenly following young Adam with his head freshly bandaged. This is presumably after the incident where he got his scar, and we find him mid-yell towards his mother and his landlord. How could you, Mom? He's made our life nothing but miserable! Why would you ever- Adam is cut off as his mother yells, her voice broken. He's your father! Adam's one good eye widens, and we begin to hear a ringing as the rest of the scene goes silent. We see his mother's mouth move, but hear none of her words. The same goes for the landlord. He says something to Adam's mother, and steps forward with a look of aversion, towering over the shorter Adam. He begins to say something, but Adam blinks and reaches for a knife on the table. He lunges forward, but his landlord dodges out of the way, the knife piercing a weak aura and digging into the man's thigh. In the present, adult Adam struggles against his escort, shoving one into a wall and trying to do the same to the other. We intersplice one of the guards and his landlord punching Adam in the stomach, sending him reeling before he is properly restrained in the present. In the flashback, Adam rolls to a stop and looks between his mother and his landlord before darting out of the room in a panic. In the present, Adam is tossed into a jail cell where he's left in a heap on the floor. Exhausted, out of aura, and mentally broken, he silently curls in on himself as the camera fades to black. We fade in on Team Ruby being led into Cordovan's office by Dee and Dudley, and once they're inside, Cordovan says, Dee, please get the door. He gives a curt, ma'am, and obliges, leaving Cordovan alone with the girls. The girls are banged up, but seemingly happy now that Adam is behind bars. Cordovan looks at them from behind steepled fingers, and Ruby starts off by saying, Thanks for bringing us to the infirmary. Adam did a number on us. Cordovan gives a strong inhale and exhale before standing, looking out the window and folding her hands behind her back. She begins by saying, Miss Rose, you are in possession of a functional scroll, are you not? Ruby looks around confused. Um, yes? Cordovan's back straightens. In good condition? Speakers fully functional? Ruby's brows furrow. Y yes? Cordovan's reflected face hardens. What exactly were my orders? Yang chimes in. That we were needed to go to the wall, right? The minute Yang stops speaking, Cordovan cuts in sharply. I am asking Miss Rose. Ruby begins to shrink in on herself. Uh, head to the wall. Um, ma'am. Cordovan finally turns to look at Team Ruby. Then explain to me why. 
Upon arriving at said wall, you and your team immediately turned tail and fled, leading a known terrorist and a pack of uncontained grim through a populated city center while presumably competing to wreak the most collateral damage the city has seen in decades. Punctuating her words, Cordovan pulls up a series of videos from around the city showing Team Ruby doing basically what she said. Ruby flounders and says, But, but, Cordovan talks over her. But nothing, Miss Rose. You were needed at that wall. Your job was to hold that wall. And at the first sign of danger, you ran. Blake jumps to Ruby's defense. That's completely devoid of context. Cordovan doesn't even spare Blake a glance, growling at Ruby. Keep your pets under control. Yang jumps forward, eyes flickering red. Excuse me? Ruby, her face stony, puts out a hand to tell them both to stand down. Shakily, Ruby says, When we arrived, Adam was slaughtering the huntsmen that were already there. Some of us have dealt with him before, and we knew the only way to deal with him was to get him as far away from the breach as possible. Cordovan looks down her nose at Ruby. Abandoning your post in the process. Exceedingly convenient. Here's what I think. I misjudged you. You are students, and I've given you far more credence than you deserve. Today, you demonstrated abject cowardice. You saw your brothers and sisters lying in their own blood, and it proved too much for you. Had I the power, I would strip you of your provisional license and recommend a lifetime ban from the guild. Ruby shouts back, We're not cowards! We've been fighting for so long! Cordovan cuts her off, slamming her hands on the desk. Have you? How am I to know? You've offered me nothing but a fanciful story that I was wrong to entertain. You never fought at Beacon, and if you did, you'd still be there. You haven't fought at Haven, or else you'd be helping them rebuild. No, Miss Rose, I think you've been fleeing, and concocted for yourself an excuse to escape beneath the safety of Atlas's bosom. Unfortunately for you, Atlas is protected by the brave, and such craven behavior is unwelcome. Ruby stares in shock. What? Do you- Cordovan affords her no time to speak. Your intelligence matches your courage. The deal is off. I want you off my base, out of my sight, and out of my mind. You have disappointed me, Miss Rose. The four girls stare with a mixture of shock, horror, and rage. Y steps up. But the relic! Cordovan snarls back. As far as I'm concerned, your trinket is forfeit. Ruby yells. That's not fair! That wasn't part of the deal! Cordovan returns her eyes to the windows. Life isn't fair, Miss Rose. Get out. Dee and Dudley step into the room behind Team Ruby and begin to physically guide them out. Ruby tears her arm away and leads her team out the door, glaring at Cordovan until she's through the doorway. We get one last shot of Cordovan staring out at the city before we cut away. We cut to outside the gate of the boot, where Crow is standing awkwardly, hands in his pockets. Team Ruby comes shuffling out of the entrance, and there's a moment's pause when Ruby sees Crow waiting for them. He says, I heard about the chase, came to make sure you... Ruby doesn't let him finish, lowering her head, stealing her face, and angrily walking past him without a word. Crow reaches after her limply, and he turns to the other three members, confused. Yang grabs her arm, Blake scratches her neck, and Weiss rubs her temple, the three girls clearly uncomfortable and awkward. We follow Ruby as she walks along the boardwalk of Argus's beach, quickly going nowhere before arbitrarily stomping and plopping herself down on the wall, dividing the beach from the concrete. The camera shifts to show Crow approaching her while the rest of Team Ruby walk into the city from the bridge, taking the damaged Bumblebee with them. As Crow nears, we get a close-up of where Ruby is glaring, directly at the boot. Crow arrives behind her, saying, The girl's told... Ruby cuts him off, hissing with a wavering voice. I don't want to hear anything from you. Just... leave me alone. Crow obliges for the most part and stays silent as Ruby continues to glare at the boot, before dropping her head to her hands and scratching at her hair. She growls openly in frustration before shouting, We had it! We had everything! It was right there! We only needed one thing to go right and it did! It almost did! She slams her hand into the stone of the wall. And now we don't have Oz, we don't have a route to Atlas, we don't even have the stupid relic! Throwing her head back, Ruby screams at the sky. Why does everything suck? Breathing heavier, she begins to slink down into herself, saying with less and less gusto, why does everything I try suck? Crow sucks in a breath and throws his leg over the wall to sit beside her. He goes to speak, only for Ruby to again interrupt him. Don't say I told you so. Please. Crow shakes his head and replies, 
I wasn't going to say it. Someone had to make a call, Ruby, and you made one. Unfortunately, this one didn't pan out. Them's the brakes. He pauses and pulls out his flask, looking at his reflection in the metal. Don't think there's an easy way to learn that lesson. Cruel irony is. If you'd made a different call out there, there's nothing to say it wouldn't have turned out basically the same way. Ruby sulks. So I shouldn't have done anything? I'm supposed to lead them, and all I've been is a terrible leader this whole time. Crow rolls his eyes and says, No, kid. And he stops himself before continuing. Ruby. A terrible leader would have left the relic in the well. Thumbing the flask, he continues. A terrible leader would have let that blowhard get to her. A terrible leader would have just given up. Ruby looks over to him, eyes puffy. Crow continues. It's too easy to just run. He twists the flask to see Ruby's reflection in it. And it's harder to stay. But it's worth more. Crow takes one last good look at the flask, eyes hardening, before making a big show of unscrewing the cap and chucking it into the ocean. Ruby watches it drop into the water with shock, turning to look at her uncle. He watches it sink down below the waves with a bittersweet smile. Patting off his thighs, Crow rises to a stand. I think I'm through with rolling over. He looks to Ruby. What about you? Ruby looks up to him, confused, shocked, and contemplative. Finally, she looks out at the boot with a frown. I don't know what to do. Crow shrugs. Do what you do best. You've gotten us this far. Gotten me this far. That's more than I can say for myself. Ruby smiles softly at the self-deprecating reply before narrowing her eyes at the boot. We're going to get that relic. Get to Atlas. And we're going to do it whether Cordovan likes it or not. Cut to black. End of episode. We open episode 19 on Cinder walking the back alleys of Mistral during a heavy downpour. Few people litter the streets, running through the water to get here or there, and fewer pay attention to Cinder as she walks. Eventually she makes her way through an alley and comes out its mouth, where she gets a somewhat clear visual on the chop shop. Her eyes narrow as she looks to the entrance, where Mistralian police and Menagerie militia are positioned around the perimeter. They are stopping any and all civilians who get close and are removing their hoods and hats to get clear identification. Cinder frowns and looks to the roof, where there's a number of figures patrolling. Cinder growls in frustration just as Team Auburn approaches the installation to relieve the gate guards. We jump over to their perspective, where Arslan gets a sixth sense about someone watching them, and looks over to the alley to see a hooded figure vanish. Eyes hardening, Arslan cranes her neck to her team and tells them, Hold down the fort, I'm gonna get something to eat before walking off. Bolin raises his hand in confusion after her, saying, But we just ate. We follow Arslan into the alley, and we get matching shots of her and this hooded figure maneuvering the cramped passages, their speed gradually getting faster and faster till they're both practically sprinting, the rain making for muddy terrain as they enter Mistral's swampy underbelly. At the end of the chase, Arslan comes to a corner and rounds it, sliding in the mud as we in the audience hear a gust of wind. She finds herself facing a concrete wall, with no one in sight. She stands there, baffled for a moment, looking for any possible avenue of escape, only to give up and turn back in frustration. As she goes, the camera pans up to show Cinder on a rooftop, partially obscured by a tree growing from the foundation. We cut to Cinder entering what seems to be an apartment or a house, the kitchen of which has untended bloodstains, drag marks, and broken furniture, implying she murdered the people that lived here. Cinder, still dripping, goes to the fridge and opens it finding nothing inside. Going to the pantry, again, she finds nothing. In frustration, she hisses. Why are you people so damn poor? While checking the lower cabinets, Cinder manages to find a mostly empty bag of rice, one that has been clearly gnawed on and stolen from by different animals. With a sigh, she takes it out, and we cut to her having finished cooking and eating it, her stomach still growling as she lays down to sleep on the couch. Gripping her stomach, Cinder curls in on herself and closes her eyes. We hear Cinder, in her younger voice, say, When are we going to eat? I'm starving. I haven't eaten for days. We cut to find Tyrion, pulling the younger girl through the dark corridors of Evernight Castle by her arm, his face scrunching in anger. You are about to meet our goddess. Forget your worldly concerns for a moment. Cinder struggles against him, hissing. I don't want to meet your stupid goddess. I just want... There is a slap as Tyrion backhands Cinder. She stands there, shocked, as he sharply says, What you want is irrelevant. Cinder stays quiet, holding her cheek as she is pulled into the massive throne room. Standing beside the throne is Watts, slightly younger than we've seen him previously. 
Like a tree, we can gauge his age by the length of his moustache. Also by the grain of his hair, but you know that's not quite as iconic. He takes only a glance at Cinder. I wasn't aware we were in the business of recruiting rodents. Cinder glares at him and bares her teeth, and he only replies with a dry, Charming. Tyrion shoves her in front of the throne and matches Watts' look. Ah, but you see, rats are cunning. And when pushed to their limits, they can do incredible things. <laughs> he says, forcing Cinder to kneel. Watts gives a flat look in reply and rolls his eyes. And he's laughing again. A voice cuts through the laughter. Enough of your bickering. Immediately, Tyrion shuts up and becomes completely obedient, his back sticks straight and his head bowed in reverence towards the throne. Calmly, Salem asks, Who are you? Cinder glares up at Salem, but remains silent, defiant. After the pause becomes too long, Tyrion tries to step in and say, This is... Only for Salem to cut him off. Tyrion? Her. Not you. Cinder continues to glare silently up at Salem, and Salem stands to approach the girl. You have a fire in your eyes. A pure, unbridled vitriol. Hatred. But for what, I wonder? Salem stops a few feet away from Cinder, and then begins to circle her as she talks, appraisingly so. If I were to guess, I would suspect life itself. As Salem goes, she seems to get lost in her own words. It's a common enough tale. Life saddles us all with injustice, cruelty, the knowledge that those that have done us wrong have gone unpunished. Cinder actually looks up a bit at that, but drops her head aside when her eyes briefly meet Salem's. However, I rarely see it in someone so young. Salem pauses in front of Cinder and turns to her fully. She draws closer and caresses Cinder's face with an outstretched hand. Cinder winces at the contact. My dear, who has hurt you? Cinder's eyes shoot open and she lunges up from her crouch, a glass knife forming in her hands as she drives it up into Salem's ribcage. There is a beat before Salem's body slumps over Cinder's. Curiously, neither Watts nor Tyrion react, watching expectantly as Cinder lets out a dry, enraged cry and begins to mercilessly stab Salem again and again and again. After dozens of stabs, Cinder slows to a stop, the blade still lodged in Salem's gut. Her breathing is heavy, eyes glassy, but calmed. A second later, the camera closes in tighter and her eyes shrink in shock and terror. We pan down to her wrist, which is now locked in a death grip by Salem. Salem, her body and head still resting on Cinder's shoulder, slowly tears the blade from her gut, spilling rivulets of black ooze as she does. Once the blade is out, the wound heals almost immediately, as if it were never there. Salem's voice carries right next to Cinder's ear, soft and earnest. Do you feel better? Does that make you feel better? To Cinder's surprise, Salem runs the knife back into her own heart once, twice, three times before continuing. Does this soften the hurt? Now Salem raises her head and pulls away from Cinder, keeping her wrist in that deathlock. Cinder is terrified and tries to pull away, but Salem cedes no ground, instead saying, We're looking for people willing to cut ties to the past, burn the old world and forge a new one. Salem reaches forward and brushes the hair out of Cinder's face. What do you desire? Control? Power? Salem squeezes Cinder's wrist, forcing her to drop the knife. It shatters as she continues. I can give you power but power without purpose means nothing. She leans in close, wrapping her arms around Cinder's terrified shoulders, giving the girl an embrace that's natural to Salem, but stills Cinder. Resting her head on Cinder's shoulders, she says softly, Find your purpose. Here. The words echo as Cinder awakens on the couch, the rain still pounding outside. Her stomach growling, she grips it and rolls off the couch. We cut over to the spider's new hideout where Little Miss is enjoying some tea with her constituents, and two places that have been set and used but are currently empty. There is a commotion at the door as Wilbur is forcibly pushed through it by a pissed off cinder. He tries to push her back, but she casually stabs him in the leg and pushes him aside, strutting into the room past him. Wordlessly, Cinder approaches the table and falls into one of the seats across from Little Miss, who is staring at Cinder with thinly veiled disdain. 
Cinder starts the conversation by saying, My information, where is it? Little Miss calmly sets down her tea. I do believe you'll be paying for that door. Cinder scoffs. Take it out of my transportation cost. I just want the info. I'll leave the city on my own. Little Miss rests on her elbows. It's only been a couple of days. Presumptuous that I'd have it by now. Now shoot, I'm entertaining family. Cinder snarls. You don't know who you're dealing with. Little Miss pulls out her fan and replies. Oh, I know who I'm talking to. Miss Ash Autumn. See, you had me doing some digging into those huntresses in training, and it led me all the way back to Beacon. As she says this, a shadow appears in the doorway behind her, casually walking to the table but slowing. Mom? Who's sitting in Melanie's chair? Little Miss turns around and says, Oh darlings, I'm sorry, why don't you girls come sit down? Her words become pointed to Cinder. My guest was just leaving. Cinder glares at Little Miss and then up at Malachite, the amalgam personalities of Melanie and Milcha. Cinder's glare becomes confused, obviously searching for the second person implied by Little Miss's words. Little Miss continues, Would you kindly get out of my daughter's seat? Cinder narrows her eyes. There's plenty of room. Little Miss talks over her. You see, my daughters were there at the fall of Beacon. Cinder jolts in place, eyes beginning to harden. They suffered quite a bit because of you and your friend Torchwick. Malachi blinks in confusion and looks to Little Miss, saying, Mom? Little Miss ignores her and continues, I was willing to overlook that for the sake of business, but what you did to my girls. Little Miss cranes her neck up to her daughters. Well, Melanie, Milcha, what do you think? Malachite's eyes have gone feral and she lunges over the table at Cinder. Little Miss calmly picks up her tea and sips at it as Cinder rolls backwards to dodge the attack from Malachite. What follows is a replacement of the Cinder Neo fight from Volume 6 with a gradually escalating battle between Cinder and Malachite. Malachite, thanks to first mover advantage, has the early upper hand on Cinder. Among a number of other factors such as recovering from being stabbed, drowned, concussed, malnourished, and being nibbled on by her evil possessed grim arm of evil. Malachite has also stepped up her game, seemingly far more competent at balancing the two sets of weapons, which she now uses the full sets of with reckless abandon. The fight breaks out of the hideout into the streets where the two lock blades in the heavy rain. Very cinematic. We get a brief cutaway to Arslan in the market, asking questions to a vendor when she hears the commotion. She moves to investigate and hesitates, pulling at her scroll, but ultimately decides not to use it, leaving to check on what's happening without calling for backup. Back with the fight, Cinder is so steamed the rain is literally evaporating off her body thanks to Magic Maiden shenanigans. She also begins to turn the tide, and more and more Malachite is forced to take a defensive stance. Eventually, Malachite is forced to the ground, thoroughly beaten, and Cinder is about to impale her on a spear when a kunai shatters the weapon. Cinder turns to look at the approaching Arslan, who stops about 20 feet away. Cinder snarls at Arslan. You brat! Who do you think you are? Arslan's face twists into a scowl. My name is Arslan Altan. You should remember. Cinder shakes her head in disinterest, scoffing. I don't care. And with a flick, Cinder sends a glass knife at Arslan. Arslan easily dodges out of the way, and we begin a second mini-conflict between Arslan and Cinder. The fight is brief, and though Arslan does seem to have improved, she is no match as her blade string is cut, leaving her unarmed as Cinder waves a burning hand through her torso. Arslan doesn't even get out a scream as her body disintegrates in front of Cinder. The wind carries away her ashes as Cinder stares past where Arslan was, to where Little Miss is now cradling the bleary-eyed and injured Malachite. Little Miss looks to Cinder with fear. All right, all right, you've made your point. Stop, please. They left for Argus. Best bet is that they're on their way to Atlas. Cinder looks at them, unimpressed, and turns to leave. As she steps away, Malachite struggles to her feet, and says through gritted teeth, We are going with you. Cinder stops and looks back at her, sneering. For what purpose? Malachite coughs out a bit of blood. He needs to die. Roman needs to die. Cinder turns to face Malachite and appraises her. Cinder says, That look in your eye. With a bitter smile. We cut to an Atlesian boat off the coast of the boot, where it appears there's a pair of engineers out to examine the hard light seawall. It's been mentioned in passing before and has been in the background of every shot looking out at the ocean. 
From the conversation on board, the unusual power drain mentioned last episode has seemed to spike, leading to some concerns among the engineering corps. To inspect the issue, one of the engineers suits up and drops into the water to inspect one of the most active pylons. He sinks a decent distance and begins to work on a fuse box, only for the panel to come loose and drop into the depths. Groaning, the man descends deeper, and just as he reaches for the panel, a loud shocking sound startles him. He a leaps back and stares at the wall, where a series of other shocking sounds can be heard. He's confused at first, until he looks closer, and his eyes widen in terror. Just beyond the wall, we see a pair of red eyes. Then another. Then another. The camera cuts to a side view, divided by the energy wall. On one side is the lone engineer, floating isolated in the depths of the water, and on the other is a veritable wall of grim, spread thick against the sea floor. As the man radios up to his partner, we cut back to the boot's lockup, where we see a numbered lockbox stored among many. We zoom in closer and closer before we're inside, where the relic of knowledge pulses menacingly. Cut to black. End of episode. We open episode 20 with John's cheek being dabbed with alcohol. He yelps in pain, and Saffron says, Oh please, you whine more than my two-year-old. The two, sitting in the Kata Ark living room, look over to Adrian, playing with his manta and stuffing it in his mouth, around the battery compartment. Immediately, Terra slides into frame and pulls it out, saying, No, 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 don't chew on that. Adrian begins to cry in response, and John raises a brow at Saffron. Saffron resumes rubbing the swab harder on his face. He winces, but looks across the couch to where Weiss, Blake, and Yang are sitting in dejected silence. Looking to Blake, he says, So, Adam showed up. Yang's head falls against the couch as Blake sits up, more attentive. It was like the Grim were drawn to him, and the minute he looked at us, he just kept on coming. We barely slowed him down. Yang breathes out. You're lucky we lured him away from the wall, because honestly, if you guys had gotten there any earlier... Nora pumps her arms in the air. Ah, we would have taken him! Blake, matter-of-factly, retorts. He would have cut you down. We had every advantage in that fight, and he still beat us. Blake curls in on herself. He's always been strong. But this was something else. He's worse, like a man possessed by something. Hatred? Weiss quietly mutters. I wouldn't blame him for it. Did you see his face? My family did that to him. Blake reaches over and rests a hand on Weiss's shoulder. It's not your fault, Weiss. It was some night guard when he was a kid. You're not responsible for what your family allowed to happen. Weiss shakes her head. I'm a schnee. Eris or not, I'm going to inherit my family's legacy. Yang speaks up from where she's slumped. Weiss, I appreciate the self-reflection, but that asshole almost killed Ruby and lost us our ticket to Atlas. It's okay to be angry at him. John, Nora, and Ren snap to look at the three. John exclaiming, What? You lost the ticket to Atlas? Terra blinks in shock. Cordovan reneged on the deal? She's never done that. Our contracts with her have always gone through just fine, to the letter. Yang sighs. Well, apparently that doesn't hold true for... She holds up finger quotes. Cowards who abandoned their post. No matter how much damage the homicidal maniac would have done. Nora sits up stock straight. She can't do that! Weiss shakes her head. She can, and she has. And the worst part is she's taken the lamp. Ren replies, Why would she do that? Does she know what it does? Yang answers back, No, she just hates us. John asks, Well, what are we going to do now? We spent the better part of a month working towards that. Yang flippantly suggests, Find the nearest bar? That's about all I can think of. There's a long quiet as they all stew on the situation. Suddenly, the front door slams open and Roman steps through, yelling, Daddy's home, and he's got his cigarettes. Cigars, they're actually cigars. He steps through the doorway, kitted out in a completely new outfit, flanked by the skipping Neo, who stays faithfully by his side in her own brand new outfit. Roman's proud face droops seeing the mood of the room, and he comments dryly, I didn't know you'd all be this sad over us being gone. What's with the faces? While most of the room are unenthused at his entrance, Yang perks up and raises her head, saying, Neo? Instinctually, she raises her hands and signs while speaking. I'm glad to see you're okay. Neo smiles and signs back. And you look terrible. Yang gives a dry laugh and drops her head back to the couch, now smiling a little more. Nora, realizing no one is talking, looks to Roman and says, Ah, uh, welcome back? I think? 
Roman, wearing a more serious face, finds an empty seat and sits down. Not exactly how I thought this was going to go. What's going on? There's a collective groan as Yang says. Plan fell through with Cordovan. We're not getting to Atlas. Roman blinks and says, Oh. He thinks for a moment before waving his arm nebulously in the air. Have you tried kidnapping her? Before anyone can answer, he mutters to himself, No, no, that wouldn't work. Too well defended. He looks to Adrian and Tara's arms and asks, Does she have any kids? Tara, horrified, turns Adrian away while she, Saffron, and John give him undisguised looks of disgust. John hisses, We're not criminals! Roman shakes his head at him. Well, that's your problem now, isn't it? John tries to get a word in, but Roman buckles down, his words losing levity. No, seriously think about it. What are you willing to do to get to Atlas? We cut over to an interrogation room where Adam has been chained to the floor beneath the table. His eyes are glassy, and the room around him is covered in a thick, desaturated mental haze. The door on the other side of the room opens, and he can barely make out the blurry shape walking towards him. It's Cordovan, who stands right in front of the table and throws down a folder of files. My, my, you're busy. Adam barely looks down at the files, and when he looks up, there's a new figure there, a young, tired-looking defense attorney who says, All right, kid, let's make this quick. I'm Mrs. Camilla, and I'll be your defense attorney. We don't have much time. I've got 15 more cases before lunch. A young Adam looks at her with thinly veiled disdain, and we transition back to the present as Cordovan begins to speak. I'll be frank with you. And from here, we get Adam experiencing two scenes interspersed with one another, running in parallel. The first is Cordovan talking with Adam in the present, while the other is Mrs. Camilla talking with young Adam in the past. In the past, Camilla runs through a list of crimes. Attempted theft, assault with a deadly weapon, emigration fraud, attempting to flee the country without a Faunus emigration pass, two counts of fleeing the scene of a crime, and one attempted, as well as assaulting an officer of the law. She comments with some level of sympathy that he's in a bad position, and explains that she's got a deal for him, though it takes a bit of bickering for him to listen. There's a program shipping Faunus to Menagerie from Atlas to alleviate some of the social unease. The courts don't want to deal with him and the expense that comes with him. As long as he's okay being soaked through his skin, it's exactly what he wants. He'd be an idiot to pass it up. In the present, Cordovan is presenting Adam with a choice. Be remitted to Argus custody and tried in Mistral where it's heavily implied he'll be given a death sentence, or be brought back to Atlas as a trophy for Cordovan and the Atlas military to live out his sentence in high security alive and well enough. Back in the past, Adam accepts Camilla's condition, and on her way out, she throws him some gauze to cover his eye, which has begun to bleed. Meanwhile, in the present, he's borderline catatonic, unresponsive to any of what Cordovan is saying. Cordovan is unimpressed, and packs up her files, commenting snidely, Well, if that is what you wish, I'll give you the day, since you know well not to talk back to your betters. Adam doesn't react to those words, his eyes still glaring into the floor. As the door closes behind him, we see a young Adam sitting where the older one should be, head in his hands as two guards enter to take him back to his cell. We follow Cordovan as she casually walks through the halls of the boot, when her scroll begins to ring an alarm. She groans and pulls it out, answering it. What is it? And before she can even finish speaking, Dee's voice carries over, saying, Ma'am, we have a major situation. As he finishes saying this, the lights flicker overhead. Back at the Kata Ark House, the lights flicker, though only dimly, and no one notices, too engrossed in trying to figure out what to do. The group are all circled around the table, shooting back and forth different ideas of what they could do, like buying a boat, petitioning the local council, going back to Mistral, and none of them are coming up to a good solution. They're all lost in thought when the front door swings open, not so extremely like when Roman opened it, but still sharp and snappy. Ruby comes walking confidently through the front door, followed closely by Crow. As she enters, Ruby takes stock of the assembled group, and they all look at her confused by her sudden change in demeanor. She comments briefly, Roman, Neo, good, you're back. That'll make things easier. Everyone grab your gear, we're moving out. Team Junior start moving quickly, while the rest are slightly slower to respond, though they slowly begin to stand. Ruby begins to head up the stairs with Crow close behind, when Yang asks, Ruby, what's going on? Ruby pauses on the stairs as Crow goes past her. She briefly tells him to grab her things before addressing the group below. We're going to Atlas. Now. The assembled crew look at her shocked and baffled, but her words instill a sense of energy in their movements. Blake blinks. d, d what? what's the plan Ruby, who had turned to go back up the stairs, turns back, 
face stoic, but radiating confidence. We're stealing a plane. There's a beat of silence before Roman throws his fist up in the air. Aw, hell yeah! Crime! I knew you had it in you, Red! We cut to outside the house, where Ruby is leading everyone out, carrying full packs of equipment. We get that some time has implied to have been passed, as she is now explaining the tail end of her plan. So, the distraction team will converge with the relic team at the end of the runway, then Crow jumps out of the control tower and flies to meet us after we've dusted off. Then it's a straight shot to Atlas and we're home free. Bip bop bam, easy plant. John nudges her shoulder and says, Hey, uh, hey, Ruby? The camera, having been one consistent shot, pans back and towards the ocean, revealing a wide shot of the boot and the hard light seawall. Air raid sirens begin to sound, as what appears to be the remaining at Legion forces are lifting off from the base and flying away from the city, just as the hard light walls around the city begin to deactivate in sequence. Our protagonists stare in dejected shock, and Ruby drops her arms. There's only a beat of silence before it cuts to black, and Ruby says, Okay? New plan! Our finale opens by following Cordovan's feet as she storms out of the base onto the tarmac. In the background, we can see the Atlas forces scrambling to load up airships for an emergency evacuation. Cordovan is seething into a scroll, asking, Too deep? What do you mean, too deep? We should have known about this before it got out of hand! She stops at the back of one of the Manta Seas on the landing strip, meeting up with Dean Dudley. She asks, Is there any way we can contain this? This is when she catches the Harlight seawall flickering out of the corner of her eye, just in time to see the first segment fail. With a steely look, she declares into the scroll, I want all personnel off this island in five minutes! We're going home! The three board the airship and it takes off as the first wave of Grimm hit the tarmac, swarming over the base. These Grimm are brand new, composed of a crocodilian walrus front half, and an octopoidal rear half made of writhing tentacles. These are the mermaids, aquatic grim that are individually weak, but are known for their strong swarm mentality, as well as the ability to store up water in their gullets to use as high-pressure, high-damage projectile streams. As Cordovan's ship ascends, D asks politely, Ma'am, what about the Crusader? Cordovan watches as the last Manta crew fails to take off in time and are completely overrun by the Grimm. Another Manta that's still rising is bombarded by water blasts, wearing away the metal and tearing through the wing, causing it to crash. Cordovan scowls. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. It's not ready for transport. We cut to a distant shot as Ruby Jr. Kern are en route to the base, watching as the last of the airships take off and the island becomes infested with Grimm. Ruby and Weiss are on the moped, Yang and Blake are on Bumblebee, and Crow is driving John, Nora, Ren, Roman, and Neo in Saffron's minivan. They're all conversing over an open scroll line between the three vehicles. Yang asks, Uh, Rubes, that's a lot of Grimm. John adds on to that. You gonna be safe over there? Ren adds further, I'm more worried about us. Ruby calmly says, Trust the plan, people. We pull this off, we get the relic, and save the city. John asks earnestly, And if we don't? Crow replies, Then no one's gonna be around to worry about it. We approach the Argus side of the bridge connecting it and the boot, where a host of civilians, huntsmen, and law enforcement have scrambled to put up early defenses. They're woefully inadequate, barely able to withstand the few mermaids that have already crossed the bridge, but it's better than nothing. But with more grim on the way, things tied ill for the defenders. We get a split screen of all of our protagonists' eyes as Ruby says, Trust in each other and hope for the best. See you all on the other side. With that last declaration, Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang burst past the defensive line, riding onto the bridge. In fact, Yang uses a chain-link partition and the Grimm behind it to ramp off onto the bridge. Ruby, meanwhile, weaves in and out between the Grimm as Weiss does what she can to fend them off. The camera detaches from the girls and we linger back with the defenders. The minivan drifts to a stop and the sliding door opens. In one smooth motion, Nora uses the inertia to leap forward and smash a Grimm that was about to kill one of the civilian defenders, laughing with glee as she grenades off it and into the swarm. She is followed closely by Ren, who is masking the civilian with his semblance and leading him off to safety. John walks out of the van and takes stock of the surroundings, quickly calling out orders that will better organize and bolster defenses. Some of the younger huntsmen present, the ones not currently fighting, look at him confused, only for Crow to step in and tell them to listen, giving John the authority he needs to help organize on the ground. As people get to work, he attempts to thank Crow, who cuts him off and says there's no time for pleasantries. John nods and turns to Roman and Neo, asking if they can get what they need. Roman and Neo take their own stock of the situation and find a nearby dust store. 
Roman cracks his knuckles. I think we can manage. We cut away to the inside of one of the boot's hallways, where we find two dead guards, their bodies brutalized to the maximum level allowed by this PG-13 show. Two hands, soaked in blood, wrap around rot chains and grip them tightly. There is a brief flicker as Adam's hand becomes younger, gripping onto a younger gear of Belladonna's hand as his ghostly voice proudly says, Let me introduce you to my... His voice fades into Blake as we see a much younger her standing in front of Adam and smiling as she says, her voice equally as ghosty. I'm Blake, it's nice to meet you... Adam, was it? Adam, in the present, tenses his fingers around the chain as Blake's voice saying his name echoes in his head. His arms flex, he pulls. Moments later the chains snap, leaving Adam unchained in the middle of the hall, blood dripping from his clothes, breathing heavily. Cutting away we refocus on Team Ruby as they're progressing across the bridge, though the grim numbers keep getting thicker and thicker as they go. Eventually, due to abandoned cars making it too difficult to maneuver, Ruby and Weiss are forced to ditch the moped, rushing over the blockages on foot. Yang and Blake make further progress on Bumblebee, ramping off different cars and portions of the bridge thanks to Yang's driving skill. Unfortunately, as they near one end of the bridge, the number becomes too thick to drive through and Blake ribbons them up onto one of the support cables, leaving Bumblebee behind. With Weiss and Ruby joining them on the parallel cable, the four paws in the face of the base swarming with Grimm. Weiss looks over to them and asks aloud, across the bridge so that Blake and Yang can hear, Well, bikes are a lost cause. What's plan D? Ruby is silently calculating when Blake yells from across the way, The Nevermore! All eyes turn to her and she explains hurriedly, During initiation! She looks at Yang and holds up Gamble. The two lock eyes then look to Ruby and Weiss. The four nod in sync, and Blake shoots Gamble across to wrap around their cable. Ruby and Weiss jump into the center of the ribbon, Weiss on Ruby's shoulders. Weiss summons a glyph that drags her and Ruby almost down to ground level. As the Grim begin to jump and bite at them or shoot at them with jets of water, Yang comes hurtling down in a shockwave ground pound, a classic Yang battle cry slipping from her lips. She crashes through the glyph, breaking it and launching Ruby and Weiss up towards the control tower of the base. Standing from her fall, Yang cracks her neck and looks at the Grim, goading them. Who's next? Unfortunately for Yang, Blake's ribbon wraps around her and pulls her back up. Yang looks up to complain, but snaps on a more serious face. Right, mission. They rush down the cable and begin to jump across the roofs of the guard stations. Back with Team Junior, the bridge defense has become more robust, with vehicles moved into place as impromptu barricades and the defenders better organized in proper battle positions. This line is being held with waves of weapon fire keeping the Grim at bay, but the number just keeps growing. John oversees the situation and cuts down one of the mermaids before looking back towards the dust shop, screaming, Are we anywhere near done yet? And Roman, from one of the counters, yells, Would you like to be making the explosives? John scoffs and rolls his eyes. We get a brief close-up of Roman and Neo working on a row of dust canisters that have been crudely retrofitted into explosives. As he and Neo fiddle with the last one, she nudges something and he scrambles to stop her. Ah, no, 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 blue wire, Neo, blue wire! Returning to the battle, Crow is on the front lines, cutting down Grimm left and right and he's constantly scolding the defenders on their poor aim as he nimbly dodges around their fire. Are you aiming for the Grimm or me? While he's certainly cocky towards the defenders, his face spells out that he's becoming more and more concerned as the battle wages on. One by one, the defender's magazine count begins to dwindle, leaving him more and more on the defensive. As he dodges one of the Grim, exhaustion begins to catch up with him and he's winged by one of the mermaid's blasts. He cuts down that mermaid but falls against one of the abandoned cars on the bridge, trying to catch his breath. Another mermaid jumps on the car behind him and swipes at his neck, only for it to vanish in a cloud of black smoke. The cloud fades, revealing Maria standing on the car, looking down on him. He's about to say something when a mermaid comes up behind him. He twists to attack it, but Maria has already thrown her sickle. You see, this is what sobriety can do for you! Crow blinks, but stands, and draws Harbinger to shoot a Grim behind her. He says, I guess, Grandma, only been sober since this morning. I'm still giving it a trial run. Maria drops off the car besides him, sickle raised and looking at him cockily. Not one for running! How about a dance instead? Wordlessly, the two fall into step with one another, their moves a veritable dance as they begin to slaughter their way through the Grim, moving up the bridge as they do and pushing back the hordes. John, noticing the opening created by Maria and Crow, looks back to Roman and Neo, who are running out of the shop with the explosives. John looks to Nora and Ren and nods, yelling, All right, now or never, move up! As the five charge forward in the wake of Maria and Crow, we cut over to a distant shot from the inside of the air control tower of the base. 
We linger on the defenders pushing onto the bridge, practically specs with how far they are, when we hear a volley of shots followed by a red shape slamming into the window, shattering it. A series of glyphs slow the shape and bring Ruby and Weiss to a halt inside of the tower. The two are staggered for a moment, catching themselves after moving so quickly, and a few seconds following that a massive boom hits the tower, shattering the rest of the windows and making them both flinch in surprise. Weiss blinks as the last shard falls. Was that… a sonic boom? Ruby blinks in kind. I… think that was? Ruby quickly shakes off the shock and reorients. Okay, we need to focus. If I were a comms device, where would I be? Weiss peeks over Ruby's shoulder to the console sitting behind her, pointing. That looks like one. Ruby hops around excitedly and says, Great! How do we use it? Weiss looks at Ruby flatly and is about to retort when she looks more appraisingly at the console. Actually, I think I might know. It looks similar to the civilian CCT interface. Move over. Weiss walks in front of the camera and we transition over to Blake and Yang running through the halls of the boot, killing Aaron Grimm who have wormed their way inside along the way. They're debating back and forth over which bay the relic's lockup might be in. We cut between them hurriedly kicking their way into different bays, and on about the third one the two pause to gawk at something inside. Yang mutters, I mean, that's awesome, but that's not what we're here for. Blake nods, saying, Agreed. The two turn and continue searching down the line. We check back in on the bridge as one of the charges is placed down on a support pylon near the side of the bridge closest to the island. We get quick shots of the rest of the charges being quickly planted and pan out to Roman connecting them all to a crude detonator. Roman yells, Fire in the hole! and promptly presses the switch. Only for nothing to happen. Cursing, he flips it over and begins to rapidly fiddle with the wires as John, Ren, Nora, Crow, and Maria are steadily being pushed back by the Grim. Only Roman and Neo are left to defend themselves, all while Roman is still trying to get the detonator working. After several close calls where Roman basically dodges through the entire fight, he gets the detonator started, with sequential beeping serving as the timer. Wiping his brow in relief, he listens to the beeping for only a moment before commenting dryly, That is beeping far faster than it should be. Cutting back to the comms tower, Weiss instructs Ruby to stand in a particular spot, and a moment later a hologram of Cordovan appears, patently confused. Over on a personal ship, we can see that there's a matching hologram of Ruby. Immediately, Ruby opens up by calling, Cordovan! Cordovan snarls at Ruby. What are you doing? I hope you know you're trespassing. Ruby shoots back. Then come back here and arrest me. Cordovan scoffs. You know that's... Ruby cuts her off. I don't care. I trusted you. The people of Argus trusted you. They need you now. Cordovan winces at being cut off, but continues somewhat composed. The people of Argus must learn to fend for themselves. They knew we were leaving. Ruby retorts, Not this soon! They expected to still have protection after you left. The walls are down! Cordovan is dismissive, catching the attention of Dee and Dudley as she says, The walls can be repaired at a later date. I'm sure the riffraff of Argus can use a little thinning out. Up at the controls of the airship, the pilot's knuckles whiten around the control yolk. Behind the pilot's seat, Dudley subtly flips a switch on the control board. We are then treated to shots of the other ships in the fleet receiving the audio and visual of Cordovan's call. Ruby continues pleading, There won't be a later date for Argus! In tandem, Weiss is fiddling with the console and manages to project into the conversation video footage of the bridge and how it's swarmed with Grimm. Doesn't Atlas have a duty to prevent this? Didn't Atlas swear an oath to protect Argus? Didn't you swear that oath? Cordovan closes her eyes and puts a hand over her heart. My oath is to the lineage of the Architect, to the Council of Atlas, and to all Atlesians who live under their protection. Decadent misanthropes and the degenerate subspecies they enable are not part of my duty and will be spared no time nor effort. You ask me to endanger my men and women for the dregs of other nations, and I refuse. There's a beat of silence getting cuts from around the fleet of the soldiers reacting with shock to Cordovan's speech, ending with Ruby staring in opened mouth shock herself. Ruby, voice now considerably more measured, speaks. I was wrong about you, Cordovan. Her face twists with disgust. You're nothing more than an intolerant coward. Ruby steps away from the platform, and her hologram dissolves as we hear. Come on, Weiss, we're leaving. Cordovan sneers as Ruby walks away, and we quickly get cuts from around the fleet of them still listening to the broadcast, the distant echoes of gunfire, explosions, and screams from Argus carrying through the audio. Cordovan orders, Cut the connection! And when they hesitate, she snaps. 
cut it now! Back at the bridge, we see John ushering his team back behind the barricades as the main defenders pick back up the slack of holding off the incoming hordes of Grimm. Crow, injured, is supported by Nora, and as the two go past, John asks, Where are Roman and Neo? Crow perks up in alarm. I thought they were right behind us. John turns to look down the bridge with visible concern. We jump over to Neo as she barely dodges a Grimm and levels a glare to Roman. He throws the detonator down, and the beeping becomes more and more rapid as he and she desperately avoid attacks from all sides. They're not perfect, however, and they take more than a few glancing blows. Neo is about to take a blow, and Roman jumps in front of it, tanking it with Ozpin's cane. Unfortunately, it sends them both tumbling to the ground, and Roman curses in pain as his aura begins to flicker weakly. Neo, looking up, sees the cowl of Bumblebee sticking over the end of a car. Eyes widening, she scrambles to a stand and grabs Roman by the collar, dragging him to his feet. The two stumble to where Bumblebee was abandoned and they jump on, with Neo driving. Unfortunately, her legs don't quite reach the pedal, just like back in the chase during Volume 5. With the beeping increasing in speed and the Grim rapidly closing in, Neo's eyes flicker around for an idea, and she finds one. Refracted glass creeps down her legs, creating a perfect replica of Yang's lower body, including her decidedly longer legs. Moving the physical illusion, Neo puts pedal to the metal just as the final beeps count down in complete silence. The two of them do not look back as the explosions detonate, weaving in and out between throngs of Grimm as the fireball chases them. They blast out onto the island, just barely being missed by the brunt of the explosion, and they slide to a brief stop in the center of the airfield to admire their work. Cables snap and girders groan. We cut over to John and the defenders watching the bridge warble and people begin to cheer. John, however, holds his breath as the smoke begins to clear. Nora, cheering with the rest, asks him what's wrong. He scowls as the smoke fades, revealing a heavily damaged but still very much intact bridge, and a wave of grim beyond it. Bitterly, John says, Oh, come on. We cut over to the relic pulsing quietly inside its safe. We hear the tumble of a lock and light breaks through as Yang cracks the lid open and retrieves the lamp. Blake, next to her, exhales with relief and motions to the room where lockbox after lockbox have been scattered around, clearly part of a scrambled effort to take what wasn't nailed down. I was worried they may have taken it. Yang nods and replies, Well, we have it now. Let's get back to Ruby. We jump to a corridor as the two jog down it, Yang pulling out her scroll and calling Ruby. The camera shifts over to Ruby and Weiss, rushing down a different hallway, presumably somewhere else in the base. Ruby picks up, and she asks if Yang got the relic. Yang confirms that she did, and in reply asks about Cordovan. Ruby answers, She's not coming back. Blake says over Yang's shoulder, We'll figure out something else. Where are we meeting up? Should we come to you? Ruby shakes her head. This place is like a maze. We should meet out on the tarmac. As Ruby says this, there's a slight commotion from Yang's side of the call, with Blake distantly calling Yang's name. There's a pause, and Ruby asks, Guys? What's up? We cut the Yang scroll on the ground next to her foot, the camera pointed down the hallway. The camera focuses on the background, revealing Adam, standing in the shadow of a flickering light. We jump back to Ruby just in time to hear Adam's voice, filled with cold fury, come over the speakers. No more running! This is followed by the rushing of footsteps and the drawing of a blade. Ruby screams into the mic, calling for her sister, but receives no response. Weiss and Ruby share a look of alarm before Ruby says, Come on, they can't be far from the lockup. Without a further word, the two take off. We jump over to the bridge defenders, who are beginning to buckle under the grim onslaught. In fact, we can see a couple of the Grimm are getting smarter and ignoring the bridge entirely, scaling the city's beach wall and sneaking into the city. Some defenders try to split off to deal with them, but John tells them to hold the line and let those Grimm go. The swarm on the bridge takes priority. He looks over across the bridge, and we cut over to the island where Roman is looking at the bridge himself. He comments idly, I hope that kid has another plan, that was all I got. There's a tap on his shoulder, and he looks to Neo, who is pointing at the end of the tarmac. He follows her finger and finds the parked Manta, the crew of which had been swarmed by Grimm during the evacuation. Oh, that's a trap. I know a trap when I see... As he's speaking, a Grimm sneaks up on the two, and Roman reflexively batters it away with his cane. Right, Grimm, no time for quips. Floor it! Neo, still with her partially transformed legs, floors the gas and rockets them off towards the parked Manta. We cut to one of the exits to the base as Yang slams through it, sending it flying off its hinges. Blake is right behind her, firing wildly into the hallway. We hear the bullets pinging off Adam's blade as he emerges from the shadows after the two. When Blake's gun goes dry, she reaches down for a new magazine, only for Yang to catch her wrist and yank her aside as Adam's sword comes down where she was standing. The two turn tail and run together towards the forest on the southeast end of the island, with Adam in hot pursuit. 
Up with Ruby and Weiss, they're running through a hallway with a long glass window that overlooks the southern base grounds, catching the moment that Roman and Neo begin to drive away, and managing to see Adam chasing their other teammates. Wordlessly and in sync, they break the glass and descend the mountain using Ruby's semblance. With Blake and Yang, they manage to stumble into the forest. Adam is hot on their heels, but they begin to weave back and forth between the trees, quickly cutting off his line of sight. The sound of the distant battle melts away to muffled noise, leaving most of the soundscape to be breathing, the crunch of snow, and eerie ambiance. After turning one bend, Yang and Blake press themselves behind a rocky outcropping, trying their best to hide from Adam. They're both breathing heavily, and trying to be quiet about it. Through the trees, we see Adam has slowed to a cautious walk, observing his surroundings and saying, I'm tired of this game, Blake. I'm tired. Blake looks down to her wrist, which Yang is gripping tightly, her arms shivering like the Dickens. Her eyes drift to Yang's free metal arm, creating a dull tapping noise as it jitters across the rock behind them. Blake leans over and grabs the shaking hand, whispering, Breathe. Just breathe. Yang looks into Blake's eyes, her own purple eyes flickering wildly. Yang breathes and lets go of Blake's wrist, using the free hand to still her shaking metal arm. Even as Yang begins to calm, Adam's voice rings out around them. Just come out, Blake! Just come out! Yang's eyes shrink and she begins to shake a little more, and Blake looks towards where Adam's voice is coming from over Yang's shoulder. She holds both of Yang's hands in her own and says, Don't worry, Yang, I have a plan. I'll distract him. You, Ruby and Weiss... Yang's hands pull back from Blake sharply, and Yang's eyes go red as she bites out. Stop it! Blake recoils, and Yang's eyes widen, taking a moment to breathe before saying, I get you're trying to help, but you can't keep doing this, Blake. Adam, getting more and more biting, shouts, Let me end this! He emphasizes this by cutting down a tree with a furious swing. Yang leans forward and collects Blake's hands, holding them like Blake had moments ago. I don't need you to be my knight in shining armor. I just need you to be there. Blake matches Yang's stare, hope returning to her eyes, and she tightens her fingers around Yang's, nodding in understanding. Taking a breath, Blake replies, Okay, let's make a plan. Earning a smile from Yang. We cut back to Adam as he walks through the woods, constantly scanning for Blake and Yang. He is surrounded by silence, but everywhere he turns, the shadows undulate and shift. He begins to see flashes of people from his past, his head swiveling to avoid them. His mother, his father, Camilla, Cinder, Volume 1 Blake, Ilya, the Lieutenant, Fennec, Corsic, Onryu, Gira, and Hazel. Snarling, Adam shouts at them, Traitor! All of you! I brought the White Fang to greatness, alone! I brought Vale to its knees, and I did nearly the same for Mistral! All of these, my accomplishments, undone by you! From the shadows of the trees, we see Blake and Yang pass in front of the camera quietly, while Adam continues swiveling on his feet, almost disoriented. He catches the sound and stills, flicking his blade as though removing the blood, before sheathing it and exhaling, now much more composed. We could have had everything, Blake. He begins to stalk through the woods again. We were going to save the Faunus. We were going to uplift them. We would make everything right. He stops and closes his eyes. Then you lost your way. I don't know what got in your head, but I do know what kept you there. Opening his eyes, he keeps walking. Those humans at Beacon. You still think they're your friends, but they only see you as a pet. That's all humans ever think of us. House pets, teacher's pets, pet projects. We're just playthings, and you're a fool believing otherwise. He stops and looks at his sword. Tell me, Blake, if I cut off their heads, will you get yours back? Adam looks up from his blade to find Volume 1 Yang standing in front of him, and he shakes his head to dismiss the image, only to be forced to leap away as one of Yang's shotgun blasts fly into where he'd just been standing. Adam rolls to a crouch in the snow and sees our current Yang standing there, firing at him from the tree line. Growling, he dashes off after her through the slush. There's a brief chase through the trees, Yang barely managing to keep ahead of him, or only seemingly so. As she crosses two parallel trees, Blake's ribbon springs up from beneath the snow, launching into Adam's torso as he pursues. Adam is clotheslined and falls, followed closely by Yang who kicks off a nearby tree and attempts a drop attack on Adam. Reflexively, Adam draws his blade and slashes up at Yang. Yang shoots herself aside to avoid the cut, but the blade cleaves clean through Blake's ribbon. Blake, from the shadows, opens fire on Adam, and he blocks the barrage with his blade. 
Opposite Blake, on the other side of him, is Yang, rolling and recovering from her dodge. She lands near where Shroud is embedded in the snow. Very smoothly, she yanks it free and tosses it Blake's way. As Blake closes in on Adam, she catches the sword and engages Adam directly in close quarters combat. Yang jumps in moments later, and the two tag team attack Adam, but he clearly outskills, if not outpowers them. The two are pushed back to a clearing bordering a distant cliff face. Adam's counteroffensive begins to wear down Blake and Yang, to the point they're pushed completely on the defensive to avoid his attacks, and still they take their fair share of nicks and bruises. At the end of the barrage, Adam goes for a killing blow against Blake, but Yang rushes in and blocks it, only for the force of the blow to gouge her mechanical arm and send her tumbling a far distance away. Blake calls Yang's name, but Adam is relentless, and she barely raises Shroud in time to block a series of quick, angry strikes lashing down at her. In the middle of his swing, a gunshot rings out, and Adam is hit in the shoulder, causing him to stumble. His eyes shoot in the direction of the shot, finding Ruby kneeling in a tree, cycling another round home. Before Adam can react, a giant ethereal blade comes swinging down from behind him, and he nearly has time to dodge out of the way as the armored Gygus attacks. Wise is at the opposite side of the clearing from Ruby, deep in concentration as she controls the Gygus. It attacks Adam, and for a brief moment he's on the defensive, evading attack after attack. This gives Ruby enough of an opening to spiral down the tree, sprint over to Blake, and rush to Yang's side. With Adam, after a few good swings from the Gygus, he deflects one of its attacks, sending it off kilter and opening it to a sudden moon slice, deleting it in one clean attack. Unfortunately for Weiss, this leaves her extremely open to the now very close Adam. He rushes towards her, and she barely has time to summon a glyph and send a sheet of ice at him along the ground. He's frozen in place just before he can get a swing off at her, and it gives her a moment to turn to her distant team and say, Uh, guys, a little help? Adam is delayed only a moment, breaking the ice and lashing out at Weiss. There's a brief sword duel between the two, with Weiss using her dust-infused blade to deflect his attacks and make a futile attempt to lock him down in ice. All this serves to do is to make him angrier, and with each new strike, the red on his body begins to burn brighter and brighter. After a particularly strong deflection, a blur of red and petals whisks Weiss away, leaving Yang in her place to take Adam's recovery blow, blocking it without flinching. The red blur scoops Yang back up as Blake descends from above, getting in a glancing blow at Adam. She rolls to a stop and glares at Adam. I'm not running anymore. I'm standing right in front of you. Adam takes a swipe, only for the blur to rescue Blake and replace her with Yang, who again tanks the blow, her hair fizzing with fire. With a bitter grimace, Yang says, She came back to us, not you. The blur returns and picks Yang up, with Weiss sliding in from the side to get another jab in on Adam, shouting, we're a family! As he attacks her, again, the red blur replaces her with Yang. Adam digs his blade into Yang's battered arm, shouting, Stand still and fight me! Yang's face goes from stone serious to almost playfully smug. What? Problem keeping up? The cycle repeats, with Yang being whisked away only for another member of the team to attack and be replaced with Yang when he attacks them. All the while, Yang's words become more mocking and cruel. What's the problem, pretty boy? Oh, just mister. Did you feel a breeze around here? Blinking, you missed me. Oh, sorry, was that your blind spot? Adam steadily gets angrier and angrier, and finally he breaks the cycle by reaching out abruptly and snatching Ruby as she blurs by him. Yang tumbles out of Ruby's interrupted semblance into the trees beside Weiss and Blake, both of whom cry Ruby's name. Adam lifts Ruby by her neck, and she scrabbles her crescent rose only for Adam to batter it aside. It falls to the snow, and she pulls at his grip. He turns to Yang, Blake, and Weiss, who are all frozen in shock. No more tricks! He tightens his grip. No more games! With his free hand, he redraws his blade and levels it at Ruby's legs. You're right, Blake. No more running. Ruby begins to panic, clawing at his unmoving grip. The three girls share a glance, equally as panicked, but Weiss resolves herself and begins to cast a line of glyphs. With a casual flick of his arm, Adam tosses Ruby into the air and lines up a glowing hot moon slice. Time slows as Blake springs off one of Weiss's glyphs and Yang runs along the length of the rest. Blake is launched up into the air right as Adam unleashes his moon slice on Ruby. She's about to fall short before she boosts forward with a shadow clone, slamming into Ruby's side and using Gamble to deflect the slice as best she can. As it absorbs the blow, the metal warps and bends, shattering all the way down the tang. While this is happening, Yang is accelerating faster and faster along Weiss's haste glyphs, reaching Adam in moments. He's barely able to turn his head Yang's direction when her fist connects with his torso, shattering his aura. For a split second, we're treated to a cruel parody of Adam's moon slice, with the world going black and yellow and the force of Yang's punch sending a burst of fire in a massive wave out behind Adam. 
We close in on Yang's mechanical arm, where it strains and groans under the pressure, twisting and deforming before crumpling and exploding into shards of circuitry and components. Adam is flung an incredible distance into the clearing, crashing and sliding into a DBZ-style divot. The snow around the divot has been vaporized in the wake of Yang's heat wave, stretching as far as the complete opposite end of the clearing. Time returns to its normal speed. Blake and Ruby come tumbling to the ground in a crumpled heap, while Yang falls with a scream of pain, clutching her broken arm. Wei slumps to her knees, her nose bleeding from the strain of summoning so many glyphs in quick succession. For a moment, there's just heavy breathing as all of Team Ruby catch their breath. Wei stumbles to her feet and walks over to help up Ruby. Blake watches with concern when Yang walks over and offers her remaining hand to help Blake stand. Blake smiles softly and takes it before noticing the coil metal of Yang's missing arm. Blake opens her mouth to ask, and Yang just says softly with a warm smile, It's okay. Blake sighs with relief and leans into her. Ruby, doing much the same with Weiss, gives her team an exhausted glance and says, Thanks. And she clearly wants to say more, but is also too tired. All eyes slowly drift to the crater made by Adam, and the four begin to walk towards him wordlessly, collecting crescent rows on the way. The four keep a healthy distance from Adam, who is sheathing his sword and using it to prop himself up, his hand never leaving the hilt. He's heavily injured, he's coughing up blood, and he's swaying as he fails to completely stand. Yang shakes her head and says, Just... stay down. Blake adds, You wanted this to end, Adam. You got what you wanted. Adam blearily looks up to her and tries to retort before coughing up a particularly thick wad of blood. Wei separates from Ruby and steps forward to address Adam, looking down on him with genuine empathy. I'm... Sorry this happened, for what my family did to you. It wasn't right. Adam looks up at Weiss with bafflement before his face grows cold and spiteful. Fuck you, Schnee. In a flash, Adam lunges forward, drawing his blade at Weiss. He doesn't get far, as a single gunshot rings out around the clearing. Adam's form goes limp, and he falls into the mud, Wilton Blush clattering to Blake's feet. The other three members of the team turn back to look at Ruby, who has crescent rose in its rifle form, barrel still smoking. She's staring at Adam, face professional, calm, but the underpinnings of shock keeps her mouth slightly agape. As the silence washes over them, she keeps her rifle trained on Adam's lifeless form. We cut over to the other side of the bridge, where the defensive line has begun to crumble. Defenders are being pushed from both sides, with Grimm that have scaled the beach walls now pressing in on them in addition to the ones crossing the bridge, catching the humans in a pincer. John, Nora, and Ren are rushing around, trying to assist where they can, but it's clear that all order has collapsed and they're about to be overrun. From the sky, Amanda descends and opens its bay doors, revealing Neo and beyond her, Roman in the pilot's seat. She beckons them inside, and Roman adds, Get everyone inside! We need to get the hell out of here! John stabs down at a mermaid and looks to Roman with bafflement. People are still- My sister! They're a kid! Roman quickly offers, Fine, we'll swoop around, get them and the brat, but we need to get the hell out of this city. John shakes his head. Pyrrha's family's here too, and... Roman cuts him off, shouting. Look, kid, you gotta cut your losses. We can't save everyone. John grimaces, but orders everyone onto the ship. While Nora and Ren share conflicted looks, they fall in line once John steps on board. Roman watches them board and rolls his eyes, saying, First sensible thing you've all done. Before he can finish, John's sword stabs into the seat between Roman's legs, inches from his groin. Roman is stunned as John leans in and says, We're not leaving Argus, we're falling back. Ren asks, What can we do? And Nora chimes in from the door where she's oogling a mounted weapon of some sort. Ah, uh, I think this is a grenade launcher. All eyes fall to her and John shrugs. Well, that's a start. Roman groans, rolls his eyes, flicks some switches, and relents, saying, Fine, fine. Didn't want to live very long anyway. We cut back to Team Ruby, with all four of them still frozen in shock over Ruby taking what was a fatal shot on Adam. Blake looks back to Adam's body and falls to her knees, her hands coming to rest on Wilton Blush, stunned. The lingering silence is cut when they hear distant explosions coming from beyond the forest. The group snap out of their trance, and they all hesitate before rushing to a nearby cliff face to get an eye on what's happening at the bridge. Blake lingers behind just a moment to give Adam one last bitter, heartbroken glare before picking up Wilton Blush and following after her teammates. From a distance, we can see the invasion in a broad scale, with swarms of inky black forms writhing over the bridge and shorelines, with more pouring over the main body of the Boots Island. 
The four girls look at this in despair, with Blake voicing, heartbroken. That's it. We lost. Yang runs her remaining arm through her hair. What are we even supposed to do against that? The camera pulls in on Ruby's face, cutting off her eyes, mouth a grim line. Behind her is Weiss, who glances at her, only to double take and stare in panic. Ruby, you're not... Ruby doesn't respond, and, in fact, she begins to jog forward up to the peak of the cliff, her speed increasing as she goes. Weiss and Blake run after her, and Yang is slightly slower on the uptick but catches on moments later, chasing after her as well. Blake yells, Ruby, it's not worth it! Weiss shouts, You'll find another way! Yang finishes, I swear to God, if you forget me, I will punch you until you don't! Ruby stops at the top of the cliff, and her team are close behind, stopping just shy of her as Blake says, brokenly. Those are our memories too, Ruby! Ruby doesn't spare them a glance, closing her eyes and concentrating. The world goes black to match, and we hear Ruby say, I'm sorry. There are flashes of silver and flashes of memories, and for one of the few times this volume, I can say this happens like in the original, minus the giant dumb bee. We do add a few exclusive scenes, but it all culminates in bad memories for Ruby, and the silver eyes fail to manifest. Ruby's eyes flicker silver as she opens them, and then flicker, and then flicker, and then she begins to cry. Tears streaming down her conflicted face, Ruby falls to her knees and cups her face in her hands. I can't do it. I just, I, I can't. I don't want to forget. Her teammates walk closer and Yang drops down beside her, wrapping her in a one and a half armed hug, saying, No one's asking you to. Ruby leans into her sister and weeps. But Argus, John's family, Maria, everyone, they're counting on me. Weiss and Blake fall into the hug pile, and Weiss counters. They're counting on us, Ruby. We did what we could. Blake adds, We can't save everyone. Ruby is quiet, but then squeezes her eyes shut and hardens her face, pushing through the hug pile and declaring, But I can try. Why have this power if I can't use it to save people? Resolute, she stares at the bridge, and Yang belatedly and softly delivers the reply on behalf of all three of them. Okay. Ruby steps forward from them and closes her eyes again. Breathing deeply, Ruby tries to focus and we get happier memories for this scene, culminating in Summer Rose turning to face Ruby. Ruby's eyes flicker silver and she exhales, steady light beginning to pour from between the cracks of her eyelids. All the while, a dull steady thrumming can be heard in the background, growing steadily louder, and as Ruby is about to open her eyes fully, Weiss shouts, Ruby, look! Shaking Ruby and knocking her out of her trance. The light fades. At first, Ruby is confused, even a little angry, but she looks to where Weiss is pointing, and we find the Atlesian forces of Argus returning in full force. The four stare in awe, and Blake mutters in shock, They came back? Yang shoves Ruby's shoulder. You did it, Rubes! You convinced her! We cut to the bridge of Cordovan's flagship, where she's been tied up and gagged. Dee apologizes to her as he tightens her binds, and Dudley is on the comms, directing the air forces on how to approach. We follow from the wing of one of the airships as it launches an air-to-ground missile, following it as it slams into the bridge and obliterates the weakened structure, crushing a healthy number of Grimm under the debris. We get a montage of different shots as the Air Force comes in and begins to attack the Grimm, reducing the burden on the defenders by a significant degree. Included in this is Nora cheering the reinforcements and laughing giddily as she fires an automatic grenade launcher into the hordes below. Roman is significantly less amused, as he has to dodge constant friendly fire in addition to the ground fire from the Grimm, and John groans that he's going to throw up. Roman shouts, Not on the pants! I just stole these! We cut back to Team Ruby watching with unfettered relief as the cavalry flows in, and there is a call on Ruby's scroll. She answers it to be met with D. Miss Rose, are you still within the confines of the base? Ruby only manages to squeak out an awkward, uh, before he continues. If you are, I recommend you leave post-haste. The four look over as Cordovan's Manta C hovers near the large hangar at the back of the boot, where air forces are cutting their way through a horde of Grimm. This allows a small team of shock troopers, including Dudley, carrying large power cells, to drop onto the tarmac and rush into the base. Ruby asks D, What's happening? And he replies curtly, There has been a decisive change of heart. And leadership. As such, your clearance to Atlas has been approved. Please take these clearance codes with compliments. You will, however, have to secure your own transportation. Ruby is staring in shock at the screen as Blake mutters. That... 
won't be a problem. And we see that she's watching the stolen Manta fly through the air, Nora on its gun laughing maniacally. D says, Safe travels! And the call cuts out, leaving the four incredibly confused. The mountain shakes, and Yang manages to ask, What is even happening right now? Weiss numbly states, I guess they have a plan? Weiss barely gets out the word plan when a massive explosion rocks the island. The doors to the large hangar bay explode outward, and out steps a massive experimental hybrid mech, about three to four stories tall. Dozens of targeting lasers pop out of it, and the mech unleashes a barrage of firepower that begins to cleave a clean line through the grim. Yang and Blake both tilt their heads, with Yang saying, Oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. As the mech begins to rain down destruction, the stolen Manta flies up beside the cliff, John at the door inviting the girls in with, I have no idea what's happening. Get on. As the four board, Blake agrees, I think we're all a little lost. Near the back of the ship is Nora, who is still dry-firing the grenade launcher despondently, trying to will more grenades into existence. Ren gently pries Nora away, and she bemoans, It's empty, Ren. I'm not done yet, Ren. Ren hushes her and says, But the gun is, Nora. The gun is done. As the ship takes off back towards Argus's shoreline, Team Ruby head into the cockpit, where Roman catches sight of Yang's missing arm and double-takes, asking, Whoa, whoa, what's the story there? Neo too looks at Yang with concern, and she coolly replies, I tried to explain it, but you'd only get half of it. Seeing an unamused Neo, Yang ruffles her hat, saying, But seriously, it was on my own terms this time. Which seems to placate the therapy buddy. We cut to Crow, as he and Maria help the landing Atlas forces pick off straggling Grimm, particularly ones harassing the incoming airships with anti-aircraft water blasts. Finding a moment of respite, Crow watches the Atlas forces flow in and says in awe, She actually did it. Maria walks up beside him and says, They grow up fast, don't they? Soon enough, you'll be an empty nester. Crow groans and says, For the last time, she's not... You know what? Forget it. There is silence between them, watching as the Grim are beaten back by the mech and the combined forces. Eventually, the stolen Manta swings by where they're standing, and Crow shrugs, saying, Well, this is my ride. Got things under control? He and Maria look to the giant mech, and she says, I think things will be just fine. You go on ahead. The two wait a moment, and Maria attacks on. You did good, Crow. Keep doing right by them. She looks up to the girls who are waving at her from the doorway. They're a good bunch. Crow looks at them solemnly and gives a curt nod. Running forward, he kicks off some cards and transforms into a crow, flying up towards the waiting Manta. Maria watches after him and says, Huh, that's a nice trick. We jump inside the Manta and watch as Maria becomes smaller and smaller, the misfit team waving to her as they ascend. For a brief moment, the group just exhales, finally catching a moment of rest. As Team Ruby pulls away from the door, Ruby herself looks to Crow before collapsing into his arms, hugging him tightly. Crow is at first surprised, but returns the hug. Yang stares at Crow briefly before walking over and joining. Again, he's surprised, and asks, What's all this about? Ruby just nuzzles into him and replies, It's a... long story. Weiss and Blake watch the scene warmly before turning to the group at large and asking, Well, what's next? Roman leans back from his chair and says, Well, we drop off Barfbag and his friends over there back at his sister's place, and then we start the flight to Atlas. From the back of the airship, John's voice calls out clearly, No. Everyone looks to him, Nora, and Ren, collapsed in a pile at the back of the airship. John looks at everyone resolutely and says, We are coming too. Ren and Nora nod in agreement, embracing tighter. Ruby pulls away from Crow and looks at John, holding a stare for a long second before the two share a nod. Ruby appraises the cabin. She looks to Yang, as she is pulled aside by Blake with a first aid kit. She looks to Neo, who is watching Yang with concern before Roman redirects her to one of the co-pilot controls. And she looks to Crow, who chuckles at her gaze. Raising a brow, Ruby asks, What are you laughing about? Crow just ruffles her hair and says, Eh, they do grow up too fast. Ruby shoves off his hand and pouts at him, only to have Weiss lay a hand on her shoulder. The two share a quick smile before Ruby looks out the open door of the Manta, towards the battle that's slowly winding to a close. The audio fades into a purely orchestral score as we cut over to where Maria is still cutting through Grimm, briefly pausing to correct her aging back before leaping back into the fray. We cut to the Nikos family, on their couch, watching the battle on the evening news. 
We cut to Saffron, looking sadly at a brief message sent by John, telling her he's going to Atlas, as Terra and Adrian hug her tightly. We cut to just outside Argus' walls, where Cardin, Bronze, and Skye are all carrying a heavily injured but alive Russell on a stretcher, sighing with relief as they come out of the tree line. We cut inside of Cordovan's ship, as the tied-up commander struggles against her binds, trying to shout at Dee through her gag as he directs Atlas's forces. Our last shot in Argus is of the Crusader, the colossal Atlesian mech, crushing and blasting the mermaid still on the island. We focus in on one of the Grimm, and its attention swivels, ignoring the mech and the town it's defending to look out over the water in the direction of our hero's manta. It, along with almost all of its compatriots, begin to slink back into the waters, chasing after the relic pulsing silently on Yang's belt. Yang and Blake have sat down next to each other, with Blake having passed out on Yang's side. Yang looks at her warmly before looking back to Ruby and passing off the lamp. Ruby accepts it and walks up between Roman and Neo in the cockpit, fastening the relic to her belt. Standing between the two chairs and looking out the windshield, she declares, All right then. Onward to Atlas. We cut to outside the Manta as its doors slide close and it speeds off over the ocean into the horizon. The line of the horizon bleeds away into a travel poster for Argus, featuring its wide scenic ocean views and its temperate weather. The camera pans back and we find ourselves at a snowy landing pad in the middle of a snowstorm, where an Atlas transport has landed. The pilot walks out against the wind and meets with two members of the ground crew, shouting as he appraises his ship. Sorry about all the ruckus, but I got turned around in the snowstorm! Just need enough fuel to make it back to Atlas! One of the ground crew is flipping through his scroll while the other is rushing around back to fuel the ship. The man with the scroll shouts back, Don't blame you! Storm came out of nowhere! Unfortunately, we only got so much fuel to spare! Command isn't supplying the outpost like it used to! The pilot replies, Whatever you got, I'll take! The ground crewman nods and the pump begins to thrum. He then asks, Anything else? He turns and motions to the door. You can pass the storm here if you want. The coffee's shit, but it'll do the job. The man doesn't receive an answer, as his aura flares out and his chest bursts with a two-pronged red blade. He slumps down off of it, revealing the manic grim of Malachite, taking off the pilot's cap and letting her hair fall free. A moment later, the other ground's crewman is flung from behind the airship into a wall with a sick cracking noise. The wind dies down and the storm fades as Cinder, wearing a set of brand new threads, comes strutting around the ship. Idly, she comments, That's a nasty trick of yours. It'll come in handy. Malachite turns and says in Cinder's voice, Thank you. Immediately, Cinder's face hardens, and we can see the cold set in around them through the vapors in the air and the frost crawling up Malachite's skin. Don't get cute with me. Cinder hisses, lean in as Malachite's teeth begin to chatter. Either of you. Malachite glares at Cinder as she walks past her into the base. With an indignant pout, Malachite turns and drops her hat, momentarily obscuring the camera. When it finishes falling, Malachite is revealed in her own redesigned outfit, following after Cinder as the winds begin to pick back up, burying the screen in white. Roll credits!
In the after credits, we find the black screen fading in on a black sand beach. The camera pulls up to show Salem, standing at the shores of the grim liquid ocean, her eyes affixed to the horizon. Keeping her eyes locked there, she steps forward, onto the tar, her feet refusing to sink in. She reaches a point quite a distance from the shore, crouches, and reaches down to run her fingers through the ichor. Pulling her hand free, she stares at the liquid sifting through her fingers with either indifference or curiosity. It's hard to distinguish which. Clenching her fist, she stands and lets the rest of the ichor drop back to the ocean. Staring again at the wide horizon, she lifts her hand. Slow, steady, as if she were pushing a great deal of weight into the sky. As she does, almost imperceptibly the waterline begins to curve and rise with her hand. The curve becomes distinguishable for only a moment before we cut to black. Bip bop bam, volume 6, done.